Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to the Southern Pines Town Council business meeting. I'm calling this meeting to order. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're going to go ahead and get started, and we have comments from Reagan Parsons, our town manager. Thank you, Mayor Haney. Um, just quickly, relative to the agenda this evening, I'll first draw your attention to item 5B, the St. John Paul CDP. As council is aware from the uh, agenda meeting last week, both the applicant and the uh, attorney for the opposing party have requested a postponement of that and or a continuation of the hearing until uh, until next month's regular business meeting. So when we arrive at that public hearing on the agenda, I uh, would simply ask for council motion to go ahead and continue that uh, to your July 12th meeting. Relative to the, um, well, and I'll also just note that uh, 5F, your second public hearing, uh, as I had stated last Wednesday, I will do a much abbreviated version of the presentation of the budget at that point. Relative to your action items, you've got a number of things this evening, including a demolition of a property, uh, a watershed permit, and then uh, final action on creating the municipal service district between 15501 and West Morganton Road, adoption of your budget to include the setting of a tax rate and, uh, and also the, the tax rate within that MSD. Uh, our municipal service district and then finally the reimbursement agreement relative to the parkway and then uh, your consent agenda is comprised of um, a few <laughs> items i'll point out being the uh, appointment of some bicycle and pedestrian advisory committees the adoption of your local water supply plan that the state requires adoption of some minutes um, and then also a resolution supporting NCDOT uh, limiting truck traffic along, uh, in this case, East Indiana Avenue and East Morganton Road. Um, the other items uh, on your lengthy consent agenda this evening are the typical June in that once you adopt a budget, there are a number of capital project funds, ordinances, rate uh, schedules that all need to be uh, adopted as a part of that budget adoption. So therefore you've got items all the way up to N this evening. <laughs> Item N is the contract with Forbus, formerly Dixon Hughes Goodman, uh, to provide auditing services on the current fiscal year's budget. So that will be your consent agenda when we get to that this evening. Otherwise I'll turn it back over to you, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Um, now to the public comments. Remember that time is limited to three minutes. And if you want to talk about what is going on on our lengthy agenda, and you, have, you should just wait until the hearing that you want to say something about um, comes up, and then you can bring those um, points to our attention. So just remember three minutes, because we have extremely lengthy agenda. So, And this is what been our policy for the past several um, meetings. So we'll go ahead and get started with public comments. Dr. Daniel. Thank you, Mayor, Councilman, and <clears throat> members of Southern Five's staff. Uh, Tom Daniel, 1096 McNeil Street in Carthage is my residence, 635 Valley View Road in Southern Pines is my business. I just want to take a minute. I've been involved in conversations and listened to conversations recently about this town council and its performance and its decisions. Um, and I think there's a a deep misunderstanding uh, sometimes about the constraints under which town councils are are to be held and by necessary and quite frequently the processes that you're you're compelled to engage in make those constraints my, my example recently is the apartment complex in Southern Pines um, conditional use permit because uh, that means uh, a quasi-judicial process is engaged. You have to be, it's not, not a choice. And unfortunately, I'm very familiar with those. <laughs> unfortunately, because I challenged Carthage in 2020 about a decision that they made that involved my land in an apartment complex. 
In my case, they voted yes illegally. And I challenged that. And we won. And because of the way they voted illegally, the judge said that their decision was arbitrary and capricious. And that then triggers the state statute that the judge must assign attorney's fees. So they paid for my attorney to lose. They paid their attorney to lose. And at the end of that very expensive decision that night, they didn't get anything. So in this case, I, I, I watched that. I watched that. I was very, very interested in that. And three, you know, things have to be proven. Things have to be entered into the record, testimony, expert. It's unfortunate because that, that takes the neighborhood out. No opinions. It's very unfortunate. I don't like it at all. But the rules are the rules. Okay. And unfortunately, I got 46. Okay. <laughs> unfortunately... They, the opposition did not enter into evidence anything that gave you the right to say no. I understand you were forced to say yes, legally, your obligations. That's hard. That's swallowing hard. But you did it. I respect you for it. And I hope that you're not disparaged for that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Please come forward. Oh, there was, I saw there's a hand back there. You go, well, y'all work it out. Hello, I'm Dorothy Brower, 102 Eastman Road, Southern Pines. Uh, good evening, everybody. Occasionally, couples uh, renew their vows. And occasionally, I think we need to renew our oaths of office and our responsibility to our citizens. Uh, the oaths that were taken with this board or this council uh, had reflection on the state constitution. To preserve, protect, and defend the constitution, and also to respect and uphold the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness of individuals. Um, all political power is vested in and derived from the people, from the people, for the people. You hear this word uh, and verbiage throughout constitutions and certainly our state constitution. There are times when some of us in the community don't feel that we are treated equally. And there are times that we think we are not seen and sometimes not heard. Uh, just take a look as you cross the bridge and see if there's equality in what you see. I want to talk a little bit about safety. You may see Miss Ann McDonald crossing her street, going to her church, Trinity, almost every day. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I see people stopping their vehicles to help her cross the street. Why? Because there are no crosswalk markings at Stevens in Pennsylvania in any direction. This has been called to the attention. Nothing has happened. Although this is a state road, it is in within city limits, and she is a resident. So we expect council and staff to be advocates for we the people. Imagine if she were to get hit. What would the headlines read? Unfortunately, there were no crosswalk markings. Unfortunately, we don't know what state she's in. And this is a, a, a citizen who is on that street practically every day, more than one time a day. Mm -hmm. Her pastor can attest to that. She's a vital part of our community. Another example is uh, Morganton Road. We had resident citizens to one was killed, a couple were injured, but not until a grandparent or grandparents from South Carolina were almost hit before something was put there although we the people had complained about it and saw justification for something to be done, but only when there were some out of town folks that almost got hit or got hit. So we may seem angry, but we're not angry. We're just impatient. And why are we skeptical? Because we don't see any changes. We must be seen and we must be regarded. Thank you.
She's got it. Okay. So, and I'll turn this off. Just state Hi. your name and your address, please. Ariadne Degar, 23 Holly Pines Lane, uh, Pinehurst. Um, I know that you asked that we wait till the section that you were talking about, that we say our remarks. However, my remarks have to do with most of them. So I'm just going to say them now so that I can take my kid home and put him to bed. Um, piggybacking on what Ms. Brower said, I believe that everyone should have fair representation. And it makes me sad to say that I don't see that. So I would like to discuss the ARPA funds, and I would like to discuss West Southern Pines representation on the budget. It is my belief that when you get funds for people that are adversely affected for something, largely because of the people that were most adversely affected, the low income areas, and in Southern Pines, for the most part, that is West Southern Pines, that to me, if we're being fair, most of that money should go towards that group of people. In looking at the 20 year development plan that was then revisited and updated, well, one, I think it should be revisited and updated more than once. 20 years is a long time. 20 years ago, looking at me now, this was not the plan. <laughs> so I feel like 20 years is too long. What I do think the money should be used for infrastructure, sidewalks, lighting for safety, like what Ms. Brower was saying, crosswalks. Um, oh, sorry. I would also like to see um, flags. East Southern Pines is notorious for these, these flags. We have them for the US Open. We have them for Christmas. We have them for whatever else. We have ones with pine cones, pine needles. I would like to see some flags on some working light posts that say historic district of West Southern Pines to let people know that they are there, to let people know that they have been there and to let people know that they need to be seen. I would like to see money put into the Douglas Community Center. I would like to see money worked in with the land trust for affordable housing. Let's bring Habitat into it. Um, I would like to see us invest money in helping West Southern Pines the way West Southern Pines helped East Southern Pines for all of these years, because they deserve it. And to me, if you're a human being with a soul and a heart, they are owed it. So, and oh, I also wanted to address the, the possible demolition on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, being a person who has been related to and friends with people that this has happened to, to knock a building down and then mail them a receipt saying, you now okay. owe us $10,000. Your, your time is up, sorry. Okay. Thank you. You understand. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My Good name is Felicia Winfield, 1760 West New York. This is my first appearance. <laughs> We the people, three words that mean so much to so many. We the people. If there was to show that we the people want the transparency that is owed to us, was there maybe something that could be said, something that could be done that would make that transparency more apparent to we the people? Maybe there wouldn't be so much distrust in this administration. What the people are asking for is just transparency. Explain why so many projects are being approved. Explain the economic advantage for, for the town at large. Explain the advantages and the disadvantages for the city. Someone who has the power has to put the citizens' minds at risk. They are demanding answers. Do they not deserve to know the why? We the people have the right to transparency in our town's government when it's not in its totality given without prejudice or malice. Then the common ground of understanding can be obtained because we are the people. Thank you. Thank you. To you all. Um, 
My name is Jermaine Livingston, West Southern Pines native, currently reside at 106 Jeans Loop, Pine Bluff, North Carolina. Can you get closer to the mic? It's very hard to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, I want to reflect somewhat back on what Ms. DeGar just said concerning the ARPA funds. Uh, the main objective of the ARPA fund is to address specific needs of historically marginalized and underserved communities. Southern Pines has a tier three ranking based on economic well-being. According to the World Population Review, as well as Data USA 2022, there are approximately 1,045 African-American residents living at poverty level in this locality. With West Southern Pines being an obvious point of interest, what is the council's plan of action regarding the use of OPA funds to address these disparities? Thank, Thank you, sir. Good evening, council. My name is Nora Bowman. I live at 740 South Hill Street in Southern Pines. Um, I'm here before you uh, this evening with concerns that you should not look through your lenses as negativity. I attended a special call meeting of the county commissioners on September 1st, 2021, and on September 2nd, 2021, the county manager, Wayne Vest, stated in the pilot, and I quote, Vess agreed, noting that more county is unique because, because while it is considered a tier three county by the state, we have a lot of tier one and tier two areas. I think the census qualifier really speaks to what's being, what, what we've been trying to get across to the legislators. It gives a more granular look. I will allow, it will allow a border a broader use of ARPA funds to be used. I would like to um, include this as well as the HUD report um, for the council review. Okay. For those of you that attended the Southern Pines Land and Housing Trust ribbon cutting, there was a song performed that simply stated, little Johnny Brown, lay your burdens down. The little Johnny Brown took his burdens to his neighbors and his neighbors helped him with his burdens. The question is, who are our neighbors? If we are to be one Southern Pines, we are all neighbors. Our burdens on the west side of Pennsylvania Avenue are far too great to name in three minutes. So I ask town council, Madam Mayor, town manager, can you see the encroaching, unchecked gentrification that is going on in the western part of Southern Pines? Also, the overdevelopment in others' backyards. Council, my ask is that the budget and the ARPA funds be used for the betterment of all of Southern Pines, not part or areas that you see through your lenses. Please take into consideration the request of the residents here today, your neighbors, the, the underserved and the burdens that we all bear. I ask that you save Southern Pines. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Arthur Mason. I reside at 795 West New Hampshire Avenue. And uh, I'm, I have some grave concerns when it comes to planning for our youth. Our youth have kind of suffered greatly due to pandemic and not being able to get the use of things that they need and the things that should be required for them. And I'm not certain what Southern Pines budget or what they have in the budget for our youth of West Southern Pines. And this is my grave concern. I haven't heard anything 
And if we don't look out the our youth, which is the future of all of us, then we have failed. So I hope that some plans in there for the youth on the west side of Southern Pines, all of Southern Pines actually, is in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Council. Good evening. I'm Tina Gillis, and I live at 160 South Gaines Street, Southern Pines. I just have a couple of concerns of the community. The first one, historically, how has West Southern Pines been positioned in the town budget? The second one, we spoke of the 4.6 million allocated for West Southern Pines and what we need to do in order to track the funds so we make sure we get what we was promised to us. Thank you. you who are here. I'm Wilbert Davis. I live at 330 North Carlisle Street. I'm sorry. What? Wilbert. OK, Davis. could you get the mic closer to your mouth, please? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. 330 North Carlisle Street there. My concern is that my wife and I purchased a property. We went through auction at the courthouse, upset bid, go again, go again, go again. Now, I've been told that there's some people that don't have to go through the bid process. They get land. They get it pretty cheap. I like to get some of that because I'm a citizen too. Said retired, educated. I like to have <laughs> my share. We purchased a lot on Pennsylvania Avenue, not too far from the barber shop. Now, I was told that there was some heavy equipment on our land, and then they cleared it off. They cut down my trees. They bulldoze up this, they bulldoze up that. And being an educated and responsible person that I can't, excuse me for saying, be going out here raising a lot of hell, I got to do things decently and in order as a citizen would do. So I go to the planning board, I explain what's going on. I take up my documentation showing that I own and I've owned it for some time. I said land's been cleared off, buildings have been torn down. The building wasn't mine, but the building that was torn down was 100 and 20 years old, and it had a very decorative metal top on top of that. And I think that would classify as historical to myself. But anyway, they said that they couldn't do anything. Well, I said, what kind of permits do they have? Do they have a permit to tear down the building? No. Do they have a permit to clear off the land? No. The only permit that they had was a permit for erosion control. Now, I'm just saying this. If all of us are created equal, in this great city, and this great state, and I want my share. Now, in concluding, imagine you own some land that you bought for your retirement, and you get up one morning, you find out somebody then cleared your stuff off, didn't check with you about anything, and then they're going to build something on your land. Now, question, another question is, when we develop the end of the street down there, uh, Henley Street, if those builders come in and do that, how are we going to stop them? Are we going to say, oh, this is OK? What are we going to do? Isn't it time that we stand up and follow our own rules? And that the rules are not just for some people, but for all people? Thank you so much. God bless everybody. Anyone else? OK. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. you all today good how are you my name is Julene Hainsworth Allen I reside at 1210 West Michigan Avenue here in Southern Pines I am the owner of the store that was used to be store at 891 Pennsylvania Avenue I'm here because 
I understand that you all are getting ready to demolish my building because you say that it's in a condemned uh, situation. I have the building up for sale. I have a contract on it, and I'm here to ask you all for more time for me and the investor and uh, my real estate agent to complete this uh, contract that we have. Also, my concern is about West Southern Pines, period. I was born and raised here. And I know from my childhood, this side of Southern Pines on the west side, we were self-sufficient people. We had over 40 stores over here back in my childhood of growing up. And I sit and I look today as I walk through and ride through my town on this side, every building, everything that was of value to us that meant something as far as our children having a legacy that they could look back on and say, this is from our parents and our grandparents yeah. has been the model. It's a sad, sad day to look and to see that. That building that I have down there is about 100 years old because I'm 86, and it was there when my childhood. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you all to please be more considerate for West Southern Pines. Help us to salvage what we have left. We, we want to be proud, not only of East Southern Pines, but we want to be as proud of West Southern Pines. Do we you are all one, and we are all in this pot together. Do you so have a copy this, of the contract by any chance? Could you share it with us? Because that's what we've been waiting for. I, yes, I do. I have my contract here, and uh, it has been signed. And I'm waiting for it, my, uh, uh, my real estate agent, to, uh, con con uh, to finalize this. So if you all will do that for me, I will greatly appreciate it. Okay. And thank You're you so much for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so our first public hearing, let me get this thing back up on track here. Is OA22, excuse me, OA0222 text amendment UDO, I believe that is BJ. That is I, Mayor. How are you? Fine, sir. Good. Thank you for asking. Thank you. No problem. Um, the first agenda item uh, for a public hearing is OA 0222, text amendments to the Unified Development Ordinance. Um, by the way, my name is BJ Grieve. I'm with the Town of Southern Pines Planning Department. Um, my role as staff here is uh, we have a, a whole table here filled with staff, and uh, we work for the Town of Southern Pines. We accept applications, we process things, we write reports, and we put them in front of the town council. We provide ministerial services and for the town council in their review. So this is a text amendment to the town's unified development ordinance. The unified development ordinance is frequently referred to as the zoning. Uh, the zoning covers all manner of things besides just land uses. It covers design requirements. It covers all kinds of good stuff. Um, so the text amendment before you this evening is a text amendment that you may recall comes from a work session that you guys had. And uh, for some quick background, when people come to our office and they say, by golly, I love this town, I want to do some multifamily residential, also known as apartments, uh, how do I go about doing that? Well, we open this table right here, the table of land uses that is in the Unified Development Ordinance. 
We look at multifamily, which is land use. Uh, we have this, these uh, fancy land-based classification codes here with numbers. We say, well, that there is a 1151 multifamily, and it is allowed in certain zones. It is allowed in the RM1, RM2, central business, neighborhood business, and office service zones. And they say, great, I'm good to go. I'll break ground tomorrow. And we say, hang on there. Uh, first, we want to look at a little bit previous to that. We want to look at this section here uh, that says multifamily structures and townhomes. When used in connection with multifamily residential structures, the designation ZC, you'll recall that down here, the little code in this table is ZC. We go to this and it says, development of apartments with fewer than 10 dwelling units may be established pursuant to a zoning permit. Developments of 10 or more dwelling units require approval of a special use permit or be developed as part of a PD. Um, you guys will remember that uh, a couple of projects have gone through that were special use permits. And so we took a look at an option of modifying this so that it would look like this instead. What you're seeing here is a markup version that I'll zoom in on a little bit further. What was discussed was the special use permit process it requires an evidentiary hearing prior to rendering a quasi-judicial decision. And that process, as was alluded to earlier, is a very regimented process requiring, an, uh, as I said, an evidentiary hearing. And uh, there are strict rules regarding who can provide testimony and who can give an opinion versus who can state facts. And so the proposed text amendment is to make it so that no longer will any large apartment complex be able to be reviewed as a special use permit. They shall only be developed as part of a planned development. The distinction here will be instead of multifamily, let's say a 280 unit apartment complex coming in as a special use permit, instead it would have to come through as a planned development and a planned development requires, as you guys are very familiar with, a three-step process that starts with a rezoning. A rezoning is a legislative hearing a legislative hearing uh, allows for far more discretion and far broader public participation. And so this text amendment would facilitate that all large apartment complexes of um, 10 or more dwelling units would now be reviewed, uh, allowing for broader public participation, and you would not have such restrictive procedural requirements. Condo developments similarly would uh, be developed as part of a planned development. And there was one other uh, bit of Housekeeping, which was in chapter four, there are design standards for multifamily development. And so the change you just saw would also require some change to this text here that would say no multifamily development may include 10 or more dwelling units except pursuant to a planned development. So that is the text amendment uh, that has come before you. This text amendment went to the planning board as is required under state statute for a public hearing. Uh, it was a very good time on May 18th, 2022. If you weren't there, you missed out on a lot. Uh, our planning board is outstanding and awesome. And if you want to come to their meetings, you really should because it's a good time. Um, if you're a planner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, and you so, for, Thank you for those parentheses. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, the meeting on May 18th, uh, the planning board did recommend approval of the proposed text amendment unanimously. And so it has been forwarded to you with that recommendation. What you have in front of you in your packet is a staff report that concludes with motions, draft motions for your consideration. They include such options as approval, denial, or otherwise. Um, but after holding the public hearing and after board discussion, you can certainly um, use those as prompts for any action you choose to take. That's it for me. Do you have any questions for staff? Questions for BJ? Any questions dealing with this? I've got somebody coming forward. Ah, thank you. Council, you need name and address as well. Please, always. My name is uh, Caleb Harmon, reside at 107 Edinburgh Drive in Highland Trail, Southern Pines. Um, I'm here to address um, this exact um, topic regarding what I'm understanding to be the 92 room proposed four story hotel that would be in the vicinity of downtown Southern Pines. Well, that's really not what we're dealing with. The, the hotel is, is tied up in the historic commission it has nothing to do with this. This is just a, this is just a text amendment. Approval process for that development. That is zone central business. No, it would not. 
reference multifamily. Two different things, two different land uses. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know it's confusing. But before we go any further, we motion to open the hearing. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, we do need a motion to open. Sorry. I'll move to open the public hearing. Second. Pledge of the council. Aye. 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 We didn't we didn't open I didn't open the the hearing. That's all. You can still come up. Yeah, well, I just didn't. I can't read my own typing. This is like way too close, BJ. Um, Suzanne Coleman, 225 North May. Um, could you just slip this in real quick? Just, um, uh, I disagree with what the council just decided about that young man that was just up here to speak because while this testament is an encouraging first step it does not go far enough to protect our town it does not what is being done about encroaching gentrification of west southern pines the revitalization of west southern pines because surely the dfi's proposed concept offered very little what's being done to protect the historic district and i think that hotel and that hearing that was held last week is a perfect example of how we're not protecting the historic district in fact and and the text amendment speaks in fact a vote that this very council took at the january 11th meeting in a three to two majority increased the number of floors for buildings in certain zoning districts which is why we had that massive, out of scale, 92 room, four story project proposed by a developer from Wilmington who does nothing but develop low tier chain hotels like these. And BJ, you're welcome to just zip through that. This is. Wait, this is you realize that this has nothing to do with what you're talking about. It Hang on. You've you got to listen to us, too. The hotel was at the Historic Commission. It is stopped there. They have 90 days. If they reject it, then there's, this is, it, there's nothing to do here. Yes, but what I'm speaking to is the fact, and BJ, if you would go to, through that, and if you'll just be patient, if you'll just... I'm offering this is that okay that's what was presented last week the reason the vote from this council that is the result of the vote from this council mm -hmm. yes it is yes it is and this is a good first step this 3.7.1 but thank the, you but thank you for giving for, us credit for that okay. well but this is not protecting our historic district. This is going backwards. And I think the people that are here today, everybody wearing the Save Southern Pines, we all feel like that. We're, we're losing confidence in this council and its leadership. We're losing confidence. We feel like we're going backwards. If you'll just be patient. I've been coming to these meetings longer than almost every single person in this room. And I have seen a loss of confidence in the council to protect our town from this onslaught of development and buildings like this. And this is what they build. And if we and and we would like to see the council reverse that text amendment from January and restore that restriction of three stories as part of consideration the council to protect our town and to preserve its unique character and that is not happening and we also believe we need a moratorium so that the council can catch its breath so the staff can catch its breath because the council seems to be operating on a defensive posture as and and if you look at the agenda tonight where you have project after project after project some of them pds and some of them special use permits that require quasi-judicial hearings which disadvantage the residents and advantages the developers we have a serious problem and we want 
the council to protect and preserve the unique character that is Southern Pines, including West Southern Pines. Thank you. Thank you. I realized that the session was not open officially when I came up last time, so I would like to address the council again. Um, so I held my comments earlier um, during the public um, commentary because I was under the assumption that it, this was the appropriate time to address this. So I'm going to give my comments now. Um, Southern Pines is a local boutique mom and pop historically significant town. Um, people see that character just simply driving through the downtown region. There's 15501, there's Scavel Road in Fayetteville, there's plenty of places to shop and find hotels otherwhere. Destroying the unique nature of the downtown will destroy the very soul and fabric of the downtown and the city of Southern Pines and what makes it great. Corporate chain franchise businesses have no place downtown. There are multiple other places for them to go. They're already going on Morganton, they're already going on 15501, and many other places up and down Highway 1. I don't, I've spoken to nobody in Southern Pines that resides in this state or this, this city that has any interest in this hotel. What I want to make sure is that the constituents are being looked out for by the council and by the mayor and by the employees of Southern Pines, not by investors that are out of state. There are plenty of small business owners and investors and entrepreneurs local. Those are the people that should be empowered, not investors that are out of the city, out of the counts, out of the county. And I understand that towns are either growing or dying and that development is integral to that. But there is a way to do that and preserve the nature of that area or to kill the nature of that area. And I do not want to see the soul and the fabric of Southern Pines destroyed in the name of financial interest for others that don't reside here and potentially the financial interest of people that are the employees of the city of Southern Pines. Thank you for the- Thank you. Um, I'll just state my name again. My name is Nora Bowman. I'm a resident of Southern Pines. And I would just like to speak on this um, as well. Um, back, I live on 740 South Hill Street. And a few months ago, I guess uh, maybe late last year, um, a development was approved for my street, um, Village Walks. Um, I stood here and um, protested pretty much the building of those units in my neighborhood. Now today I see um, on the agenda that it has to be part of a plan development but that uh section of property has already been approved as a special for special use permit um i did reach out to the planning board and find out about why is that still in effect um the conversation that i had that once a property has been zoned special use permit even though that particular project is not moving forward that sticks with the property there so we're talking about building 34 units that's already been approved for my area in West Southern Pines, pretty much the gateway on number one highway to West Southern Pines. And now we're changing the rules. So I need to know, I guess, this plan development and how does that fit um, where I live and the, the uh, special use permit is already in effect. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm taking my best guess to answer your question. I'm not, I'm not a professional planner. Um, we were, my understanding is we were attempting to find a way to remedy um, the hearings that aren't fun. They're quasi-judicial, and it doesn't give adequate um, ability for everybody to speak. My understanding, this ad amendment, it was the, an easy way, quick way, for us to do the best we can right now to address that so that we don't keep having that issue over and over and over again. Anything that comes forward moving forward, as, as this passes, we'll have the ability to listen to everybody's concerns, to listen to their um, particular um, opinions and knowledge of neighborhoods and all areas of town 
that we just couldn't do before and can't do because our hands are a little bit tied by the way that the rules were. So this understanding is to help us do that better. Again, understanding we're going through a long-term plan review and hopefully we'll really, really, really get this all a way that everybody's understanding and comfortable with the rules. But for now, this was to help protect that. Unfortunately, what it doesn't do is it doesn't change anything that's happened before. So we're, we, we can't go back and change the rules as to what was already approved. But it's hopefully will help to avoid the same concerns that we were hearing over and over as these projects were coming forward. Is that even close, BJ? Yeah. And that is the reason that we're starting with a long range plan. Okay. Well, I, didn't, I didn't answer it right. I, I want to just try to, I'm, I don't know, I'm trying to explain it. But what, okay. Once something has been approved, we've got to move forward. And you have to realize that a lot of this zoning, hang on, some of this zoning that we're living with was from the 80s and the 90s. We're living with what was presented to us. That is the reason we're doing another long range plan. We're changing the UDO. We, uh, we, are, we are listening to you. We're trying to change things. It's very difficult to just change midstream immediately. That is the reason that we've hired someone. I think we're about there to, to ask all the questions. You will have lots of opportunities to have public meetings, private meetings, big groups, small groups to, to speak. That's, that's what we're trying to do. And that's, that is the plan. And that's, I'm, I'm sure Reagan can talk about when we're about to sign the paperwork to go ahead and move forward on that. But once something has been approved, it, it, I don't think you would appreciate it either if we approve something for you and then you agree to, you know, and you're moving and then we decided midway, I don't know, you can't do that. That, that That's, you can't. You, wait, you know, y'all, we're, we're better than this. Can we just have one person at a time? And you, you say you're not angry, but you really are an angry group. Yeah, you are. You really are. You got to realize we're volunteers up here. So, you know, just, just, just give us a break and just, we're listening to you, but just give us a little time to make some changes. They are not done overnight. Yes, sir. Uh, Davis, 330 North Call Out Street. My question initially was this. Once it has been approved, A, B, and C, and let's say the developer comes in, and he decides to do E, F, and G. What checks and balances do we have in place to say, no, you can't do this. This is not what we approve. You got to do this. Or do we just smile and let them go on? What, what checks and balances do we, we have? We don't just smile. There's a UDO that's in place, and there's a long range plan. And all these people here are planners. And we have a great staff that, that stops a lot of this and tells them if they come to them and we've approved A, B, and C and they want to do element of P, this, this crowd right here says, you can't do that. So it doesn't even get to us because they stopped them already. That's the reason we have professional planners to make sure that people follow the rules. A lot of people complain that our rules are too, st they're too hard. Thank you. John. Hi there. Didn't, didn't mean to take it off. Uh, John McInerney, 460 Crest Road. Um, I think this is a good first start. Um, I guess let me ask, if I heard you right, BJ, like when, if, we, if this happens and somebody has to do it by PD, they would have to sort of request a certain density. What I'm getting at is, let's say the land involved allows I don't know, 20 per acre. If they come in as a PD, could the town say, no, you're only going to get 12 per acre? Does, does the question make sense? Does. You guys want me to answer the question? Go ahead. Um, here. Yeah. We got people playing along at home, so I want to make sure to be on the mic. Um, when you apply for a plan development, 
you come in and you write your zoning. And so you propose the zoning of your development, and the zoning would include the density. And so if you came in and said, hey, I got this uh, planned development. Here we go. It's 30 units per acre. The town council at that time could say no, and they have broad discretion because it's a rezoning. They could say, how about instead of 30 per acre, it'd be more along the lines of 10 per acre. If I, you know, they can adjust it. They can, um, make, they can recommend changes. Um, and then if they don't change it, they don't have to approve it. So yes, that's a long-winded answer to your question. The answer is yes, they, they can come in. The, the plan development process, step one is writing your zoning, and the town council can decide to approve it, approve it with conditions, or deny. Thanks. Because, you know, I, as I said, I think this is a good first step. I, I, I gather that if this had been in place, just to pick on Patrick's point, Patrick's point, would have come in and the count you all could have said no nah, we're not going to go with 266 we're going to go with 220 or you can go elsewhere so patrick's point was done as a special use permit right. under an office service zoning they would have had to have come in and rezone it to plan development which would have been a legislative process okay, that's what i'm saying yes if, if that if this mm -hmm. had been in place yes then you would have had more options that's true, and that's what we're trying to get away from all the quasi-judicials. Right, I understand that. I guess 2020 hindsight would have been yeah, nice been three great. years ago, but we're here where we are. Um, I think there's a, a density problem in general in this town. Uh, not directly related to this, I guess. I guess a not necessarily rhetorical question is, could you all pass this tonight? Is, is that feasible? That was the plan. <laughs> okay. okay, I mean, I didn't know. Sometimes you have a public hearing, and then a month later, you'll vote on it. What I'm thinking is, the sooner you get this on the books, so, the better. Mm -hmm. um, I assume it's probably too late for 5D, which is a special use. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> that which is a shame. I mean. Generally speaking, I'm afraid this town is choking on apartments and will choke on apartments. Uh, and the sooner you can get some better control of that, whether this, I doubt that this is the magic bullet. I think it's a start, but I really am on it was a quick theory of what's going on and how, how full of apartments this place is going to be. And I don't think... I'm afraid we're not going to like it. It was a quick, it was a quick fix, so to speak, in, until we could get the long-range plan oh, no, people I here. Like yeah, I did. yeah. Thank you. And if I can just add, just so that I guess it will be clear to everyone uh, what we're proposing to do here tonight uh, to so amend the UDO. <laughs> That's to make sure that when the council's hands were tied with that quasi-judicial on Hale Street, as well as the quasi-judicial with Patrick's Point, didn't do anything because of the way the rules were set. What we're proposing to do now is to bust that up so that we can, in fact, do something and enable you all to have voices so that it won't just be the voices of expert witnesses. You as a resident will have a val valid, valid and valued voice. So that's what we're trying to do in this first gesture. So just want to make that point. Thank you, sir. Looking to the council, what do you want to do with 0802? Given our legal constraints, I think that this is the right answer to move yeah. forward. Um, to make the the best, the most positive change in the least amount of time, I would vote to approve AO.02.22. Sorry, I'll close the hearing. Close Motion to close the hearing first. Second. Aye. 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 I'm looking to a motion to approve OA02.22. And if I move to approve OA-02-22. Second. Hold on, hold on, please. 
please. Oh, um, the motions that are in the back are very important. You have to make statements regarding consistency with the Congress of Online Plan. That has to be part of your uh, conclusion. So there are two motions drafted. to see, uh, number one, as I move that, considering the criteria for text amendments. Uh, number one sounds like where you guys are at, but we recommend you read that out loud and have it on the record. Did you read the entire thing? Yeah, okay. please. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. So starting with the, I move that after considering, correct? That would be very, very good. Thank you, BJ. I move that after considering the criteria for text amendments found in UDO 2.17.10, the first course of which is consistency with the comprehensive long-range plan. The town council finds that the requested text amendments are consistent with the comprehensive long-range plan and are a reasonable way to implement the comprehensive long-range plan and therefore the town council adopts the resolution as adopted by the planning board that is included in an attachment to the staff report for AO-02-22. OA. Okay. You just, OA. just went dyslexic on this. <laughs> OA-02-22. Thank you. That's okay. And therefore I move to approve OA-02-22. Does that sound good? Yes. Okay. Pleasure the council. Aye. 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 Thank you, and I appreciate the staff's hard work on that too, and their, their quick hard work so we can move forward. The next is PD 0422. This is a continued quasi judicial hearing open from last week. I mean, last month, excuse me. And the two parties, as um, Mr. Parsons mentioned, are involved with the St. Um, John Paul CDP and are still in negotiations and have asked for continuance. Usually with this situation, a better outcome comes together if the two parties can come together. So with that being said, I need a motion to continue PD 0422. I'll move to continue PD 04-22 until our July 12th regular business meeting. Second. Pleasure the council. Aye. 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 Thank you. The next three are quasi-judicials, as you probably already understood. The, um, so with the parties involved with Morganton Park South Apartments, PD 0722, please stand, staff included. Well, we got written list. Okay. So, um, pl please raise your right hand and respond to the following. State your name. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give the board in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Council members, please disclose, disclose the following. Any site visits? Ex parte communications? Specialized knowledge you have of this case? Anyone have a fixed opinion that's not susceptible to change based on what they learn at this hearing? Where they have a close family member, business, or other relationship with the applicant or other affected persons? As their attorney representing the petitioner or the opposition? Okay, remember with this competent evidence and expert only at this point. So I need a motion to open hearing PD uh, 0422. I move to open. The no, 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 no. That's, that's the Catholic Church. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm, i got to read my own notes. Um, sorry. I move to open public hearing PD 07-2. 0722. Excuse me. Second. Aye. 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 <laughs> um, who's coming forth? Pam. This is our principal planner, Pam, and she will present our staff report. Thank you. Council, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not quite as good at ad-libbing as BJ is, so I have a presentation that summarizes your staff report. It was a lengthy staff report, so this is a, a much shorter summary, but it will walk us through why we're here tonight, what has happened prior to this, and what the next steps are. Um, and this is just an, uh, a flyover of the, of the site as it exists more or less today. This is phase two of the Morganton Park South uh, CDP phase one was um, 
approved in October of 2021. That was the retail portion. And so this is the next one that you're considering for this um, uh, CDP. This CDP calls for up to 650 total residential units, which may be multifamily townhomes or single family detached and 700,000 square feet of office and or retail on a total of 98.9 .9 acres. Phase two, as it is presented this evening, uh, proposes 269 multifamily units on 13.18 acres. These next images just provide a sense of where this uh, is located with relation to Morganton Road, which is more to the, to the north, 15501, more to the, to the, to the west, uh, and quite a bit of uh, other undeveloped as yet properties that are part of this CDP that has been approved. And BJ has provided some drone imagery. This is a very rough uh, calculation of, of where the, the phase two apartment portion uh, lies on this land and from different angles. You can see the soccer fields. We're, we're looking, the soccer fields are more to the right in this, in this photograph, and you're looking more or less towards uh, 15501. Just wanna bring up a couple of slides that show where we were when this was approved as a CDP. Uh, the, the, the portion of this plan that you see that's sort of illustrated is the retail portion that has already been approved. And then the area that's outlined in the, in the heavy red is where the apartments are proposed. There are some additional um, exhibits that were provided by the applicant at that time. Those were in your packet as well. This, this uh, gives a sense of the transportation network. There is a a, uh, a spine road that will work its way through this CDP that is not yet built and is required to be built with the phase one construction. Uh, very simply, there are four criteria for the council to consider uh, when considering a, a, a PDP. The first one has to, has to do with the application demonstrating that it will achieve the purposes of the planned development district. Uh, which this is now zoned, and the UDO um, staff's evaluation results in the proposal meeting the purpose of the district uh, and that the future land use does call for tra traditional mixed use for this property in this project area, and also that it meets the intent of the district in that sufficient public water and sewer are available to the site and the existing and proposed street systems are adequate to handle the projected traffic volumes generated by the de development and there was a, a traffic impact analysis done for both phase one and two together. Uh, the second criteria has to do with the application demonstrating that it's consistent with the CDP that was already approved and that it conforms to the UDO. Um, the UDO, as you know, does set the expectation that there would be some uniqueness in the design and therefore some flexibility with planned development uh, projects. Uh, and that's why we tend to see some uh, deviation uh, request along the way f for these projects. They're site specific and uh, in the attempt to make it palatable and uh, appropriate for the area, sometimes we do see uh, deviation requests and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about those in just a moment. Um, in this case, uh, in order for those uh, deviations to be granted, they do need to meet or exceed the general intent of the UDO standards. Uh, it needs to show that, that it is appropriate given the specific mix of uses and the character of the development and that it achieves a more efficient, safe, or economical land use without detracting from the quality of the development or the community as a whole. Uh, when we compared the, this PDP pros, proposal with the approved CDP, uh, nearly all of the provis provisions that were set forth have been adhered to here, and that includes the mix of uses uh, for this portion of the CDP, the street standards, open space and other amenities, including pedestrian circulation, uh, the location of the development being consistent and appropriate by the, uh, as, as stated in the, in the long range plan, and that there is no cause for inefficient extensions or expansions of public facilities, utilities, and services. Um, that being said, there are some deviations that have been requested by the applicant, and I will 
touch on those and then allow him the opportunity to, um, to, to go into more detail with that. Uh, the first one has to do with the density. Um, although the entire CDP caps residential units at 650 uh, total, uh, there is a density provision that was is both in the Morganton Road Overlay District, which is in our UDO, of course, and in the CDP, that the density be capped at 16 dwelling units per acre. And what we have proposed tonight is 269 units on 13.2. 1.8 acres, uh, and that calculates to a little bit more than 20 dwelling units per acre. Um, and I and I will 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 turn over some uh, ju justification uh, for that to to the applicant. Mr. Kuntz is here tonight, and other representatives of the project. I will say that the TIA that was um, reviewed did uh, include a count of 260 for this phase which is now 269, but there was a technical memo that was drafted uh, to account for the 269 units. Uh, another requested deviation has to do with the parking, and they have uh, asked to reduce the number of parking spaces from what would normally be required uh, at 507 to 434. And then lastly, I just want to mention this. This was not included as a requested deviation. And I'm, I, I know Mr. Kuntz can explain this to you. We had some debate about um, the provision that is both in the UDO and in the CDP about how the buildings are oriented on the site. Um, there is, of course, that spine road, which will be the public road that you will, um, that will provide access to the site. And then there are some internal uh, uh, vehicular transportation areas within the site and really the uh, the, the sticking point here is whether uh, orientation of the buildings to the road means that public road or the internal private roads and I want to just want to show that to you in, in these exhibits these are actually from the uh, phase one and that's why you see uh, the the retail portion is more prominent on this uh, on this slide, uh, but there were some very conceptual <laughs> illustrative designs provided for this apartment complex, which is to the right in this slide, um, and it's sort of grayed out here because that's not what you were considering at the time that this was uh, put put before you. Um, I've zoomed in and oriented it more to towards the current plan, which will be on the next slide, and this shows. Uh, that there, it, there is, in this conceptual design, one building that is oriented to that uh, public street and other buildings um, set in, in uh, locations that uh, address the retail component that is adjacent to this property and the open space that will be uh, uh, along the perimeter. This is the current plan. Um, and that building that faced the public street is, is not here, as you will see, and the other buildings now are oriented to face internally. Uh, they also provide some access, at least most of these buildings provide some access to perimeter green spaces, uh, but the buildings are more oriented internally to the private streets that will run through this development and also make a vehicular connection to the, to the retail portion to the, to the, to the south. Uh, the last two criteria that I'll touch on briefly have to do with uh, the development being located in an area of town that is appropriate. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the long range plan does designate this area for traditional, traditional mixed use. And that is what we're seeing in this proposal. And then lastly, that, that it will not cause the need for inefficient extensions and expansions of uh, public services, which we also um, touched on earlier that, th that those, um, that those expansions are not considered to be inefficient in this case. Uh, we really did not receive much as far as agency comment on this, um, uh, this proposal. Some of these comments came in during the CDP phase. Um, and of course, our engineer, James uh, Mickle, is here and he can speak more about the traffic impact analysis. Uh, we did have that updated memo that um, address the increase from 260 to 269 units.
Planning Board did consider this item uh, last month during a preliminary forum, and they had, uh, I believe, three on the next slide, three um, items that they wanted to bring to your attention. I just want to reiterate that the statutes do prohibit uh, a, a situation where you would base your decision on, on these items, and yet we do pass them along for your consideration uh, and, and knowledge. And those three items... Uh, had to do with the with the de deviations, both those two that are requested and the additional uh, one uh, of the orientation to the building, which I think there's still some debate about whether that's actually a deviation or not. Um, also, um, that um, the, the access pass to the soccer fields adjacent to this property be uh, included in the proposal. And lastly, that they had more of a broad comment regarding uh, traffic impacts to Morganton Road as we continue to see more development there uh, and that uh, that always be taken into consideration uh, when proposals for development in that area come before you. Um, I do want to point out that um, I, I threw what may be considered a curveball after much discussion with uh, BJ about this. Uh, we do prepare findings of fact uh, drafts for you to consider. And in my interest in not appearing to lead you in one direction or the other, what we've done is prepared one set of findings should you uh, look at this proposal favorably and another set if you should look at it unfavorably. Uh, and that way there are, is at least some draft language to guide you as you, as you move through your motions uh, that being said, you can throw all of that out and create your own findings, but we didn't want to have the messy situation of bringing you findings that uh, assume an outcome and then go back to the dra drawing board and have to come back to you for, for you to um, actually approve those findings. And that concludes my presentation. I'll take any questions you may have, and of course, I know there are others here that wish to speak. Thank you. Here's one question I have that probably can't address to you. The third point for planning board, don't all TIAs have to take into consideration what's already there at the time of the new ask? So it does, doesn't that happen anyway, that third point, or, or am I mistaken? Well, I know James can respond to the question about TIAs. I think the planning, what I understood from the planning board is that regardless of a TIA, that uh, you just always put traffic impacts to that area in your decision making uh, based on a TIA or any other information that you that, that you may have. But you're correct, I believe, James, I'm going to allow you to answer the more technical part of that. Uh, well, yeah, any TIA is going to review what the existing traffic is as part of the background or the, the baseline condition that they review. Um, and then they will make assumptions relative to growth, just as naturally occurring growth irregardless of the actual development and then they add on top of that the additional traffic from the development so it is accounting for existing conditions and things that would occur whether the development happened or not did that answer your question i would just ask real quickly that um, we add the planning staff report to the record as exhibit a and i ask that um Pam's PowerPoint presentation be added to the record as Exhibit B, please. Approved. Are you doing A and B? So A is A is the report of the planning board, and B is the re, is a staff report. Is that what you're saying? A is the staff report that you have in your packet. I'm talking loud so that I can. And B is her. And B is the PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Presentation that Pam okay. Presentation. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Making sure. And is the planning board. Um, packet included in um, your report? It looked like you tracked it. Right. Okay. Can, can I ask you a couple questions, Ms. Graham? Yes. You did a really nice way, you did a really nice shoot from the hip there. So I just want to put that out there first. Um, 
In the staff report, you say um, public gravity sewer is available at all of these locations with the exception of Morganton Road. Can you um, elaborate on that a bit? Probably cannot, but I can certainly turn the mic over to our engineer who, who provided that information for me. Interested in, uh, my, my real question is um, the expensive infrastructure as it relates to this project. Well, I'm not really sure why they were talking about Morganton Road because the sewer from this site would flow towards 15501, not Morganton. It's in your staff report, so I was interested in. Um, well, it's, is there sewer on Morganton Road? Uh, in certain locations, I, I want to say this is kind of referring to the the overall CDP language, not necessarily being specific to this PDP that's coming before you right now. So did you author that section on the staff report, James? I don't think I did, actually. I don't think he authored it. I but. think, I, I, think I, I probably consulted with him, but I also looked at the uh, utility maps and there appeared to be a deficit of sewer lines along Morganton, but that is just not the location that would serve serve this project. Okay, so, it, you're, so your testimony today is that the deficit would not impact this particular project. Is that right, or is that not correct? That is a correct statement. That's, okay. And then can you um, also talk to me about um, the UDO stated intent of regulations and where you stand as staff in regard to um, G or K as far as the intents that are documented in your report and the suggestion from the planning board, do you agree with or disagree with the connector in light of that um, creativity and recreational response that it might be a good idea to have a connector as a part of the project to the soccer fields? Do you, take, do you have any stand on that? I'll just read G states promote creativity and innovation in the design that leads to more appropriate relationships between land uses and features. And absolutely, I think that's part of the, the reason that there is some flexibility allowed in plan development districts. In this case, we happen to have an existing recreational facility adjacent to the site and the planning board uh, was very astute in picking up on uh, the, the, um, the potential uh, opportunities there. Okay, let me also add I to my list. Is it foster, I states, foster development of a network of open space to serve a variety of recreational and environment purposes designed and located with respect to the existing unique natural features in environmentally sensitive areas. Would you think that would also support a connector? A connector to, to, to the soccer fields. To the soccer fields. I, I do think it would. I think that there are also additional features in the design that that are supported by this statement, including the, um, the the way the pedestrian network runs along this proposed new connector road, okay. um, and and allows for uh, pedestrian ability to move through this entire CDP site ultimately at build out. Okay. And then Ms. Graham, also in regard to K under the UDO stated intent of regulations, do you think that integrate public spaces and amenities to promote a community gathering and activities, do you think that supports a connector? To, okay, thank you. Can you explain to me then on the, uh, if you're tracking with me, on the next page of your staff report, it says the UDO sets the expectation for uniqueness. I'm on the first paragraph of that page in the design and the development of plan development in 3.5.14, allowing for a significant degree of deviation from the UDO, specifically allows for alternative standards as long as the proposal, and it has the stipulations set forth. Can you help me understand, because I don't, uh, the importance of adding in that paragraph and just giving that background? What, what was your intent in including that in the, in the report? My, my intent was to take language that's already um, included in the UDO as it applies to this proposal and tie it to this uh, criteria that this proposal is consistent with the CDP that came before it and that it conforms to the UDO. And so my attempt to, t to tie those two together with this 
uh, this language from the UDO, which speaks to both the ability to provide some flexibility in design uh, without straying too far from what the provisions of the UDO um, st state. Okay. And, and that is, I've been in the design field as well, and I can tell you that that, that is not a black and white issue. It's in the, as many things in the eye of the beholder. Right, right. So we'll stipulate that's gray. I agree with you. Um, so, but, but I think that also there's, uh, there's an importance in your intent, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you're stressing the importance of complying with the UDO. Complying with the UDO while still allowing some flexibility based on the specifics of the project. Okay. Now, and I apologize, I know you're, you're new to your job. I'm fairly new to mine too, so <clears throat> I was not here in October when this came through the first round, and I apologize for asking a lot of questions, but I feel like it's my responsibility to the folks of Southern Pines that I do that. Um, in regard to the proposed linear park, and it talks about an, an average, basically is the way I read that, of 80 feet. Did, uh, did the 80 feet include the road? It, it's a total of 80 feet. Including the two, the, the four lanes no, of no, road? No. Okay. It's just, just the, the sort of green space and pedestrian amenities. Uh, that it might be as little as 20 feet on one side, right. but it has to be made up with 60 on the other for a total of 80, for right. example. And there in your report, because you said it, you could limit that to 20 feet on, as I understand, one side. Is that correct? Okay, if you could go as low as that. All right. And then um, you also said um, that that the according to the UDO and with the a number of units that are being requested, it's my understanding that they're they're requesting more units than are allowed under the rules of the UDO and fewer parking spaces than are demanded by the UDO. Am I correct on that? I would say the, uh, the second part related to parking, there is some language in the UDO that allows for fl flexibility in parking. So demanded is probably not the, the term. Not a I good word. Okay. There. Um, yeah. Okay. That's fine. Um, as far as the number of units, it is, it is um, fairly distinctly written uh, both in the UDO as well as in the CDP about the 16 dwelling un units per acre limit. Right, so we have both the UDO and the CLRP and the CDP that would limit it to 16 dwellings per, 16 dwellings per unit, and yet they're asking for 20.4. Is that correct? For this space. Right. Okay. And I certainly don't want to make the applicant's case for him. However, I think he'll, he'll, he'll come to you with some justification for why there might and be And I understand, greater and that's density. his job. I just want to make sure that I'm really clear as far as what the UDO says. And I, I apologize for the way I stated that. It's not 16 dwellings per unit, it's 16 units per acre. Per acre. Right. Units I'm, per I'm per acre. I correct myself. Yes. So, and what they want is 20.4 dwellings <laughs> per acre. Units per acre for this phase. Okay. So in, in this case, they are asking for 269 units. And if they were to comply with the UDO, which suggests 16 per acre, what would the total number of units be in that case? You're asking me to do math. And I, I, <laughs> I'll, I'll, go, I'll go with you. 13.18 acres. 16, so the total number of units. 200. So instead of 269, it would be 211 if we as a council followed the guidelines of our own UDA, correct? Just along those same lines, because I had tons of questions about this. Is it only phase seven? And again, when you explain the explanations of why, if they're not going there, I assume you're going to put them somewhere else because you got your captain number. Is it only phases seven and eight where other residential units could go, if I'm reading this right? That's a good question. And then there's a lot of phases. Up for you. That was the only one I saw that said mixed use. While he's while BJ's looking for that, I will say that does retail office allow it? I may I may be misconstruing my. There's a, there's a land use exhibit, and here here's 
here's that. It was part of the CDP pr proposal, which designates areas that allow residential. And 650 total throughout throughout all phases that, that do allow residential. And in this case, if more density were allowed in phase two, that would limit the number of units that could be so that used one is, elsewhere. Does the blue and the purple allow potentially residential? That's what I can't, I couldn't remember off the top of my head, which the blue does, so it's just the blue. Okay. That yellow is the site that uh, is before you tonight. Gotcha. I'll probably have more questions, but that helps me when they so get to the, the point. Thank you. So follow up on Mr. Pate's astute question. It's a 650 cap for this entire project. Is that right? And a cap is not a mandate. They don't have to build 650, correct? That's correct. Okay. And if they follow the guidelines of the UDO in this case, this would be a 211 unit for this phase. Yeah. This, this phase. This phase. Thanks. Understand your statement in the or somebody's statement. I'm not sure. I understand that sometimes there's some co-authoring regarding the orientation of the building. It says the submitted orientation of building in phase two is considered by staff to be inconsistent with both the CDP and the UDO. Correct. That, that's, that's correct. Okay. The UDO calls for the buildings uh, in the Morgan Park Overlay District to be both oriented to the street and close to the street. The CDB, CDP requested uh, a, a deviation that said the buildings will not be close to the street, but they will be oriented to the street. And that is what brought me to this conclusion that we've we've really lost both of those provisions right. with, with the plan that's before us right. tonight. And and as a council member, I want to thank you for actually taking a stand and, and putting that in there as guidance for us because you are so much wiser about this than I am. So it makes a red flag go up for me when it says it's inconsistent with the UDO. And that's based on an interpretation. And, I understand. And, and, and that's still, still to be determined right. of and what we mean by street. Right, which what maybe is something we should address in the UDO as far as with more specificity. Correct. Okay. The plan, again, according from your, your, your um, staff report, the plan orients the building toward the internal private street and provides direct access to adjacent open space for some units. The decision must be made as to whether the UDO language intends to draw the building toward the public connector road that provides access to the apartment complex rather than the internal private road that winds its way through phase two development. And that, I think, sums up what you just said. Is that it correct? Does, it does. I wanted to read that into the record. Okay. The, um, I really appreciate your patience, and I thank you. And I think Mr. Pate has some more questions. Before you, I, where can I find that? I don't see it in our staff report. That blue, the original plan development. Page forty. I think it's there. Was included in the packet, is but there, you got it. perhaps not. I'm terrible at twenty-eight of fifty-five. Thank you. Now I got it. While we're looking at that page, I have a question, Ms. Graham. Can you just help me understand? Earlier in the staff report, you mentioned 13.18 acres. Yes. And then when we look at this, it actually says 12.7. Is that 12.7 acres, the AC? Is that, looking at this exhibit, I think because this was conceptual in nature early on in the process, this is part of the CDP process, that the actual parcel lines and uh, project area had not been that clearly defined at that time. But it is 13.18. It is yes. Okay, thank you. That's. Is that all we had? Yes, right, Brazil. Do you have questions, Bill? No, I'm, I, I do, but I'll let them um, present and then I'll pass. Okay. So that's fine. Thank you, Pam. You did a great job. We appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else has questions for Pam? Okay. The applicant's representative. representative. Thank 
you very much. I'm Tom Johnson. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Williams Mullen at 301 Fayetteville Street, Suite 1700 in Raleigh, here on behalf of the applicant. Um, we also have our, we got the presentation up, which is good. Um, a lot of the questions that have already been raised will be addressed in our presentation, you know, step by step. But this is, we're coming forward with the first 269 units on the parcel that was designated as multifamily in the C CDP uh, out of the total of 650 units. Um, the questions about the, uh, the number of units and orientation and all those will be addressed when Mr. Kuntz gets up here and goes through the project. So I do want to make you, thank you, uh, aware of that uh, when he gets up here. Um, I do want to also remind you, I know it was mentioned in the staff report, as part of the approval on the PDP for the phase one, when the TIA was done for that, the assumption was made or the, uh, that there would be 260 units on this parcel, on this multifamily parcel as part of that TIA. So that's why the minor amendment of the TIA is in your packet uh, that Travis flew it with Kimley Horn, who's also here, said that the additional nine units would not really change the findings with respect to that TIA. So I did want to point those two things out as we start. But first, I'd like to recognize Adam Tucker with Zimmer Development, just to give a little bit of an introduction. Then I'll turn it over to Bob to go through the really the details of our present or of our proposal for the PDP. So Adam, if you'll come up. To introduce this as Exhibit C, and I did want to make one clarification. I think the staff report included the application, right, and all the associated documents, mm -hmm. so I think that's already in there. And that's what I noticed with the staff report, so I did want to clarify that. Thank you for reminding me that, but this, we do want this included as okay. Exhibit C. Approved. Madam Mayor, is there a chance we can turn the fans off? Yeah, James. The fans. Jane, can you work your magic? Just if someone can work on it while guys, we're listening. Are you guys all freezing? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Can we do something about that? That's great. I've learned. I feel like I'm on the hot seat up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good then. <laughs> Maybe you like it freezing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little chilly up here, let me just tell you. Welcome, uh, Adam. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, oh, good. It was like 40 years. Even better. And they've only got 31. I'm Adam Tucker, uh, uh, 111 Princess Street, Wilmington, North Carolina. I work for Zimmer Development Company. I uh, recognize you guys from an earlier project that we have uh, completed and uh, finishing up now, which was Eagle Landing, uh, came before you a number of years ago. But uh, before we kind of get into everything, for, for people who don't know, um, Zimmer Development has been around for, you know, since 19, the mid-1980s. It's still a family-owned company. Um, we don't have outside investors, so all the money that's spent is Zimmer money. We're not a pension fund from Alaska. We're local to Wilmington, born and raised in North Carolina. Um, I told you guys when we started that we are long-term holders. We don't sell, sell projects. And as a testament to that, we're about to close on a permanent loan for Eagle Landing at the end of the month, which will lock us in for 20 years. And so we're... We're not going to sell it. We've got loan quote. We're done. So we'll be the landlord there for uh, years to come. Uh, you can see our history here. Um, you know, we, we, we travel up and down the East Coast as far out as Michigan. And, you know, I heard some comments earlier about the process here. And I will say that the process here is more arduous than a lot of places that we develop. Um, the Architectural Review Board is very unique to this town. Um, it, can, it, it, it does make uh, consistency a possibility uh, when in a lot of places there is none. So um, I think it's a fair process. I think it's, um, you know, nothing's perfect, but our, our experience here was good uh, with Eagle Landing. Um, this is a quick, uh, just a couple of slides for you who, who may not have visited Eagle Landing or been in there, but... It's uh, 288 units, so similar to the size project we're talking about on this one. Uh, we are 99.5% leased. Um, it's been a very well received. I know we have at least one resident in the room with us tonight, and, and I think that um, Mr. Kuntz uh, says that uh, he's got a couple of employees that are living there as well. So if you want to know who are living in these multifamily apartments, um, they're among you tonight. 
Um, this is just a quick interior shot of the clubhouse, um, the leasing office. We do kind of an Apple genius bar where you come in and sit down and kind of talk about what your needs are and, and kind of go from there. Uh, one thing I will say about the process at Southern Pines, you know, we, we wanted it to be a golf theme. And so we wanted the interior streets to be named after golf, you know, whether it's a, a, a personality or a course or whatever. And the street naming process is very difficult in Southern Pines because if you have Eagle Point, you can't have Eagle Landing. So it took us forever to get names, but that was just a tidbit of information that was fun. Um, and then these are typical interior units to the to the apartments, um, you know, hardwood floors, uh, the uh, or or I guess they're um, laminate floors similar to this that that simulate hard, hardwood, uh, stainless steel appliances, you know, all the things that you would expect in a first class apartment uh, complex. So we were very pleased with with the end result and the process. And I actually was reading the pilot and came across the article that talked about. Morganton South and the development and uh, called up the overall developer and he actually knew Jeff Zimmer uh, from a previous uh, project that they worked on and um, so I decided you know let's see if we can do something and we got the band back together it's the same team that did Eagle Landing of course the first call is to Bob and you know we give him the, the parcel and tell him to make it Southern Pines so we give him carte blanche to do what he thinks is best for Southern Pines. He knows you guys much better than we do. Uh, so he's the lead design on this and has been from day one. And um, we're going to turn it over to him to let him share his vision. And I'll be here for any questions you have about Zimmer or any projects we've done in the past. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Bob Kuntz, Kuntz Jones Design, 150 South Page Street in Southern Pines. Um, I'm here this evening uh, representing uh, Zimmer Development, and uh, Alan, Adam did a, a good job of describing Zimmer, and he is correct. Uh, we have hired um, just recent hires, uh, a new hire who's a full-time person with us, and they, a summer intern, and they both were able to find housing at Eagle Landing. They looked all over town, and were able to, to find a spot in one of the new buildings. So. Um, uh, if you have questions about who's living there, those are the, the folks that are living there. So, um, but looking at the overall site context, and, and Pam did a good job of describing this, I, I'm going to go up. I guess I like Take the mic, please. That's a good idea. <laughs> so, so looking at the o overall site, as we talked about in the CDP, the yellow boundary represents the CDP area uh, for Morganton Park South. Uh, Morganton Park uh, or Morganton Road being on the north side, US 15501 on the west side. Uh, the red area represents uh, what was considered phase one of the development, which included the uh, Target Shopping Center as well as the roadway uh, parkway connector that will connect uh, 15501 with Morganton Road and come all the way through. The development. Uh, the blue area that you see is the uh, multifamily uh, development that is proposed this evening. Um, looking at, at this diagram again, um, in uh, Ms. Clement's question earlier about the parcel boundary, uh, this parcel does actually go a little beyond uh, what was designated as strictly multifamily. However, multifamily is permitted in the mixed use area as well. Um, this is really to get access into the property based on the access locations that were part of the overall uh, Morgan Park or the not the Morgan Park South, the Parkway connector that runs through. There are separations uh, that were required in uh, the original uh, CDP application and in the uh, phase one development and the separation for that access, full motion access drive is right here, uh, which allows a, this project to take into account that additional acreage. So that is part of that. Uh, as has been mentioned previously, up to 650 multifamily units were permitted uh, within this boundary area, uh, which is again represented by the yellow boundary uh, located here. So looking at uh, the parkway access, and this goes back to the, what I was, was discussing earlier, uh, the parkway will be constructed all the way through from 15501 to Morganton Road. 
Uh, the access points were designated in the CDP and also in the first phase in the PDP development since it included the design of uh, the parkway connector. So that access point was designated at this location and has been designed and is working its way through. Um, Pam mentioned uh, the original plan. This was actually presented as part of the PDP plan, the phase one PDP, and did include a multifamily development layout in this location. Um, it's very difficult when you're at this level um, looking at a master plan without any grading, without any engineering, without anything like that to actually get a plan that really works. As we really dove into this, as the shopping center got to its grading plan and we looked at the grading that was on this side, we needed to make some modifications because of the design and <clears throat> the topography of the site. So it's a little bit of a challenging site, quite frankly. It's, it's pretty steep going across. <clears throat> And talking uh, about the existing conditions, uh, you can see on this side is the future parkway connector. Uh, this is the actual design from uh, the parkway connector plans uh, that have been submitted. Uh, includes a full motion intersection here. Uh, so there are two lanes that go north, two lanes that go south, and then there is a turn lane designed to come into uh, this multifamily development. <clears throat> the shopping center is located on this side. Uh, these two buildings are, uh, have a courtyard in between and are considered to be future restaurant locations uh, with an outdoor courtyard, fountains, trellises, and just a nice place uh, uh, to visit. Topographically, uh, this site is about 10%, uh, a 10% grade and slope from one side to the other. There's over 50 feet of grade change on this site from the soccer fields to of the shopping center. There's, so there's a lot of grade that we're trying to deal with here, <clears throat> which really drives a lot of the design of the site. Um, in addition, uh, one of the other items that we've had to work with, uh, and this will go back to the building orientation discussion, uh, are these the power line easement here that's located along the side. It's a 100 foot wide power line easement. Um, there are large transmission lines that, that are across that area, and then other uh, large or smaller lines as well. It is a 100 foot wide easement and there can't be any planting in that area. So uh, it has to be, it will always be open underneath and uh, we're doing some things in the design to try and work with that and screen it. <clears throat> Moving to the site plan, um, I'm actually gonna start here and sort of work my way across. Um, this is the future boulevard and the parkway uh, coming in the main entrance. You can see how the existing utility easement bisects the front of the property. Um, <clears throat> there's not really any room here to get a building in um, and coming in and this will create a nice entrance getting the, prop the, the, the development off of getting people out and away from the parkway as they enter into the, the development. I think one of the things uh, at Eagle Landing um, that's been really nice I think for the residents is the fact that both access points are, are separated from the main roadway and separated from 15501. Looking, <clears throat> so coming in, trash compactor located here. And again, this will be clear and open. So there won't be any landscaping in this area. So what we, we try to do in the site plan is put parking located here and make sure that we had room in between the parking lot and the power line easement to get landscaping, to screen the parking, to screen the buildings, and so it didn't feel like, as you're looking, sitting here, looking across, you're just looking across blank land to a parking lot. You know, it, we wanted to make sure we had plenty of landscaping in between. <clears throat> so, um, and this, will, this area will include the linear park as well. So, so coming along, bring, coming back into the development, uh, this parking street that comes through and connects all the way back to this building. Uh, the clubhouse is located in the center of the property. And, uh, we'll have direct access in, in this centralized with pedestrian and, and sidewalks connecting uh, all portions of the project. Uh, I'll show a little enlargement of this area in a minute, but the buildings are oriented really toward the shopping center. We wanted to orient those buildings toward the shopping center and toward the recreation area and the soccer complex to the north. And before you leave that slide, can you show me again where the trash compactor is? It's right here. It will be hidden and screened. On the boulevard? Right next to the boulevard? That is the boulevard. Right. So it's probably 250 feet away. From and that's the your entryway off the boulevard. You come in and you go by the trash compactor on your left as you're entering. You come by, 
yes, you would come by this way. This will be screened with fencing and brick walls and things like that. As you come in, they'll be screening there. It also creates a nice location as people are leaving the development and a place to put their trash as they're leaving their development Ooh. day in, day out. Okay. While you're there, did you also say that the linear park is the same open area for the power lines? Um, part of the linear park does cross the power lines. That's correct. Okay. Can you show me where the linear park is then? Um, actually, I'll go to the next Two slides up. Um, question, Taylor. If the linear park was under the power lines. Okay. I'm trying to decide where the two. Okay. okay. Part, part of it does go under the power line. It, it has to at some point, and it will go under the power line on both sides of the roadway because it, it, it has to go through that area. It has to make a connection. So in this case, the, the linear park, the linear park is designated as 60 feet in this location. Uh, it's 40 feet through this area and then widens back out to 60 feet in this location. Again, as was mentioned earlier, the linear park is a requirement of 80 feet, and it can be 40 and 40, it can be 60 and 20, uh, whatever it is, it, as long as it doesn't go below 20 on either side, um, but it can go up to 60 on any side. So in this case, we have plenty of room. We've set the buildings back from that linear park specifically to make that uh, linear park uh, have a, gr a, a better feel along this area and to try and work with these power lines, trying to, to really minimize those. So if you're driving down this way, and when we designed the parkway location, we tried to design it such that you would never get a view directly down the, park, the, the power line. So we would turn this roadway, we would turn it, and you wouldn't get that view directly down. And if you did get it, it would be really quick, split second. Mr. Murphy has a question. Yes. Just to be clear, when you say linear park, are you referring to parking or are you referring to a park? We're referring to landscaping. Um, if you remember doing the, the CDP process, uh, we committed, uh, the developer committed to doing a linear park all the way from 15501 all the way to Morgan Road. That would be a, an 80 foot wide minimum right. all the way from, from that direction. That, that park, there were stipulations included in that application that requires sitting areas, trellises, benches, uh, trash receptacles, et cetera, at intervals as it moves all the way through. So this project will actually require a sitting area and a trellis and a trash area as well as sidewalks and or a greenway trail. Thank you. So that will all be part of the linear park that goes all the way. So there'll be a sitting area, I think it's, it's right here. Um, that's part of this requirement because of the, the distance between this shopping center uh, sitting area and the next shopping or sitting area that's required as part of the, the process. So a lot of amenities. It's gonna, I, I think the linear park is just going to be a really interesting element for the town and something that you've never really seen in any other development in Moore County, quite frankly. <clears throat> so back to the site and plan. What, just one more thing. Yeah. Is, is that also the area where you are planning on doing the equestrian themed like railings and that. Th that's right uh that would be on this side um okay. and part of the shopping center so yeah the, that equestrian themed fencing would be all the way through that area and connect so thank yeah. you that's right that's right so the idea is to to make this parkway a really nice drive as you're driving through uh, which is another reason why we we want to set these back a little bit especially with the fact that there's an, a, an easement here we're trying to to, to tuck this in a little bit and make that ride better <laughs> than, than having these buildings sitting on the power line easement, you know, and we, we want to get the buildings away from the power line easement too. So, <clears throat> so thus the deviation request related to, um, that's one of the elements, reasons why, but, and we'll go through more later, but, um, <clears throat> but again, coming in, parking lot is centered uh, and the parking lot is in between the buildings. The buildings are on both sides, hiding and screening the parking lot from the parkway, uh, working around the design, <clears throat> coming in this way with this building. This is a, an area within the shopping center that is a park, uh, park-like area and sitting area with a trellis and landscaping and benches and things like that. So that will be, this building will be looking out over that area, <clears throat> which we think will be really nice and a really nice connection. These buildings were designed with the architecture in the back isn't just back of house type architecture. It's, it's, it's attractive to look at. So it's not something that 
that is really unattractive. <clears throat> We're providing this large pedestrian connection and a grand, stair a grand staircase and grand stairway that will connect from uh, this shopping center or from, from the multifamily development to the shopping center. Uh, there'll be a tot lot here, a dog- Quick, sorry. Yep, sure. Along those same lines, because to me, the access to the soccer field speaks to pedestrian access from outside the community of this development to it. Would you potentially put that out the back so people are at the soccer fields and they just want to be able to walk to the development? Um, are, you, are you there? Okay, yeah. never mind. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it, we're, we're, we're addressing all the, the questions through the presentation, but this shows the pedestrian connections. And after the planning board meeting and discussion, uh, we, we agree that that connection makes a tremendous amount of sense. Um, so what we've done is we've looked at, we've had to look at topography because there are a lot of walls on this site. What's your elevation change between the building closest to the soccer field and the soccer field? It's pretty significant, isn't it? Yep. yep. <laughs> so the balls are going to roll this way, right? So there's a 15 foot high retaining wall here. And then we're utilizing the building uh, to take up some of that grade too. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through this in a, in a few minutes as well. But here we are, we did agree that that soccer field connection, and we had to really look here to find the right location to, to put that connection. But what we found was that the retaining wall basically ends here and it gets back to grade uh, next to the, ball, the dog park. So it makes perfect sense to utilize that and then, then wrap around on top of the wall. There'll be guardrails, et cetera, to protect people, landscaping, guardrails, et cetera. But this also connects into a, an ideal location within the We'll be able to do conference. the walkway and have an ADA compliant? Um, is your grade, or does it need to do more of a switchback? It, it should be pretty close. Actually, I believe it's pretty close to, well, to accessible. This is maybe good I, in horseshoes, I, but let's talk I, about whether or not it complies with ADA. I didn't do, I didn't do that part of the application, so mm -hmm. I didn't do oh, the grading wait, study. Oh, wait, you got someone that. else who... Oh, Spencer. It is ADA compliant. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Coots, Mr. Coots, thanks you for throwing the lifeline there, too. He was feeling the heat. Good job, James, on the fans. So, so that was the ideal location, obviously, because we could make it ADA compliant. So, um, but it, it also ties in in a good location at the soccer complex, too. At, at the planning board meeting, we talked about possibly running it down the power line easement because it would be an easy connection, but this grade is really substantial. There's a huge drop off there. So this made a lot more sense to bring it in this way. It doesn't impact or, or, or come into any, any issues with the wall, et cetera, so it works. <clears throat> so let me back up. <laughs> so, um, one other item, uh, one thing, one other thing that we really wanted to do, and we saw it in that pedestrian slide and that connectivity, walkability, really creating the walkability for this neighborhood, not only to the shopping center, but, but to the uh, soccer complex as well and the recreation areas, as well as the linear park, because we think all those elements really make this a unique site. They make it a, a, a great location for apartments. Um, we also connected an internal street that connects back to the shopping center as well. So if someone's picking up a large item or something like that and they can't walk, it's very easy to, to instead of having to come out on the main street, uh, use internal capture and just come directly into the shopping center. Would that street have curbs and gutters? Yes. Thank you. Yes, this, this entire development is required to have curb and gutter for sure. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> I think that's it for the site plan for now. Um, looking at the pool and amenity area, again, this area is elevated. And again, we'll look at that cross section in a few minutes, but the clubhouse area and pool would be developed very similar to that at Eagle Landing. Uh, very similar uh, concept with fitness center, uh, meeting rooms, uh, the other things that are, are in that, that location. The amenities outside would include pool, um, a pool pavilion, which would be open air with grilling areas and restrooms, et cetera. Uh, and then this, we were putting in a practice putting green uh, and some other synthetic turf areas that just would be a nice place for, for, for the folks and the residents that are there. Uh, having a sun terrace out here, this sun terrace and trellis, uh, these would be terrace walls. So rather than, than having one big wall or two big walls here, uh, we're, we're sort of creating a hanging garden. So each of these areas would be landscaped, 
uh, with a really nice plantings, et cetera, that would connect back to, and if, if you remember from the other plan, that, that this connection goes directly to that courtyard. So looking back from that courtyard, if you're in the space at the restaurants in the courtyard, you would be looking back into this area and looking at the hanging gardens and, and you know, that kind of thing. So we think it's a, a really unique feature and it, it really creates a good way to transition the amount of grade that we have to transition on this site. <clears throat> this plan does show the linear park that we, we discussed. Also shows the overall open space on the site and uh, looks at, at the overall site in general. I think there's not much different on this plan that I really need to discuss. So looking at the overall site information, it is 13.18 acres, um, currently vacant land and part of the CDP. Um, the overall CDP area was 650 multifamily units. Um, and this does propose 269 on 20.4 acres. Again, the TIA did contemplate 260 units on this track of land uh, as we were working on the phase one development. Uh, the required buffers are in place. Um, <clears throat> one of the interesting things about this site, and actually all of Morgan Park, is it is outside of any high-quality watershed. There are no high-quality watersheds. There are no high-quality streams. Uh, there's nothing. There's nothing like that. So no water protect or watershed protection permits are necessary for this site. So it becomes an ideal place for development, especially if we're starting to talk about density and where to put density. This is an ideal location because of the env limited environmental impacts within the town. <clears throat> No wetlands have been in, uh, are on the property, and, and most of the property has been timbered in the past. It was a driving range. It's been other things, so there are, there are no woodpeckers or endangered species on the site today. <clears throat> so, as was discussed earlier, we are asking for an increase in density. And I've, I've hit on a few of the reasons why um, as we, we started talking. One of the other big reasons to, to look at increased density, especially in this area, uh, the overall CDP area does allow for 650 multifamily, or multifamily units, <clears throat> but, and it's part of a big mixed-use development. So what that does, it really encourages walking and walkability, pedestrian, bicycle traffic, et cetera. There are also the captured trips for cars and, and keeping traffic off the roads because people can utilize internal streets and internal areas that keep people off of 15501 and off of Morganton Road that live within this development. So if you wanted to go to the grocery store, you wanted to go to Lowe's Foods, eventually you would just drive within the development. You wouldn't have to get on Morganton Road. You wouldn't have to go to the 15501 intersections. All of that is captured internally within the CDP area. Um, likewise, if future development occurs and there are office buildings and someone can actually live, work, and play within the same development, that's a, a, a big win for everybody from a traffic perspective, uh, from a walkability perspective, multimodal transportation, et cetera. So it, <clears throat> it really makes a lot of sense. And with this site's proximity directly adjacent to a large shopping center that has restaurant opportunities, et cetera, and the fact that the CDP area calls for 650 units as a whole, this is really an ideal location to maximize as much as can, can happen directly adjacent to this site. <clears throat> um, so we think it makes a lot of sense to have that here uh, with the recreation opportunities, the shopping opportunities, the entertainment opportunities <coughs> that exist directly adjacent to this property. <clears throat> and again, um, the high quality watershed being outside of that high quality watershed uh, and with the understanding there are no endangered species that would be impacted by this development. If we start to develop further out, if you're looking at what, what is the alternative, if density isn't allowed here, then it means you have to go further to the edge to continue to develop, and, and it starts to start to eat away the countryside. Uh, it goes outside of Southern Pines where there's less control over development as well. Um, <clears throat> looking at the building orientation, we've talked about a lot of this uh, already. Um, we are trying to really orient the buildings toward the shopping center and away from the power lines. And again, to really encourage walking and shopping and, and different modes of transportation rather than just cars. Um, we really want to provide the screening and we want to get that a park-like transition to the linear park rather than an urban transition to that linear park. Back to the site plan again. And this is looking at some of that. And I think we've already 
talk about the power line easement in, in those items, but really trying to orient these buildings back toward the shopping center and away from the linear park and, and the parkway. I think the views will be much better driving down the parkway with these buildings back rather than, than up on the front uh, with the power line easement. If you, were, if you were to comply with the UDO in regard to orientation of the buildings, what, how would you do that? We would have one building right here. That would be the only way that we could do it because we don't have, <laughs> there's not enough room here for a building. Right. And this is the access location. Right. So we, would, we would basically place a building here and then probably place some type of building right here on the back of the power line easement. Yeah. which in my opinion would just not be very attractive and if I were a resident I wouldn't want to live right on a high powered power line easement okay. uh, with a power line easement my building sitting like this and just looking out of the power line I think it would be very challenging what do you see as the purpose of the UDO um, mandate that we should comply with it what, what do you think the intent was well, I think we asked for a deviation based on the large shopping center. Right. What do you think the intent of the UDO was? That is one of those items that goes back into the 90s right. uh, when the, when the uh, Morganson Road overlay was very different than it is today. It was a very different ordinance. Um, originally, basically what the uh, Morganson Road overlay and part of the reason it was changed was because the Morganton Road overlay basically said, let's design another downtown Southern Pines and let's pick it up and transfer it to this piece of property. So that wouldn't have been good. One, it wouldn't have been good for the town of Southern Pines because it would have sucked everything out of downtown Southern Pines. Secondly, <clears throat> I think looking at the topography of this track of land, I don't think it was ever contemplated to have, it was contemplated to have a grid system on this track of land. Correct. Yeah. To, to put a grid system on 10% topography, it's just, it's next to impossible. You, especially looking back when, when Mr. Patrick developed downtown Southern Pines, the grid system worked because you didn't have to, to deal with the Americans with Disabilities Act. You didn't have to deal with uh, wetland permits or any kind of permitting. Um, you, moving dirt was much easier, <laughs> even though the equipment was there. The, the regulations regarding dirt moving were very different. So um, putting a grid system on this track of land, as we've discussed on, on other projects on the north side and the south side, uh, just wasn't practical or feasible um, as that plan evolved over time. There were originally plans drawn for Morganton Road that did indicate a grid system. Are you aware of that? I am. Okay. I've seen those plans. And that, that plan also included a roadway, the parkway connector was a straight line right down the power lines, and the power lines were in the median of that road. Right. And I just think that would be an awful, awful place to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think this, <clears throat> the plan that was devised during this process, mm -hmm. um, where the road tries to downplay and pull away from those power lines, and cross it as quickly and efficiently as possible and get away from that uh, is a much better plan than what was originally prepared and proposed. Okay. Um, not to mention the grade condition. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure that the soccer complex was envisioned when that plan was envisioned either. I'm sure uh, and based on the grade along here, if, if that road had continued to come straight through and connect back to Henley, uh, that grading situation, I mean, there'd be a 25 foot high retaining wall down that whole side of the property with a power line in the median, that would just be, that would just say Southern Pines. <laughs> it would be pretty, pretty bad. So let me, and, and at one point it was 269 and, and 211 is what is um, acceptable. So you're asking for more units and less parking. Can you address those two? Yeah, the, the parking. Incompatible issues in my head. <laughs> well. The parking isn't, is a reduction of the required parking for the 269 units. It's not an increase in the density, you know, saying 211 units and the parking for that, and then just having that and reducing that. It's, it's based on the calculations. For Hold the on, that, say, that, say what you just said again, because did that make sense? Okay, just check. Okay, so right, if we look at again. the parking data, um, the way it's calculated is one bedroom is one space per unit in the UDO. So in this development, 
Of 269 units, there are 85 one-bedroom units. There are also 184 two- and three-bedroom units which park at two spaces per unit. That totals 85 and 368. And then in the UDO, and this is where the UDO is very heavy on parking for multifamily, and we've had discussions with staff about this, and um, I think staff has been encouraging us to reduce parking in multifamily where possible because it just adds impervious surface. It takes away landscape space, all those kind of things. So the idea of right-sizing multifamily parking uh, is pretty important, I think, <clears throat> for the town as it moves forward with multifamily development. So in this case, total parking required would be 577 spaces at 1.88 spaces per unit. That is a very high number of parking spaces for multifamily development. It's extremely high. So what we're asking for in the request is to uh, reduce the parking spaces to 434 units, which gives a 1.61 spaces per unit ratio, which is essentially what was granted to Eagle Landing when it was developed. And at this point, at build out, um, they are seeing no issues related to the amount of parking spaces. They're not having fights over parking spaces or anything like that. So the parking is right sized. And <clears throat> the good thing about right sizing parking, again, is less impervious surface, more landscape et cetera, as opposed to just paving everything and paving the world. Nope. So you have the 211 units that the UDO um, would find suitable, or we would find suitable if we follow the UDO. Um, how many of those units would be one bedroom, two bedroom, or two or three bedroom, and what would your parking number of parking spaces be for that? Please. I really couldn't speculate on a mix because okay. the development mix for a multifamily development is really, it's dependent on a lot of factors that related to demographics, related to the types of units. So coming up with that ratio of one bedroom to two and three bedrooms. Well, about time. twice as many, a little more than twice as many two, three bedrooms. And, right. um, and so if we, if we went with that math, can somebody help me with that? If we did 211. 211, that 1.6 is 337. 337 spaces, and you're asking for 434. So we could really make your job easy if we could all comply with the UDO. Because we have. Right, and you still need guest spaces. That's fine. I thought that was included in the 1.6. Is that correct? Do you, uh, PJ? Yeah, I'm just going by the numbers that are up there. The, 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 rate, the, the parking rate they're requesting after they've done calculating the different types is 1.6 spaces. Which includes the guest sites, right? It includes the, yeah, included the guest spaces. Was it the number? I'm just going with the number right there. They're going from 1.88 to 1.61. Right. I think 1.61 multiplied by 211. That's all. Okay, so then, okay. So that would be how many space? I'm sorry. Then what? What did you come up with? How many spaces? Three hundred thirty-eight. Three hundred thirty-six. Three hundred thirty-six-ish spaces, and three hundred thirty-eight. Okay, I'll go there, and that's with two hundred and. Did you say eleven units? Because I get two hundred nine point six. So I'll I'll meet you at two ten. How's that? So if I do the math, that's fine. But I also have another question about. Um, the application, Mr. Kuntz, this is, this is your signature on the application as agent, right? Yes. And this application says that this is 12.85 acres, and yet you're telling us it's 13.7 tonight. So, it's 13.18 acres. So, which one is it? Because that, again, would drop your units pursuant to the UDO. Acres. So why does your application that you signed? Because at the time, that was the acreage, and this additional parcel was added after the fact. That little piece that he mentioned. Okay, so the, the piece that you mentioned is Small parcel is during acre. the application. And yet the application was not updated after that was added. We can update it. No, I'm just <laughs> interested in why that wouldn't be something you would do as you go along. If you change the parcel you're asking us to make a determination about, it seems like well, we should have noticed that. A surveyed boundary and a legal description, which totals 13.18 acres. Okay. Um, so that is all part of the application, and that is truly what, the, and rather than the application, that's what 
the, the zoning would be subject to. And this is your signature on an application that says 12.85. I just want to make that point, that that's, that's really frustrating from my point of view. Well, I mean, what the application is, is just... Oh, you don't have a mic. Can you share your mic with Mr. Johnson, please? What the application is, is just a summary of what's in there and which initially signed. But the actual site plan was included with 13.18 acres later on. I can move right now to amend the application form itself to say 13.18, but all the exhibits, all the maps, the staff report, everything else refers to 13.18. So that's all consistent. I understand just one. that. Right. Let me tell you how frustrated I get when things are sloppy, though. And it really, I'm, I'm sorry, but it really frustrates me and it really does, is not respectful of us. Your application says 12.85, and now you're talking to me about another acre. Uh, the, the exhibit. The just exhibit say I'm sorry. I mean, just say I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry we okay, made a mistake. You. I mean, you know, it's. Apologies. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, errors are made, but at least the exhibits and the things that were substantive. I know, and uh, you understand my concern, though. I, and you've heard the people I represent, they're not happy. Well, the, again, yeah. and I'm yeah. the requests. Well, again, I'll turn it back over to Bob, but I just wanted to make sure that the substance was there. Uh, Thank I have you. a couple questions, Bob. Uh, the first one, my biggest, I mean, you said that they know what they're doing. Nobody's going to rent an apartment if they can't find parking. So when you say you want less spaces, I'm like, well, sure, that's better than a big empty parking lot. So I'm, I'm glad about your calculations being less. And I'd, my question, which I think you've answered, is does that just mean that those additional parking spaces will be, will be impervious, not just pavings with no lines on them? Yeah, uh, yes. Um, yeah, if, you, if you look at the site plan, yeah, the, the parking spaces that are calculated are only the ones that are in the paved areas. Um, those will be curb and gutter and asphalt, et cetera. And those include the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA uh, parking spaces as well. So all those are included as well as the garage. So that one shows, because I thought you'd said either, you could make either one work, but this one shows the lesser, lesser dense parking. Technically, you can park under power lines. That's a reasonable thing by Duke Energy. Okay, let's get back to the 269. Oh, sorry. No, 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 that was gonna be my second question. And I just need to understand something. Because it, while it's independent of this project, it's going to come up again. But my math at 16, your acre, you're never going to get to 650. It's, it, because you only showed 40, um, 30 some acres of residential, which to me came to 500, not 650. So are we going to be asked every phase to go to 20.4? Or because I thought it was a Rob Peter to pay Paul fine, we'll put more dents here, but less dents there. But when I do the math, they're all going to have to be 20.4. And is that's, that, or am I wrong? I, maybe I'm. That, that's not going. That's not going to compute, as you well know. You, you you can tell by the the climate that you really need to figure out how to get 211 to be. To and be and 650 is a cap. It's not a requirement. We don't have to have 650. We can have 500 if that's what we're doing. 50 though. So it, it's, it's also I'm, my expectation is that you'll follow the UDO, and if it's permitted for 650 and yet you don't have enough land to do that while complying with the UDO, then I, I don't think that's appropriate. Is, is it, I guess my math correct, to get to 650, you're going to have to ask to be deviation for the entirety of all the acres. Exactly. Or, or am I missing Not a spot? Huh? I mean, or am I missing a spot? Because I'm like, if it just means one's going to be less dense, well, where, where would that be? Um, I, I believe office permits, does office permits multifamily as well? If I'm not mistaken, so it doesn't, it doesn't. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So, what is your math, Bill? I just in rough estimates, around 500 units at what 30 times. I don't know, right? 16. I don't know if that was right. About to so do technically, again. this would take 269 out of that number, whatever that number is. So, but also, I feel like if to what Mr. Pate was saying, if if the average we're looking for is 16 an acre, and we put it more dense in one area, which I'm okay with tucked away density, hiding it I think is a, not a bad thing, but then everything else should average back out to the 16. 
Oh, it's like if that if we can put that in there, I would yeah. be okay with it. Would you? Would that be? Well, would does that require a rewrite of the entire PD? If they were, if that's where this goes. Again, it's a cap. It's not a requirement. They won't get to it. If you if you have to. You're looking at this PD. That's right. That's right. I'm looking at thir I'm looking at 13 acres. Going with that thought, however, that theoretically this could be the the last multifamily project within the CDP, so you would never have one at a lower density to bring it back to what you're after. Okay. Because the only thing you have in front of you right now is this PDP, as as BJ said. Right. Yeah. Because there are multiple uses that would be allowed on that blue color you're looking at, and one of them happens to be multifamily, but it could be something else too. Right. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it would be very similar. It's it's very similar to the same thing that we do for open space. The um, there's a running tabulation that we get approved in the process, and that running tabulation goes through each of that that part of that process and each part of that step. So, as a just looking at the open space as an example. The open space and, and how density would be in a similar chart if the next multifamily project is to come in, we would be following to that standard. So whatever that number is is what that number would be. So um, maximizing here, you know, this again, this is open space, it's not density, but it's the same scenario. So phase one, which was the shopping center and the parkway, uh, had 5.92 acres of open space. Um, and 5.92 acres of usable open space. Required open space in the development as a whole, the CDP, is 20% overall open space and 10% of that open space has to be usable. So this project, uh, phase two, brings in an additional 2.6 acres, 1.97 acres, or a total of 8.52 and 7.89. So we keep track every time we go through this and each, each development, each phase of development within the CDP, and it shows the amount of required open space and then how much is left to provide. So if we got to a point at the end of the development that said we need another 15 acres of open space, then and there's 16 acres of open space left in the overall CDP area, then you can only develop one acre of that. So it's the same with density. It's the same with the numbers. It's the same with that. So to your point, Bill, it would it would absolutely, uh, it's going to wash itself out as we move through. I'd like to, <clears throat> this might sound crazy because I know we've not dealt with the TIA yet. <laughs> but when considering, based on what I'm hearing, that density concentration eliminates traffic congestion by having residents walking rather than a whole bunch of driving from out of town, which will then decrease density elsewhere in the town. And considering that teachers from out of town are trying to find places to be in town so that they can teach our children. Then considering that, yes, we have a new UDO, but the UDO deviations allow for architectural flexibility that will contribute to our branding of our town and maintaining the historic footprint when intentionally done. And also when considering that we are in a conversation about economic development in West Southern Pines, and there needs to be an economic engine to provide some kind of traction. And there's a possibility of having a road extend out of West Southern Pines directly into this place. I'm just saying. And that road exists whether you have 269 units or 211. The road's there. So the next project, so this is 211 units. Mm -hmm. Well, that allows for 381 or whatever that number is. And, and they can go here, and we can get the same density, the same everything on this track of land. However, we feel, and I think everyone feels on our side, definitely, and I think from a planning perspective, an overall planning perspective, the more 
units that you can put here adjacent to this and the act activities that are happening here uh, as opposed to a lower density project. You know, a lower density project might make perfect sense here. Um, it could be multifamily units over office space. It could be multifamily units over retail space. There, could, there are so many options that could happen and occur here that could end up being lower density development. So I think trying to utilize location where we can truly use location and density to help affect traffic and help affect walkability and recreation and all those things, I think it's a very good thing for the town to consider. I think, uh, Mr. Murphy, I think you hit it that the more we do here, the less we do out. And that means that people here are driving in this area to go shopping, grocery shopping, Etc. as opposed to living out in Whispering Pines and driving all the way in to go shopping here. So the more we do here, the better it is. And then the fact that this is also out of a high density or high quality watershed, and it is uh, no endangered species on this tract of land versus the sensitivity of some of the land we see in Whispering Pines or near Whispering Pines or some of the other areas. Talk to me about whether or not you are a specialist on endangered species. I am not, but Dr. So what is, what, okay, so what is our proof that there are no endangered species there? What is our proof of no environmental impact? What is our proof of the biological assessment by Dr. Jay Carter that was included in the overall application? Mm -hmm. and I'm, He's not here for me to ask He's not here, but his letter and his Yeah, we, we had that yeah. originally. Mm -hmm. I mean, can we go back to the... Shows the apartment. I think one of the things we didn't come up with 269 units out of the air. So when we got this, go with the where you can see the rendering. When we when we received the CDP, which we were not a part of over the overall development, it showed this this is what was in what was approved by you guys. That is 260 apartments shown right there. there. When we did our site plan, the buildings just happened to shake out where there was nine extra units above the 260. So when we came back to staff, we said the TIA that you approved had 260 units shown here. So when we asked for nine additional units, we didn't have to do the full-blown traffic study because staff agreed we were already planning for 260 units. All you're asking for is additional nine, do a traffic update to show that nine. So I don't want you to think that we've come in here trying to stuff density down everybody's throat. We didn't. I guess that's, that's just where my misunderstanding is. Your number divided by is, is 20.4. So was the 16 never applicable? Was that never the rule if, it, if this approval was for 216 for 12.7 acres? Let me try to explain for BJ. He may have a, a separate <laughs> or, or what I, well, he's looking at you, but I'm, I'm going to answer. You're welcome to take a crack at yourself. Okay, let me take a crack at it. I think, personally, and, and we weren't involved in the CDP. We came late to the game. That was the overall developer. So what they did, I don't know how they came up with the number of maximum units, but no one did the calculation to say if we limit this to 16 units an acre, we can never get to 650 because, like your calculation, when you do the math with what's allowed, you can't get to 650. So there was an oversight. Okay, let me, let's have a point of information here. I wasn't on the council during the first hearing. Okay, okay. So please don't point at me and say I approved it because I didn't. So thank you. The council may have, but it's a new day. So anyway, that's where the six hundred or the 260 units came from. It wasn't something that we decided we're just going to come in here and ask for the moon. It was something that we felt had already been looked at and reviewed and it was an agreeable amount. And with the, you know, advent of the number of units per acre, you know, someone just didn't do the math. And to, to figure out that if you apply the UDO standards to what the, over, or what the CDP has stated is allowed for the maximum density, it won't work. It's and are you now willing to apply the UDO to this project? No, ma'am. We've come before you with the, the amount of units that we feel like is appropriate for this location because we feel like, again, for all the reasons stated, that if you were ever going to do more density, why not do it here right next to where all the services are? And for all the reasons with the environmental, the topography, the watershed, I mean, there's so many reasons to do density here. It, it just, it, it's, it's 
the, the perfect location for it. And it's, it's not impactful to, you know, as you stated, it's, it's kind of tucked back in. It's, it's kind of an enclave, just like Eagle Landing. If you drive past there, it's a very cool look. You look down the driveway and you're like, there's something back there. It's not overbearing, but you know it's something nice and, and palatable. So that's just my, that, I just wanted to explain where the 269 units came from, because I, I think people think we're just in here trying to, you know, do as much as we can, but we felt like since it had already been looked at that that was what we should strive for. That's all. Thank you, Adam. Break. I think people need about a 15 minute break, so we're going to take one now.
scampers to turn on sound, and here we have it. Thank you very much. All right. Um, before we continue with what we're dealing with, um, Adam has something to say. Adam Tucker has something to say. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so when we came here tonight... Excuse me back there. I know, but quietly. When we when we came here tonight, we were under the impression we were asking for nine units of additional density, which has turned into a much larger debate than what we anticipated. Um, we don't have the power to to change the CDP. It's not our our document to change. Um, I need time to go back and talk with Midland about the CDP, about the density. I'd like a little bit more time to get some clarity from staff on how we deal with what I'll say is just a math error. Um, okay. And so at this point, if we could continue it, that would give me some time to have some breathing room to figure out how we got here and okay. where we go. I don't think anyone would um, complain about that. So I'm looking. You bet to say something. Would your request be for 30 days to next month's meeting or 60 days or some, some other figure just for purposes when, when, of our is it agenda? 30 days is when? What, what's the next hearing date? Probably approximate, but July 12th would be the next business meeting of council. Um, it, you, it, yeah, I mean, I'd like to get back as soon as possible, okay. but it's, in all possibility, we may come back and say, can we have another 30 days? And but, that's, that's fine, too. So I'm looking to the council. So that basically gives you two weeks. That's, that's fine. I Is mean, that okay? I, I, I'm hoping that it'll be an easy conversation, but if not, then we'll just, I guess, do we, do we come back and ask for the continuance or can we just ask to be, we won't even be on the agenda if we know we're not going to. Once the council grants continuance, everybody who's here is interested in this file will know that the date that's been continued to, they can come back to that date because we don't re-advertise. You know what I'm saying? So at that point, it's up to them to grant continuances so people who want to participate can be here at the date we continue to, and then if there's another request for continuance, they can be here again. But but if we if we don't if we're not where we need to be in two weeks and we say we don't even want to be on the agenda at that point, we'd no, still come back. back here. Now we'll, we'll have to deal with it paperwork wise. Maybe you guys don't need to show up, but but if you think that might be the case, I would just go for sixty days now. Yeah, just go I ahead and the extend. Question. Yeah. Because yeah, you will be on the agenda. It is now open. It is an ongoing process? hearing. I, I feel like it's, we can do 30 days. I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, I would rather do 30, but could be six. Okay. So, okay. So I'm looking for the council to a motion to continue to the July meeting on the 12th. So moved. Second. Pleasure of the council. Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Our next one. This too is a quasi. Yes. Yes. Um, we're going to interject something. Well, we've decided not to do that because it's. We're just going to. She let her know. She, okay. She, she knows, and that's yeah. why she's laughing. We can still. We can still move. The reason for the discussion is that um, we did get a, a copy of the offer to purchase for the land at, at 891 West Pennsylvania. We do have that, and that's the reason for this discussion. And we'll, when we get to that part of the agenda, we will explain what we just talked about. So, But now we need to, to stay on, on track with this. Now we're going to the SU 0322. Um, it's another quasi-judicial. So will the parties that are involved in... The Murray Hill Pines, please stand, staff included. Oh, <laughs> and they keep coming. <laughs> okay. Um, please raise your, is that everybody? You're missing one? Okay. Just in case anybody's staying, can we just tell them what we're going to do? Oh, because we're, we have a pause in the action, we're going to go ahead. As I said, there's an offer on 891 West Pennsylvania. 
Um, the offer is to close on the 12th of July, and so we are going to extend our postpone our decision until the 25th of July at the next work, se work session, and hopefully that will um, have closed by then, and then and it's not it's anything we need to worry about. So we do have a... On the 15th, I think is right. Just yeah, it is, record, but yeah. we're going to go right. ahead, okay. in case, you know, because I know what closings can be like now. Um, and so that's, that's what we're going to do. We do have a copy of the contract. It's been um, scanned in, so that's, that's the plan. So when we get to that, and, and she knows that, that's the reason we have suggested that she can go ahead and leave. But since we're waiting for someone, I thought I'd let you all know what, we're, what we've been doing while you all are talking back there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we still missing? Well, it's uh, maybe now about five minutes after the first question. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? Just what? swear that. Swear to, okay, so we'll yeah. get him later. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can sing or, you want to sing or dance while you're <laughs> just waiting? You know? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got Jeopardy music they can play? <laughs> um, and if we want to, I guess we can swear these folks Well, is he? Yeah, he's, he's indisposed. Okay, he's indisposed. <laughs> okay, whoever's still left, um, please raise your right hand, respond to the following, state your name. Do you solemnly swear the evidence you shall give this board and this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And there's Bob. Okay. You got it. Council members, please disclose the following. Any site visits? No. Ex parte communications? No. Specialized knowledge you have of this case? No. Anyone have a fixed opinion that is not susceptible to change based on what they learn at this hearing? No. Where they have a close family, business, or other relationship with the applicant or other affected persons? Is there attorney representing the petitioner? Is there an opposition? Is there an attorney for the opposition? Seeing none. Okay. We will. Um, I need a motion to um, open this hearing. Um, oh, second. Aye. 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 BJ. Good evening, members of council. B.J. Grieve with the Town of Southern Pines Planning Department. Uh, let me start off by saying I would like to enter into the record as Exhibit A, uh, staff's report and packet that was in your packet for this meeting. I would like to enter into the record as Exhibit B, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to go through. Uh, then I would like to follow up by apologizing because our my esteemed colleague, Ms. Jennifer Hunt. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, who was supposed to be here tonight to present this has fallen ill. Oh dear. Therefore, I'm pinch hitting for uh, Miss Hunt, and so unfortunately, I have to lift, listen to me. I was about to say, I have Jennifer Hunt down here. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Um, what you have before you this evening is an application for 149 unit multifamily development. But it's a little different than the last one. It's a little different than anything uh, you guys have seen before. Uh, it's actually different than anything I've ever dealt with in my career. Uh, this is a project that is going to bring a product called a rent-to-own uh, product. A rent-to-own product is the hottest thing in multifamily right now. Mm -hmm. I'll give you some numbers I looked up on the, um, the internet earlier uh, today. And uh, the, what, I, what I saw was that in 2021, there were 6,000 units of rent-to-own product developed in America. And in 2022, it is projected that there will be 14,000 units of rent-to-own product in America. It is uh, a very popular thing. Here's what it is. It's sometimes referred to as horizontal apartments. Uh, it looks like detached single family residential. Uh, it functions like detached single family residential. But in fact, when you go into the development, you go to the main office, just like you would an apartment complex. You talk to them about signing a lease agreement to rent one of the units. And when you go out to the unit, you stand there and you look at it, and it looks like a detached single-family residential structure, uh, just like uh, uh, just like any other higher-density uh, single-family residential um, development. The property is not being subdivided because the, the houses are not built on lots that are separately conveyed. There is no preliminary plat. There is no final plat. Imagine, if you will, a, an apartment complex uh, that has uh, 149 units. And imagine those units are in buildings where you stack them up with Legos, right? And, and, you, have, uh, and you, you put them all in a, in a pile, and you have a pretty good size uh, shoebox-looking thing. Now take each one of those Legos 
and take them apart and spread them out across the property, as I said, like horizontal apartments. The rental agreements are similar, um, uh, but the product is very different. It's my understanding is that it's, and the applicants can definitely speak to this better, but as staff, we did a little research on this to understand the product. It's basically a portion of the market it's attempting to serve is those who don't want to or unwilling or unable to buy a house, but still want the experience of living in a detached single family residential home uh, with that context and yard and things like that. So the reason I, I led off with that is that that drives a lot of uniqueness to the conversation about this project. Um, staff looked at it and reviewed it as a multifamily development, but these are not multifamily buildings because each building is either a single family or a, or a duplex home, okay? And so, but it is a multifamily development because again, we're not subdividing. If we're not subdividing, we don't have a vehicle to drive this uh, except for multifamily development because, because uh, I'm repeating myself now, but again, box versus disassemble them all and spread them out, okay? Um, so with that, this is uh, 149 units. Uh, it's on 17.04 acres. It is zoned RM1. This is not part of a planned development. It's not a conditional district. This is just old-fashioned RM1 straight out of the UDO. Uh, if you did the calculation on how many dwelling units could go on 17.04 acres zoned RM1, the number is actually 204 uh, is the maximum density. That is the maximum mathematical density. That is not the functional density. Uh, if you were to actually determine access and everything else, excuse me, 203 units. The zoning district allows for up to 203 units mathematically. We tell people all day, every day that just because you're 40,000, just because you're zoned 20,000 square feet doesn't mean that you can subdivide to three lots. If you have 60,000 square feet, it depends on a lot of variables. But mathematically, you're at 203 units. So far, so good. That was a lot right there right off the bat. Um, all right. Uh, so, question. Yeah. I'm trying to get my head around. I apologize. You said rent to own. It was the first thing you said, correct? Uh -huh. Excuse me. Did I say rent to own? I meant build to rent. Build to rent is the phrase. Build, because yeah. yeah. like say... At some point, it is going to be subdivided, and what's the mechanism for that? Thank you. Okay. okay. So, yeah, go, go. Because I was thinking, that's not what I read. Okay. Is it, is it rent to own where you get, like, TVs and computers and sofas and stuff like that? Isn't that yeah. Concept. So, I was so, trying to okay. wait to hear so the rest. It's okay. Build, build to rent. Build. It's called it's called Bill to Rent. Yeah, yeah. I apologize for that. But really, uh, you're doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Built, built to Rent. Right. Built gotcha. to Rent. Yeah, built. Okay. Um, sometimes referred to by other things as well, but that's, that's the gist. Um, they are, uh, they are increased, as I said, increasingly common elsewhere in the country, and, and there's, there's many examples of projects like this. Let's talk about the subject property. This subject property is... All right. This subject property is right next to the property you guys were just looking at with the previous application. So here are the soccer fields. Here is where the previous project that was on the agenda is located right here, purely for reference. Um, this is Short Street right here. This is Murray Hill Road right here. Okay. And so you go up Short Street, the uh, radio station's right back here. You come up Short Street, you turn onto Long Street, and this used to be a manufactured home park uh, back here. The manufactured homes are in the process of or have been completed with being removed. I know they've been in that process for a number of, a number of times that I've been back there. Um, pardon? Um, so this is the location of the 17 uh, acres. The access to the subject property is actually um, both off of Long Street. Uh, Short Street is right here. Long Street's right here as well as there is access back here off of Haley Street. Let me point at this out back here. There is access to the subject property off of Haley Street back here and off Long Street right here. Um, and so that's how you access the property. And this is the design of the proposed development. The applicants are obviously going to have quite a bit to say about this, but I'm going to go through some basics. Um, the adjacent properties, I already pointed out what they are. The adjacent properties to the north are the Morgan and Park South development. The adjacent properties to the south are those that are on the north side of Murray Hill Road. There's detached single family residential over here and over here. Um, the zoning of the subject property, as I said, is good old RM1 straight out of the UDO. 
the access, as I talked about, comes from where it comes from. There was a TIA that was submitted. The applicants can speak to the TIA and the recommended improvements uh, in the TIA and the situation with that. I'll, I'll let them speak to that since this is a, an evidentiary hearing. Um, the sewer that the town has to provide to the subject property uh, was an interesting discussion topic because there are really two ways that sewer can be dealt with from the subject property. One is to take the sewer lines uh, that are in the vicinity and add to them and go south with the sewage. Uh, however, uh, part of the problem with that is that 149 units, we run into some, capac some capacity issues with the full 149 units going south. Uh, if it were to go south, there will be some off-premise system improvements, some capacity improvements. So the other option the developers have looked at and are looking at is tying into the sewer system that will be brought in to serve Morgan and Park South and go the other direction with this. Uh, so there's actually two ways they can go, two options they can go, and they'll probably talk about that as part of their uh, presentation. Now, once again, the product is kind of interesting, and there was a, just a few details that staff wants to point out about this product. Um, again, it's like multi, it, it is like multifamily, but it is detached single family, but it's a multifamily development. Um, there are design elements within this that are very important to staff for the sake of the character of the development. For example, the applicants are going to speak to putting landscaping in these little areas in front of the units. Uh, they will speak to the character of the development in, way, in many ways. They will speak to sidewalks that are actually behind the units uh, because there, some of these units are front loaded with garages. So they've put some sidewalks behind to make walkable areas. They've also proposed pedestrian connectivity to the adjacent property in order to get over to um, uh, the Morgan Park South development. You will notice that in a lot of ways, this development looks, some of the amenities, if you will, clubhouse, um, trash compactor, mail kiosk. It has a similar feel to what you may see in the past as multifamily developments. Uh, the applicants will speak to that. Uh, there is a fair bit of open space, uh, and I think that's part of their design. There are different types of units. I will not, I usually get up here and I, I say so much, and then Bob unfortunately just has to get up and say, well, BJ already spoke to this, BJ spoke to this. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to take his thunder. I'm going to let him do his thing and make his presentation. Um, this did go to the planning board for a preliminary form. I'll hasten to add that a preliminary form in front of the planning board, though specifically authorized by North Carolina general statute, that same statute is also clear that no part of the preliminary form may be relied upon uh, for a decision by the town council. Uh, they held their meeting on May 18th, 2022, and they did forward to the town council a list of issues to put on your radar. Uh, one of which was regarding the improvements to, recommending improvements to Short Street, uh, with an improved cross-section from the development, extended from the development to the intersection of Murray Hill to mitigate the impacts of increased traffic, also to meet the Town of Southern Pine standards, accommodating the number of vehicle trips per day, also to consider providing pedestrian connections with sidewalks to Murray Hill Road, uh, also regarding the issue of upgrading the existing downstream sewer system to accommodate the additional, the additional flow from the development, or provide the agreement from the adjacent commercial development showing they will redirect the sewer through their site. Uh, also confirm and obtain commitments from the developer on parking, street landscaping, and sidewalks, including those at the rear of the units as presented at the planning and zoning meeting of this date. That was because the, the applicant got up and spoke to a lot of things that really are only able to be verified at site plan, like landscaping commitments, character defining things that really aren't clear in the application materials. So I wanted to call that out as, as conditions and the applicant understands that and is, is comfortable with that. Uh, and we've had some discussion about that. Now again, this is a special use permit. Everybody's favorite product favorite. In, the, in the UDL. This is. Would you consider stating your name for us? Absolutely. <laughs> My name is BJ Grieve. I'm with the Town of Southern Pines Planning Department. And Nick, are you willing to assert that he is, are you willing to stipulate that he's an expert? Yes. Okay. In what? In planning. <laughs> All right. And, and, and assessing. All right. um, we have in front of you in your packet the criteria for a special use permit. Uh, these are the criteria. You guys are very familiar with them. There are six. You're going to be, look, you're going to be looking, listening, and, and honing in on those six criteria in the process because at the end you're going to be uh, asked to look at and adopt findings of fact 
uh, regarding uh, how this special, how this application and how this development uh, meets the criteria for a special use permit. Um, in addition to going to the planning board, I will say that the technical review committee looked at this project three times actually, which is pretty noteworthy. The reason we looked at it three times was because there was a lot of discussion to be had about this new type of development and how it might um, be brought in. Um, and also there was some discrepancy about originally whether they would be townhomes, therefore requiring subdivision and things like that. Okay, I think I'm coming around the horn here. Um, the planning staff does have three recommended conditions that we would like to put out there for your consideration. Um, Look at the fancy, Jennifer did those fancy transitions with the, that's oh, really nice. Like a stiff breeze blows through here and just blows the screen over. Um, what we have is these recommended conditions. These are, I will say this, I have drafted language, but I'm not really attached to it. I'm more attached to the concept in these conditions uh, because um, I will state that one of the issues staff has is when conditional use permits come through, developments come through, we have the application materials. We have what is ultimately the approved conditional use permit that becomes of record that we pull when they come in later with their site plan. Sometimes a lot of the discussion and commitments that occur between the applicant's packet and the actual conditional use permit get lost to history and they appear only in minutes. And so when we get to site plan or when people call as they frequently do, the developers call us as if we retain all knowledge of their own development and, and they say, well, what, could I do this, that, or the other thing? What was approved for that? I don't remember. And we say, oh my gosh, we pull the packet and we go, wait, wasn't there something about more landscaping and access to the adjacent property? And wasn't there something about, and they say, yeah, I thought there was too. Then we have to go back to the minutes. So what we, you're gonna see from staff moving forward is more frequently we will ask, that certain design considerations that are not clear in the application materials, not abundantly clear, or are the result of discussion that takes place and are the mitigation of concerns, we're going to ask to call those out in specific conditions in the CUP that gets recorded and everybody pulls up as the first document when you're thinking about the project. So in that particular case, in that, with, with that in mind, I'm, I'm, I'm putting forth three conceptual conditions that in this case I would like to read to illustrate my concept. Uh, number one, um, I'm asking that a condition be added that a phasing plan covering technical issues about what project infrastructure has to be completed prior to approval of certain building permits, what required parts of development must be complete prior to approval of certificates of occupancy, when the amenities have to be completed, and when short street improvements and asphalt lifts must be completed, shall be approved by the technical review committee prior to, and that should probably say along with, site plan approval. Um, here's why. When you deal with these things from the very beginning to the very end, what you begin to see is that they come in with this approval for 149 units. Uh, they get their site plan done and they never thought about phasing. We at, you know, this has come from history we've had with another project. They come in and they apply for probably not 149 building units to build 149 detached single family residential homes, but they rather maybe come in with a, a, a six pack or a 10 pack of, of building permits. And we say, okay, great, but where's all your infrastructure? And they say, well, we're only gonna build the road for those six to 10 units. And we say, well, wait a minute, what about the water and the sewer for the rest of it? When's that gonna get done? And then staff spends hours and hours debating this and going round and round about like, well, you gotta at least have the first water loop done. You gotta have at least the, the first, well, let's just put one lift of asphalt in there because we don't wanna tear up the second lift when we're doing construction. Okay, well, well, if that isn't resolved up front with some type of a phasing arrangement, it can be really annoying. And it's so technical, I wouldn't recommend we try to hash that all out right here tonight because it is very technical and we work as a technical review committee on this stuff. But I would ask that we get your support, the town council, to say, yeah, sort that out at site plan so you're not fighting about it with every single building permit and every single CO that comes in. We'd appreciate that direction, if you will, to make sure that does get done. That's number one. Uh, number two, I'm, a, I'm aware- Wait, pause. Okay, yeah. so what all do you, in the timeline, align in the phasing plan, and if, if we were to approve this, you want it to be a stipulation that that be referred back to the TRC, and you also want what issues addressed? You want all infrastructure issues addressed? Yeah, the things I listed there, which are, there's really four things, which are, right. um, 
water. What project infrastructure has to be completed prior to approval of certain of, of uh, certain building permits? So if they come in with their first 10 building permits and they you have to get access off a certain road to do that, presumably that road, but what else, you know, for the for the first? It's very much a phasing plan, um, but that phasing plan can't just be like Crayola markers in polygons around certain areas. It really should be tied to what can we legit practicably. Which, what is practicable? <coughs> Um, to to make sure that sewer water access infrastructure and whatnot are in in phases that will serve that development so that's and what why would it not be prudent to just make the infrastructure phase one that you had to have sewer water etc in place for the entire project <laughs> very common that that it, now I'm gonna let the developer answer that question I encourage you to ask them as I want well. you to answer that question too please what is my observation is that the I'll, I'll relate this to subdivisions and why subdivisions get phased um, putting in all of the sewer and water lines and all the roads for an entire subdivision mm -hmm. to then build six houses at a time actually winds up a lot of infrastructure sits there underutilized and underutilized infrastructure the same thing happens to that as an underutilized house without attention, without maintenance, without people caring about it and fixing it because they're driving on it and using it and flushing toilets that use it and turning on taps that use it, it shouldn't sit there unattended for long periods of time while you build houses on the other end of the development. You okay. should put it, you should tie the two together. You shouldn't get two, one too far ahead of the other, but that's a phasing plan. Sometimes in my professional experience it, uh, in the private side, um, for example, we would have developers that say they want a final plat one lot at a time. Why? Well, I don't know, it cost me a couple of bucks to have a surveyor go out and drop a final plat, but it cost me a fortune to put all the infrastructure in. So they'll do one final plat at a time, and that's kind of an extreme example to illustrate my point. Um, but you really don't want to have 149 units worth of infrastructure sitting there while you build six houses at a time. Does that, does that answer your question? That makes, that, that makes great sense. So if we're trying to be practical, which is another way to say practicable, if we're trying to different the two are different <laughs> yeah yeah we, we had this great conversation okay if we're trying to if we're trying to do that how do we as a council best assist you as staff how do we author what you're asking yeah, for? Well, something like the condition that i've drafted here in front of you which is basically directing four issues um you guys are saying we would like a phasing plan that covers what infrastructure has to be completed prior to approval of building permits, what required parts of development must be completed prior to approval of certificates of occupancy. For example, we're going to hear a lot about sidewalks and street trees and all that stuff. Nobody puts in sidewalks and street trees until the building is done because they don't want to crack it up. Now, you can do it, and I've had this argument with people, but mostly what they don't, they don't want to put in sidewalks and street trees and then have contractors uh, bang up the sidewalks and the street trees so they have to get replaced. So that's stuff that we like to sort out. I'll give you an example. Sometimes the example is the best illustration. At Eagle Landing, uh, when they were coming in with buildings, they say, well, our first building is up. We'd like our CO. And we go out there the first time and we said, well, you're not phased, so where's all your landscaping and all your roads and all your parking? And they said, are you out of your, are you out of your mind? We're not going to do all that. And say, well, I get that, but you didn't do any phasing. So technically, we need to see all of it. We came to an arrangement whereby for this building, you have to show that your lighting, your landscaping, your parking, your access, your fire access, et cetera, for this building are all done and good to go. But the line around that building came because some, became somewhat arbitrary of, do we have to do that landscaping or this landscaping before you'll sign our CO? So I know these are a lot of details, and I apologize for that, but this is, we're just asking to try to resolve this. I think it helps us help you, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm certainly on board with that. And then the other, there's two, so there's, that was what things have to be done before uh, building permits, like roads and sewer and water lines. What required parts of development have to be completed prior to approval of a CO, like those um, uh, trees, uh, lightings, uh, and, and final lifts of asphalt. And then when those amenities, when the amenities have to be completed, like the, um, the um, clubhouse, are they going to do the clubhouse? with the CO for the 149th unit? Are they gonna do it in the middle sometime? When's that gonna get done? And finally, when that short street improvement and the asphalt lifts have to be completed, uh, again, we're happy to work that out at TRC. The applicants so far have indicated that they are understanding of this condition and why staff is concerned about it, and so far in agreement that it's a good idea to have this hashed out. So I don't think this is gonna be a problem, um, but that language will get at that. What was number two? I had everything else. That's okay. It's it's, you. it's right up here, so it's, um, uh, what stuff has to be done before building permits? What required components have to be done prior to approval of a certificate of occupancy? 
the amenities that are committed right, to have yeah, to be done, okay, and then wind short street improvements and the final asphalt lifts have to be completed. Right. Um, what is the what punitive response does the town have if someone doesn't complete through a phase plan? Uh, we we stop we we. We stop reviewing and approving site plans. We hold up um, building permits and certificates of occupancy. If we have something they have to do before a certain time, it's not unprecedented at all for us to say, sorry, we're not signing off on that site plan until this is done. Sorry, we're not approving a building permit until such and such is in place. But the reason why staff is, key, is kind of tuned into this is because we're not dealing with a subdivision. And subdivision has platting requirements, final platting requirements that are replete in the UDO with details about procedure. But this is going to function a little like a subdivision, as you can imagine. And we want to make right. sure that it has so if, a similar... So if I wanted to build to rent, and I'm going to uh, presumably I would go in and be able to pick out which plot I wanted to build on. Like I want plot number 17. I'm not, I'm not at all uh, able to speak to the arrangement of how you would go in and, and okay. lease a unit. I would ask the applicants on that, yeah. Um, okay, the second recommended condition is that I'm aware the applicants are going to make some uh, presentations here tonight uh, to offer some details about uh, things they committed to, things they spoke at at the planning board that I asked for some details. They're going to speak to that here tonight. So I have a little placeholder condition number two here that the exhibits they enter into the record um, uh, be incorporated into the project design requirements. That way, that right there is a condition that somebody pulls this CUP goes, what's that? And goes <laughs> looking for it. And then uh, the last one, uh, thankfully for everyone in the audience who's sick of me standing here, in, audit, in accordance with UDO section 2.21.7 and general statute, um, after approval uh, and before commencement of construction, the applicant and the town engineer agree to work together in good faith to determine a reasonable and practical improvements to Short Street that they be made by the applicant and schedule for the same. That is something that is the result of a lot of back and forth about the current state of Long Street and Short Street and the impacts that this development will have on those two roads. So I will most likely, after the applicants speak, if we get into that condition a little bit more, um, the applicants worked with our town engineer to come up with that language. So he may jump in about um, where we're at on that issue. What exhibit is this presentation going to be? If I can incorporate by reference instead yeah, of no, verb by, verbatim no, I that. think the applicant's presentation is most likely to be Exhibit C because my staff report packet is Exhibit A. My PowerPoint with the, with the fancy slides, yeah. the, the, that, that fancy PowerPoint will be Exhibit B. The applicant's presentation will be Exhibit C, and I anticipate that the yeah. applicant, Mr. Bob Kuntz, will present those, um, those details. Um, but that's why I threw in there as XX. X. Okay, and in your status as an expert, you know, to the fact that this is currently zoned RM1, correct? Yes, ma'am. And pursuant to that, um, there would be an entitlement to, and, and how, how large is the acreage in this 17. proposed? The subject property is 17.04 acres. Okay. And that and zoning, if you do the math on it, the way those dwelling units break down, the math is a little funky because you give a certain density for the first unit, then you calculate after that, it would be 203 units, again, mathematically. So 203 units would be allowed pursuant to the current UDO. RM1, yes. RM1, okay. Thank you. That's the pursuant to the current zoning. And I think someone walked in, so I need to swear the mystery person in. If, if you will raise your right hand and respond to the following. State your name. Do you solemnly swear that evidence you shall give to the board in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm done with my presentation. Thank you for your patience. And is there anything else I can do for you guys, answer any questions, et cetera? Anybody else have any questions for BJ? All right, thank you. Okay. Come on up. BJ? Not as tall as him. <laughs> no one is. <laughs> Good evening. Um, Nick Robinson here from Bradshaw Robinson Slaughter in Pittsburgh, um, 128 Hillsborough Street. Uh, and uh, BJ did a great presentation there. And I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to be here tonight on behalf of the applicant. Um, and um, one thing I wanted to do, a little bit of, of housekeeping, and I'll, I'll leave it to you. It's entirely up to you, but in the interest of time, um, I've got uh, four witnesses tonight that are expert witnesses, Bob Kuntz, Travis Fluitt, uh, Kyle Winters, and Aaron Katz. Katz. 
And um, the first three of those have um, previously been qualified as experts before you. Um, I'm more than happy with each of them to walk through their qualification of their expertise, unless the board would just accept those three already as experts. And the reason why I'm doing that is I didn't see anybody else in the room that was um, right. uh, sworn in I would in love to for you to stipulate what their experts and thank you, yeah, yeah. So, if you don't mind. Yeah, not, not a bit. So uh, Bob Kuntz would be um, qualified as an expert in land planning and site plan design. Thank you. And um, Travis Fluitt, of course, would be uh, qualified as an expert in traffic engineering. Thank you. And Kyle Winters would be qualified as an expert in the field of property valuation. Um, and then when Aaron comes up, I'll qualify him, but he will be tendered as an expert in the field of uh, public engineering. Okay, great, thank you. So if that's okay, then I would tender those first three witnesses as experts to the board. Acceptable, thank you. Um, so um, I'm, I'm here tonight on behalf of the applicant in this matter, Craig Davis Properties. Um, and Greg Johnzik, who is with the applicant, is here. You can just wave. Welcome. Um, and as a, um, you know, a general introductory matter, the stage can be set this way. Um, we are here tonight, as BJ said, requesting a special use permit. Um, and uh, this is for a project that we call Murray Hill Pines. And um, multifamily development, not multifamily dwellings, but multifamily development is already allowed under the UDO in this RM1 zoning district applicable to this property. And um, so, in other words, we're not asking for a rezoning. This is similar to where we were uh, last time. We're really just asking to put in the evidence in the record to support the uh, six findings that are required for a special use permit. Um, I already mentioned who our expert witnesses would be. Um, and I do want to go ahead and um, I agree with the uh, submission of Exhibit A being the application, Exhibit B being the staff report. Um, and, um, no. or is it reversed? Exhibit A is the entire package, which is the staff report plus all the application materials that were submitted, everything that went to the town council, and then Exhibit B is my PowerPoint that I just Okay, so it's the, okay, you put the application and the staff report together. Okay. But that's Exhibit A. All right, good. And Exhibit B is a staff PowerPoint presentation. Okay, good. So I will take it from there. Um, all right. Um, uh, you know, I usually say at the beginning here, and I'll do it briefly because I know you're all now savvy um, experts in the um, <laughs> in the uh, uh, proceedings of a quasi-judicial hearing, but um, it's an informal quasi-judicial hearing. Um, I usually like to lodge at the beginning um, so that I don't have to interrupt everybody all night long. Uh, uh, and a generalized objection with regard to any incompetent, immaterial, or insubstantial evidence or any evidence that's delivered by others that uh, lacks in standing. Um, and so I just go ahead and put that into the record. Um, so uh, we have our, our six findings under UDO section um, uh, 2.14.6A uh, uh, through F uh, that we need to get into the record. And um, unless there's any questions or concerns at this point, I would go ahead and start with our witnesses. You can start with witnesses. Mr. Bob Kuntz to the stand as an expert in uh, land planning and site design. All right, so we'll skip through this part. Um, uh, we're going to go down to, to probably to um, nine. So, uh, Mr. Kuntz, is it correct to say that this application is for a special use permit to allow a multifamily single lot development on the property required under Section 2.21 of the Southern Pines UDO? Yes, it is. And then could you just describe in general terms um, uh, the history of your experience with this project? Uh, we were originally uh, approached uh, to look at um, concepts for the site um, and feasibility of the site. Um, and then uh, working with the, the development team, uh, a site-specific development plan was created. Um, after it was determined that development program could be accommodated on the property, uh, and the property was appropriately zoned. Uh, we prepared applications for submission to the town. Uh, prior to submission of the application, uh, we met with town staff uh, on multiple occasions, uh, looking through the pre-application um, and um, reviewed the proposed development and made adjustments based on their recommendations. 
Great. And did you assist in the preparation of the SUP application that's filed in this matter on or about April 12th, 2022? Yes, I did. Are you familiar with the entirety of the application? Yes, I am. So the application was reviewed by staff and deemed complete on April 25th, 2022. Is that correct? That is correct. Are you uh, familiar with the proposed site um, and its location in Southern Pines? Uh, yes, I have ridden around the property, the existing property. Uh, I've walked the site. I've re reviewed all the survey data and site documents and uh, maps related to the property. Okay, thanks. Um, have you made yourself familiar with the Southern Pines UDO, particularly the requirements um, of a valid SUP application under uh, Section 2.21? Yes, I have. Okay. Did you review the SUP criteria before preparing the site plan for this project? Uh, yes, I did. And um, can you take some time now uh, to walk the council through the plan and summarize its features? And I'll just go ahead and um, now, before I forget, uh, Mr. Kuntz is going to walk through his PowerPoint project, which I'd like to ad have admitted as Exhibit C. Accepted. If you would take the mic, Bob. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Um, as BJ mentioned uh, in his presentation, this is a very unique project, the build to rent property. Uh, in what I'd like to do is, is just walk through the plan and walk through uh, what it allows. There's a lot of open space connected to the plan, uh, and this, this um, type of unit allows for a lot of flexibility in the site design. Um, so it really is an, an interesting product, and it's actually the first one I've worked on as well. Um, however, it, it is uh, something that, that I feel very good about it, um, and, and like the concept a lot. So <clears throat> um, looking at the site context, uh, for the future, um, BJ mentioned uh, coming off of Short Street back to Long Street, and the project sits here, the former mobile home park. Uh, there's already a lot of infrastructure in, as you can see from this plan. There, there are water lines and sewer lines on the property to date, uh, and there are some existing roadways, even though they're in, in pretty, pretty bad condition, uh, as are, is Long Street and uh, Long Street in particular. Um, <clears throat> The project site, as BJ mentioned, is RM1. It's currently zoned for residential single family and multifamily. The site acreage is 17.04 acres, um, which does allow uh, 10 to 12 dwelling units per acre and would allow up to 203 residential uh, dwelling units. The property, as proposed, is 149 multifamily detached residential units. Again, that, it's a little bit different product, and we'll walk through that uh, as we move through the presentation. Um, it is a total of 8.74 dwelling units per acre, which is well below uh, their permitted number of units, and it's roughly a 25% reduction in the overall number of units uh, that are permitted on the property. Uh, maximum building height in the RM1 district is 40 feet. Um, again, this property is outside of the high quality watershed district, uh, and uh, it permits up to 70%. This project is uh, proposed that are somewhere around 55.2% uh, plus or minus. Um, <clears throat> no wetlands or endangered species are part of this um, uh, property either, and we do have a report from Dr. Jay Carter uh, stating such um, related to the project. <clears throat> so looking at the uh, existing I'm going to object to that every time you do that. I think if you're going to, you can't put in a letter without giving us a chance. If you're going to consider Dr. Carter to be an expert in regard to environment, you cannot put in a letter and not allow us to cross-examine the person who you're asserting is an expert. He's, he's very well respected in his field. I understand he's well respected. I'd also understand that it's my responsibility to question him. I mean, we can't do that. I mean, you understand, Nick, what I'm saying. You can't come in and tell me in a courtroom that there's, here's a letter from an expert. Yeah, we've, we have his letter included in our application, which has, been, which has been admitted as evidence in the record, and that's all we all right. are and, generating. And, and we are also allowed to not identify him as an expert because he's not here for us to cross-examine. Bring him as an expert. His letter is in the record for okay. as part of the application. Clear because that keeps happening, and if we're gonna if we're gonna make those assertions, 
then we need to bring the person in for us to be able to ask the questions. Uh, yeah, in, in addition, the, the letter is also, oh gosh, what did I do? Um, the letter is also approved by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So we were also not here for me to question. We would, not sure what it would take to get the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here. Probably be easier to go with Dr. Carter. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> PJ, could you, could you get me back? So, um, again, no wetlands or endangered species have been located on the site per Dr. Carter. Um, <laughs> Objection. <laughs> so looking at the existing site, uh, this plan actually shows the roadways uh, coming around and connecting. Uh, you can see some of the mobile homes that were still on the property um, at the date of the survey. Uh, most of them, I think there may still be one or two uh, remaining on the property. Um, this is Long Street, which does connect to Short Street, and then a connection back to Haley Street and Richards at this intersection. I have some site photos here as well. So this is looking at Richards Street, looking at the property, and you can see one of the mobile homes that's still on the property, and that's where that access would be. Uh, that access would be being located here. Uh, the second set is, is the opposite street uh, on Haley Street, where this comes in and looks back at the existing entrance into uh, the mobile home park. This is a look at the entry drive coming in from Richards and Haley. You can see the general condition of the site. Um, a lot of scrub oaks, a lot of uh, different types of understory plants, um, and a lot of understory planting around. Again, looking at Ridgeway Drive or Ridgewood Drive and the condition of the roadways. Um, again, more images uh, of, of Ridgewood Drive. And then this, this actually looks back toward Long Street. Uh, so this, this photograph is taken at this existing entry looking back onto Long Street. And the improvements to those roads are the applicant's responsibility. That is correct, yes. Just want to clarify that one. Yeah, that is correct. That also include curbs and gutters? Um, that is still being decided and working with the town staff. Um, about what condition is most appropriate for this because of drainage issues and other things that are associated with the property. So, and sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I think the question may have been more about the interior roads in the project, right? And we'll, we'll get to the roads that lead into the project, but on the interior. All, all, all of those long, short. Long and short? Yeah. The long and short of it, ha ha. Um, <laughs> yes. Was that not your question? Was long and short? What was all the roads? So make a distinction between Yes. Right. So, so all, and the question was, are all the roads the responsibility of the applicant? Yes, they are. Okay. And my question again that I reiterate is, is it your intent to put in curbs and gutters? He just said development? it depends on the... I know. I know what he said. I want him on the record. Throughout the interior of the development, yes, that will all be curb and gutter throughout the interior of the parcel. Um, what happens on long and short is still to be determined based on the available right-of-way. So um, back again, looking, this is Long Street, looking toward Short Street with the Keller Williams building on the left-hand side. Uh, existing Long Street, you can see the, the condition of that street. Um, and then uh, looking at the future entry uh, location, uh, because it does go back further than the current location. Um, you can also see fencing um, that is along the adjacent property boundaries. Uh, and this is some fencing that is along uh, the multifamily uh, development that's across the way toward Murray Hill Pines, or I'm sorry, Murray Hill Road. Um, and um, this, this will be important. We'll, we'll talk about the fencing uh, a little bit later and some information we found uh, out during the neighborhood meeting, so. And the entry onto Murray Hill from Long and Short, I guess it's, is it Long that enters onto Murray Hill? Is that right? It's Short, sorry. So there is, is there a stop sign there? Uh, yes, there is a stop sign there today. As far as traffic regulation, is there a no left turn notice there or can you turn left? You can turn left, motion intersection. Okay. Uh, and there is a TIA that has been prepared and, you know, and, and, and Travis. Right. Murray Hill, right. Okay. I can't wait to hear about that. Okay. 
So looking at the site plan and looking at the overall plan, as, as BJ, we've talked about, is the build to rent concept is, um, I think BJ's term was detail, well, what was the term? Multifamily, apartments. horizontal apartments, that, that was it. Actually, my term was uh, rent to own. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> so horizontal apartments. So, so instead of, um, like some other projects we've reviewed recently, uh, instead of having <coughs> one three-story building, um, these these are individual units that are, are placed along the areas. So these these units would be um, developed sort of in clusters, and when you decide to rent one, you go to the clubhouse, you get a leasing office, and you would go see one of the units just like you would in a typical apartment community, and they would have availability in some of the units that are already there. Um, and then, yeah, you would lease that just like you would in an apartment in an apartment community or something along that line. So there are three different types of units that are included in the plan. Uh, you see these units, the, the red, uh, red units that are here. Uh, those units are uh, more of a single family detached multifamily style with surface parking. So you see the surface parking in front of those units. Uh, the units across the back side, uh, the northern portion of the property are, are all garage loaded units. So each of those units has an individual garage. Uh, and a driveway in the front that uh, will allow for parking of vehicles within that area. Um, and then you see some attached units, um, duplex type units and duplex style. Uh, each of those units would be surface parked. One of the interesting aspects of this plan are the continual loops around and uh, creating these open space areas throughout the plan. So you see lots of open space, lots of pedestrian connections, and really making this a very walkable community. All the open spaces are interconnected with sidewalks. There's a playground area, uh, just open, open landscape area, uh, and then the clubhouse sitting uh, at this location. Those sidewalks will continue, and they will continue down Long Street and out to Murray Hill to connect the overall Murray Hill um, sidewalk path and pedestrian path. It's one of the things we worked on with staff uh, during the process and think it's a good suggestion. We've also included a pedestrian connection that will connect back to uh, the shopping center, the future shopping center, and back into that development. So people can walk from this neighborhood directly uh, into the amenity areas. Is that, just real quickly, because you, you know that project very well as well. That's not kicking somebody into the dumpsters and the behind the loading dock of the target is it this actually comes in right in between the split in the building okay so i figured you'd right have it nicely yeah. laid out okay yeah yeah no we didn't and it, it's it's also a, a location where there's not a, a retaining wall behind it either so it's it's relatively flat at grade and it, where it hit just happened to come in directly at that location it was uh like somebody knew what they were doing but um <laughs> but, but but anyhow it, we got, actually got lucky on that but um, so, so looking at, at this and, and looking at the sidewalk connections um, coming all the way through the development, you can see if you're, if you're living in this unit, you can connect to the sidewalks and come all the way over to the clubhouse, the mail kiosk, et cetera, um, to get your mail. You can also connect out. Um, as BJ mentioned, one of the unique aspects are the sidewalks behind these units and behind the units allowing direct access out to those uh, open spaces and then also uh, across to the adjacent property. <clears throat> so this is a look at the overall open space for the project and a more technical drawing. So you can see those open space areas, they really pop out in this plan. You can, you can really start to see them uh, very clearly where they are. In addition, um, there is existing fence that wraps along here and, and comes to this point. During our neighborhood meeting, um, so a couple of the residents on this side of the property um, discussed that, that as the mobile home park, et cetera, people would come around that end of the fence and they would walk through their yards and walking across that area. They requested that a fence be extended and connected back to Haley Street and back to that entrance. So that's part of the condition of, of this project as well, to go ahead and continue that fence back to, to Haley Street. Good. to address the neighbor's concerns. It's a fence made of... What's it's a chain link fence. And we would just maintain that existing chain link fence as we saw in the photographs earlier. <clears throat> so there were some questions related, and I think the condition talks through 
uh, the agreement of the shopping center and the owner to connecting the sewer. Um, so that sewer, there is an agreement in place that this development would be permitted uh, to connect to the sewer that's being constructed as part of the target shopping center. Midland Atlantic has granted an easement across their property that would tie into their improvements that they're making uh, downstream and for their property as well. So uh, initially there is sewer on this property now. However, uh, the lines going out really aren't, they're, they're not capable of handling the overall sewer. So this makes the connection and <clears throat> would connect back out to something that will be plenty big for, for, um, for this project. <clears throat> Again, we are asking for a parking reduction uh, for open space, uh, to, to add open space and landscape areas. Uh, this project actually parks at a really high rate based on the town of Southern Pine standards because of the, the, the mix in units. There are only 16 one-bedroom units here. So looking at that, there would be 312 parking spaces required at over two, two parking spaces per dwelling unit. So that's, that's significant. <coughs> um, provided parking, we're proposing 76 garage spaces in those units uh, that are garage fronted. Uh, along the backside, and then 187 on-street parking spaces uh, for a total of 263 and at 1.77 spaces per unit. This is a little different product. There aren't as many one-bedrooms, so raising that ratio makes a lot of sense here and should be right-sized. <clears throat> open space, required open space is 1.7 acres. The total open space provided in this plan is 18.2%. And the total usable, usable open space, which is included in the, the parks and the, the courtyards and things like that, is a little over 15.3%. So easily meets the standards of the UDO. Um, these are, are the conceptual architecture for the project and looking at, at these units. So uh, again, it's a very cottage style, sort of um, very Southern Pines looking uh, type of a product. Um, and again, with that uh, being apartments that are spread out over the area, each one of these has its own individual character. So um, you, you would have a two-story unit, um, detached multifamily, and a three-story unit with a garage coming in in the front. And then this is a duplex unit with a front porch and uh, a front porch area and access coming out the side on those units, individual units. So. Um, again, just a much more single family, traditional neighborhood type of a design. And this is an illustration of what that would look like. Um, so you see the front porches, the sidewalks, really creating that traditional neighborhood feel. So the residents can sit on their porches and talk to their neighbors and really building community here throughout. Uh, this plan also illustrates some large planting areas in the front. Uh, and that's that reduction in parking that we're asking for um, to create these larger planting islands, larger planting beds throughout. So really creating a, a really nice feel throughout. Um, in the planning board meeting is one of their conditions. They asked, uh, and BJ asked as well, uh, to put some meat on that, to commit to that landscaping rather than just following their traditional multifamily uh, landscaping standards. So we've done that and added conditions related to that. I have some diagrams that explain these uh, uh, items, but really it, it takes that rendering and makes it real. So. Some slides so Evie can get her picture she wanted. <laughs> must require people to okay. okay. Question. The, basically what's happening is that the required parking based upon the UDO is diminished in order to give increased green space and open space. So that's another one of those flexible deviation type things that where on one side uh, it would be a request for reduction, but on the other side it's an increase in that's correct. Okay. That, that's right. It allows us a lot more planting area throughout the development. Okay. So, so where do we put the cars? Um, in, in the parking spaces that are created and, and part of it. And based on other projects, we feel that the ratio that we're requesting is, is adequate based on, based on what's, what's, what's there. 
Um, it's, it's always important in a multifamily development to make sure you have enough parking. <laughs> I agree. It's critical. Uh, and based on their experience in, in other communities like this, they feel that that, that 1.77 should, should definitely accommodate what's necessary for the parking uh, for the neighborhood. If, if you have a deficiency in parking in multifamily, uh, there can be fights. It, it gets kind of ugly. You have to assign parking spaces. And, yeah, and I, I live in one of those. We, we've seen that in the past. Pause for one second. Can you just help me with the major confusion I'm having, right? This is RM1, and, it's, and, and pursuant to the UDO, it would accommodate 203 units, correct? And, and as I understand it, and I'm a little bit confused, as I understand it, there are two different proposals one that's for 160 units and another one that's, I mean, I mean 260 units and another one that's for 269. That's, that's, that's the other thing. That's the other thing. So that was just blowing my mind. Okay. This is 140. So I am so much less confused now. Thank you all. Yeah. Instead of being 203, it's, it's, oh, it's 140. Wow. Bizarre that it's exactly the same number. <laughs> okay, I'm on board now. Thanks. Turn the page. Yeah. <laughs> No, to, it, yeah. This okay. is this is roughly a twenty five percent reduction request it's, from what's it's actually my fault. permitted. No, thank you. Okay, good. I'm glad I asked the question. Yes. You can you can it's see the similar to village in the woods. Yeah. It is. Except it is. It, the roads are gonna be a whole lot better. Um, since I live there, I can tell you. And so it's that same same feel. So when I first saw this I thought, because that's exactly what it is that these there's some individual and there's duplexes um, and then right. you can of course this is much much smaller than this but still it's it has that same um, it, right? cottage feel to it right. and that's the goal yeah. and, we got it. Yeah. And that's that's rather than three-story buildings or something like that it's yeah, okay. detach yeah <laughs> <laughs> most definitely most definitely you can see the curb and gutter and you can see those other things so so um, so again, this puts the meat on the bone for the landscape requirements uh, that, that the planning board and, and staff requested. Um, buildings being five feet, a minimum of five foot setbacks from the, from the sidewalks. Uh, and again, we want those close because we want to be able to folks to sit on their front porches and have their neighbors there. Uh, you see it in downtown Southern Pines all over the place. Um, and then area between the buildings and the sidewalk planted with shrubs for five feet. Buildings with front-loaded garages have a minimum 20-foot setback. Uh, and then sidewalks, uh, at least one side of each structure. Uh, buildings with um, sidewalks will be five feet, which is town standard. Uh, sidewalks will be connected uh, through internal and external circulation paths to really create that walkable community. Um, buildings front-loaded garages with sidewalks, they would have rear sidewalks for the buildings. And then landscaping, <coughs> uh, large parking la landscape islands over 500 square feet. And the way the UDO uh, works through um, parking island ratios, there's a minimum of 200 square feet uh, for a tree planting island. So if you're in a shopping center, if you're in a multifamily development, whatever it is, there's a minimum size that those parking islands can be. So it, it helps break up the parking islands and parking areas. That allows for one tree. So uh, we're stating that over 500 square feet, there will be two trees in each island. So. Uh, adding additional trees in those islands. So it continues to break that up. There are some interior landscape island requirements, or uh, not island requirements, but planting and coverage requirements that this will still have to meet based on the multifamily. But this starts to put in some definition and language stating this specific design and how it will be carried out. <clears throat> so landscape islands under 500 square feet will be one tree and minimum of four shrubs. Um, and I forgot the shrubs on the other, but um, that's also something that's a standard for Southern Pines. If you drop around Southern Pines pretty much anywhere, every tree planting island has shrubs in it as well, and it's just part of the, the uh, information or in, part of the requirements in Southern Pines. Um, a building landscape, a minimum of eight shrubs per structure, uh, and then uh, along that frontage, and then planting areas along unloaded would have street trees one for every 400 linear feet. And rather than regimented street trees, and I've, I ask for this a lot, but being able to break that up um, so it looks more natural and it's more native. If I could stop you real quick. I was going to incorporate by reference your exhibit because it was impossible to write down those three things verbatim. This is even more. 
if I incorporate Exhibit C into an incorporated Exhibit B, asking you to find an appropriate slide that speaks to what you asked for, is that just asking too much for you to do? No, or does that right. motion give you enough teeth to make it? Oh, okay. We, when something is in a condition, pull out a condition use permit, one to 20 years from now, yeah. if it says, pursuant to Exhibit B, this condition shall be removed, you go look at that. Okay. So it's, it's a hook. It's a good hook. All right. What, what the worst case scenario is just we, this. We, I actually printed those out tonight and brought those that can be added as an exhibit as well. Yeah, as a separate, it just said a separate exhibit is fine. Good. Okay. It, it all achieves the purpose. I appreciate you taking that. Uh -huh. I just didn't want to have to write all that down yeah, and repeat it verbatim. Because we're you. both scurrying to write all this stuff <laughs> down. And it. Yeah, I have to go ahead and move to admit the, that slide as a separate exhibit that I have here in my hand. It would be exhibit D. So uh, we did provide some diagrams that are also included there as well to sort of show what that looks like. And again, it's, it's really getting back to that rendering and, and making sure that, that it ends up looking like this. Um, mm -hmm. That's the goal. Um, now granted, day one, it won't exactly look like that. Shrubs go in small, but they grow. Um, so looking at that, uh, and these are really illustrations of the text that we just looked at. So you've got the, the parking areas, the larger islands with two trees, uh, the planting areas in front, the sidewalk, the relationship to the street, uh, and the parking areas, and then the sidewalks in the rear, and, and the landscaping associated with it. These are the garage units, so you can see the, the 20 feet, the setback, and then the sidewalk coming across the front and the planting areas. And then the duplex units, which actually have a side door uh, that connects back out toward uh, the, the park areas. So um, with that, um, happy to answer any additional questions you have related to the project. It, it appeared to me, and BJ or whoever, correct me, that the voice concerns as far as short street improvements, no. um, sewer issue, and the sidewalks were all addressed. And mm -hmm. I, I thought you had addressed them in the sense you were going to do them. And they may get worked into the minutia of the site plan when and if and how but uh, that it was addressed at least i heard that is that correct okay sir water is do you want to speak to the conditions aj presented yeah so the the conditions that um, bj put up are perfectly acceptable to us and i think the 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 second condition that has reference to X, X, and X, the, the, the exhibit that I just gave you, exhibit D, would be one of those, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that's, that's perfectly fine to us. Um, and I can get, we can get to this a little bit, um, but we, uh, we have worked um, pretty uh, closely and over the last few days with Mr. Mickel um, on the issue about the uh, potential improvements to uh, Short Street. Um, and that's just going to require a little bit more information over the uh, over the course of time. And so we did uh, the language that um, that BJ put up on the screen as the third condition is the language that we we vetted between ourselves and, and agreed would be an acceptable condition to address dealing with the improvements to Short Street, if that makes sense. Okay. And um, if I think if Mr. Mickle can just confirm that on the record, uh, then I think we're good. Yes, that's an accurate representation. We went back and forth, and the language that BJ had in there is basically a cut and paste from the email exchange that we had. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we're, we're, we're back to it. Any, any more questions for Bob before we get into the uh, – I'm going to walk through the uh, findings with him. Okay. Um, so we're going to um, go to 19. Yeah. Um, yeah, so section 2.21.7A uh, through F is the one that sets forth the six criteria for SUP. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And to the best of your knowledge, does the SUP application, this SUP application, meet all of the requirements of the UDO for an SUP? Yes, it does. Let's start with criteria A, which uh, whether or not the SUP apply, uh, complies with the district regulations. Um, it is the um, does this SUP comply with the district regulations? Yes, it does. Um, 
Let's see. I think some of these we are, we already covered 22 and 23, so we don't have to go over those. Um, is it RM1 zoning and all that? Um, is it your? I'm on 24. Is it your understanding that the uh, town staff has reviewed this first finding and, and agrees with the, uh, the applicable zoning regulations are met by this application? Yes, it is. And based on your knowledge and expertise and experience, in your expert opinion, does the project satisfy criteria A for a special use permit with, with the conditions that we've agreed to? It does. Okay. Criteria B, uh, does it conform to the character of the neighborhood and uh, not injure the use and enjoyment? Uh, do you have, um, have you reviewed that question? Yes, I have. Okay. Um, just start with a description of the neighborhood that surrounds Murray Hill Pines. That might be useful. Yeah, I, I, I believe this is the case. And, and the previous use was a mobile home park. Um, and the, the surrounding neighborhood uh, on one side is a single family detached neighborhood. And the other side will be a large shopping center uh, on the other side. Uh, the proposed multifamily development will have the character and appearance of the single family detached neighborhood um, and fit better in its surroundings than the previous development. Um, the property is surrounded by single family. Well, um, the development, uh, this development does provide a transition from the shopping center to the existing single family neighborhood as well. Um, and, and with the reduction in units to 149 from 203, uh, I feel that this really does fit the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, in designing Murray Hill Pines, did you take care to make sure that it um, conforms to the character of the neighborhood that it's in? Yes, we did. And would you say that the use is in conformity with the character of the nearby neighborhood? Yes, I would. Um, so based on your knowledge, expertise, experience, and your expert opinion, does the project satisfy criteria B? Yes, it does. All right, uh, criteria C is adequate public facilities. And the staff has, um, has uh, made it known that, um, that the um, condition of Short Street needs improvement. Um, and that it's not adequate at this point. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, I do. And, um, and that was the basis of the condition um, that has been reached by agreement with the, uh, with the town to address the improvements to Short Street. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Um, and then if you assume for the sake of this question that those improvements will be made in accordance with the condition, um, can you talk to the council about whether or not there are otherwise adequate uh, facilities for this project, public facilities for the project? Yes, uh, there, there are adequate facilities, uh, the water lines, again, water and sewer was already within the property boundaries, um, and those are adequate with the agreement with Midland Atlantic to take the sewer uh, with the easement across their property. Uh, sewer can be addressed uh, in an adequate fashion, uh, and then the short street and long street designs will be uh, And you, <clears throat> you will have that in writing from Mid-Atlantic, correct? Yes. The easement yes. signed yes. agreement. It is not a signed agreement. But it will be. But it will be. Right. That was, yeah, okay. And also, <clears throat> will the infrastructure be phased, as Mr. Grieve mentioned? Uh, yes, yes. Agree, very agreeable to that. And I think the uh, applicant thinks that's a really good idea, too. So when they're having someone ready to move in and need a CO, that there's a clear understanding on everybody's part of what needs to occur and what needs to happen. So, so, so we have to during the TRC process. Plan. Yeah, and, and to your question, Mr. Murphy, I think the suggestion from the staff that we work out that phasing schedule at the front end really is a good one, mm -hmm. and, it, and I think it will address your concern there directly. Thank you. Um, so um, that's criteria C. Um, to your knowledge, do you think that? Question. Sorry, yes. when you when you ask questions of Mr. Kuntz for the record, you ask about improvements to Short Street. You uh, did, failed to mention Long Street. Did you mean to do that? No, I didn't. That's good. Um, will there need to be any improvements to Long Street, and who's going to make them? Yes, there will be uh, in, in, in modifications that are required of Long Street and improvements, and those will be taken care of and paid for by the developer. Um, thank you for that uh, clarification question. Um, so the best and of your knowledge. Are you, is, is a developer, are you willing to assert that improvements to both Long and Short, Short Street would also include curbs and gutters at this point? No, we're not. Okay. Um, 
And so that covers water, that covers sewer, that covers... Um, it doesn't cover water as far as runoff if we're not including curbs and gutters. We've got a, we've got a runoff issue. Well, sure. yeah, go ahead. Actually, it does, um, because the water has to be controlled, and curb and gutter is not the only method that you can control stormwater management and runoff. So there are, there are other methods uh, which we will be exploring as we... Well, no, exploring is not going to cut it. It's got, we got to, we got to know that's going to be handled. It's going to be handled through coordination and, and work with staff based on the condition that was part and of the application. Is the radio station still down in that area? So. Down the hill where we're going to have a runoff into the radio station? It goes the other way. Goes the other direction. <laughs> so. yeah, it does. And of course, the, the applicable state uh, stormwater requirements will uh, be enforced, right? And so right, and I, I noted that verbiage in your assertions here, but it's incredibly vague. Yeah. It's a little bit like, you know, we're going to plant as many trees as we need to kind of a thing. So I'm not feeling good about that. I'm, I'm not, not talking. I'm not sure the, what does the tree planting have to do with this? Oh, the tree story? planting had not much. It just was a, a previous vague. Um, okay. Yeah, so they're going to be obligated to comply with state law with respect to um, Treat, uh, retaining and treating stormwater such that um, the pre and post development uh, stormwater flow uh, meets whatever the applicable state standard is. And they'll know that as soon as they do the design and engineering. Right. And one of my concerns with that is that the legislature has made that very easy for us to all be neglectful. So I would really like as far as Southern Pines goes and what's best for our town, I would like to know that we are going to have curbs and gutters and um, I'm going to keep harping on this. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, you know, you testified about curb and gutter within the interior of the development. You did testify yeah. about that and I appreciated that. And obviously you therefore recognize the importance of curbs and gutters, just saying. But there's, um, there's myriad circumstances with regard to the existing streets. So there's a big difference between making a commitment to build brand new streets I understand. and put curb and gutter in. I totally and, understand that. And you understand, I'm sure, my concern about yeah, the yeah. town. And, and so, you know, um, stormwater gets dealt with in the town in at least two ways that I can tell you. One is curb and gutter and the other is the ditch and swale section, which um, Short Street already has. And so the, the question for Mr. Mickle and for um, the engineers on this project um, will be to sort through the best um, arrangement of stormwater uh, um, collection along Short Street in light of the fact that there's already a street there. And, yeah, I'm yeah. really not interested in the town having a lot of expense as a result of this is my pro as far as infrastructure goes. I mean, you're talking about increased traffic Right. Through your own TIA, you're talking increased traffic, you're talking increased use of the roads, and you and I both know that roads hold up better if they are reinforced with curbs and gutters. I, I don't know that's necessarily a fact. Um, okay. And we have a civil engineering um, uh, person here this evening as part of the team, but there are lots of reasons not to use curb and gutter in circumstances. Uh, there are lots of reasons to do that, and we just haven't had the ability to work through with staff at this point, and we are conditioning the, that we would work through with staff during that process to determine what is best for this particular site. Curb and gutter is site-specific. It's not always about having a, a general standard. It's about what's best for that particular site in that particular condition. Um, so um, with regard to the public facilities that we've been talking about. Do you have an opinion about whether this project, when you include the conditions related to the public facilities, um, would meet that um, requirement of having adequate public facilities? Uh, yes, it would. Okay. So that's your opinion? <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Uh, criteria D, uh, not impede the orderly development of surrounding properties, nor substantially diminish or impair property values. I've, we have a, an appraiser on the property values, but on the, um, the first part, uh, is there anything about Murray Hill Pines that would prevent or impede the orderly development of surrounding undeveloped properties nearby for their allowed uses? No, there isn't. Okay. Based on your knowledge, experience, and uh, expertise, um, in your expert opinion, does the project satisfy the orderly development component of Criteria D? Yes, it does. 
Uh, criteria E is health, safety, comfort, and general welfare. This will also be addressed by our traffic consultant and civil engineer, but have you um, ever been involved in, um, in land planning for other uh, multifamily <coughs> type projects? Yes, I have. And have, have any of those projects been in Southern Pines? Yes, they have. And based on your experience and the subsequent development of such projects, are you aware of any diminishment in public health, safety, comfort, or welfare caused by those projects? No, I'm not. Okay. Based on your knowledge, um, experience, uh, expertise, and in your expert opinion, does the project satisfy criteria E for special use permits? Yes, it does. Okay, if we're on the last one, criteria F, of uh, just meeting the public interest and welfare and that outweighing injury to individual interests. Have you examined that criteria as well? Yes, I have. Um, and what would you offer to the council with respect to that? Um, you know, the, the CLRP counts as one of its goals to provide a diversity of housing types throughout the community. Um, and I, I believe that should be encouraged, in my opinion. Uh, if the town turns down multifamily projects uh, where they're encouraged by the CLRP and an allowed use under the UDO, uh, the town will never meet its goal of diversifying housing sufficiently to meet public interest and welfare. Uh, the project provides an opportunity to provide a housing choice that does not currently exist in the market, a multifamily development with the character of a single-family detached neighborhood with several amenities for its residents adjacent to a commercial shopping center is unique to Southern Pines and provides a diversity of housing product. So is it fair to say that you, you agree that, in your, um, that it, this project would serve the public interest? Yes, it would. And is it also fair to say that on the other hand, it's not going to cause uh, injury to individual interests. Correct. Okay. Um, all right. Um, those are all the questions I have for Mr. Kuntz, unless there are other questions from the council. Anyone have any more questions for Bob? We're writing madly over here, by the way. <laughs> now, reading it might be different. As long as he can read it, I don't care. <laughs> any other questions? I know you have other expert witnesses you want to bring up. Good. Yeah, okay, then I would call um, Travis Fluitt. Welcome back, Travis. Good evening. Great to be here. Um, <laughs> yes, do state your name for the record. Travis Fluitt with Kinley Horn and Associates, 421 Fayetteville Street, Suite 600, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27601. Okay, and you've pr previously been qualified and admitted as an expert in the field of traffic engineering. That means we get to skip questions one through eight, um, or one through seven. How, how long have you been working on this project as a traffic engineer? Since August of last year. Um, what tasks have you completed for the applicant on this project? We performed a TIA for this development in coordination with town staff. Okay, um, and has your firm prepared a traffic impact analysis for the Murray Hill Pines project? Yes, we have. Can you describe to the council what your role was in the preparation of the TIA? I oversaw the production of the TIA and signed and sealed the final report. Are you familiar with the findings and conclusions of the TIA? Yes, I am. Is the TIA you prepared for this project dated May 16th, 2022? Yes, it is. There was, an, there was a prior version. Correct, in March. Okay. Um, it was revised based on town comments. Okay. And um, let me... Is this, uh, to the best of your knowledge, a true and correct copy of the May 16th, 2022 uh, TIA? Yes, it is. I'm going to go ahead and mark that one. In the table over here. Um, I'll mark the TIA as Exhibit E, if I'm keeping track correctly. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. It does. Okay, good. Woo. All right. Um. I'll skip ahead while you're doing that. Yes, it is my seal on the cover of the TIA. Okay, that's good information. Um. Um. And then um. mark mine. We also have uh, extra copies. It's not of the full thing with all of the traffic on it. Um, oh, yeah, we'd like to get the Reader's Digest version. The one that's in the record has all of the. As all, yes. Um, okay, so, sorry, I'm going to write back to you for this. Yes, this is awesome. It makes my life so much better. He's nothing if not accommodating. Yeah. That, that takes away all the issues of the rent home. <laughs> 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 
Okay, so yeah, that's your seal on there. Um, have you made yourself uh, familiar with the Town of Southern Pines UDO, particularly any requirements related to traffic management? Yes, I have. And are you familiar with the proposed site plan for Murray Hill Pines, at least as it regards traffic-related aspects? Yes, I am. Um, have you ever been to the geographic area covered by the TIA? Yes, I have. Um, can you please summarize the findings of your uh, May 16th TIA Exhibit E for the Town Council? Yes. So first of all, the TIA was a run based on 160 units, not the 149 proposed. So it should be con slightly conservative, at least in that regard. Uh, so the development, at least per the TIA, is projected to generate approximately 1,172 trips per day, 72 a.m. peak hour trips, and 89 p.m. peak hour trips. We would expect those numbers to be a little lower based on the 149. Um, and that also does not include, we did not apply any reductions for pedestrian or bicycle capture with the adjacent shopping center. So again, conservative. And the site will have two points of ingress and egress, one by a long street, short street out to Murray Hill Road, and one to Richard Street, Haley Street, which connect out to US 1 via Rothney Avenue into Murray Hill Road via Cox Street. And all intersections currently and are expected to continue to operate with short delays for the stop controlled approaches with minor increases in delay due to site traffic. Okay, great. Um, now, how many intersections did you, nearby intersections, did you study for the purposes of the TIA? We studied three existing intersections, Murray Hill at Short Street, Murray Hill at Cox Street, and US 1 at Rothney Avenue. Okay, for, for each of those intersections, is it fair to say that you examine the existing traffic, the background traffic, the anticipated build-out traffic, and the 10-year traffic to determine impacts, if any, on the level of service in those intersections? Yes. Um, okay. Um, did you determine the Murray Hill Pines build-out impact of each of those intersections? Yes, we did. Can you summarize that? I think we just that? skipped it out. Okay. Yeah. So this is the summary. Okay, summary go ahead. One. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. So the short street approach to Murray Hill Road currently operates at level of service B. This is a stop controlled approach and is projected to operate at level of service B in the AM peak hour and level of service C in the PM peak hour at project build out. Based on the 10 year horizon, it was projected to operate at level of service C in both the AM and PM. Site traffic is expected to increase delays on short street by less than two seconds per vehicle versus the background condition at project build out and Murray Hill traffic will be essentially unaffected. The Cox Street approach to Murray Hill Road, again, stop controlled, currently operates at level service B and is projected to operate at level service B in the AM peak hour and level service C in the PM peak hour at project build out. And again, in the 10 year horizon, level of service C in both the AM and PM peak hours. Site traffic is expected to increase delays on Short Street by, le that should be Cox Street, by less than one second, one second or less per vehicle versus the background condition at build out. And again, Murray Hill traffic will essentially be unaffected. The Rothney Avenue stop controlled approach to US 1 currently operates at level of service B and is projected to operate at level of service B in the AM and C in the PM at project build out. And again, level service C in the 10 year horizon. Site traffic is expected to increase delays on Rothney Avenue by less than one half second per vehicle versus the background condition at project build out. And US 1 traffic will be essentially unaffected. Um, and reaching those conclusions, did you make what would be considered to be standard um, assumptions from a traffic engineering standpoint? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know if I said it, but I do want to make sure the record uh, is clear that we've introduced the TIA as Exhibit E. Yes, yes, we have that, and that's acceptable. Okay, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So are the um, levels of service that you just described for the three um, intersections that you studied um, considered acceptable levels of service with no queuing issues at build-out? Yes, they are. All right. And does your TIA call for any off-site improvements to roadways to accommodate Murray Hill Pines? No, it does not. All right. 
Um, was the TIA supplied uh, to the acting town engineer, uh, Mr. James Mickle? Yes, it was. And um, we've been through some of this already. You, can you just summarize um, what Mr. Mickle said about the TIA? Yes. So in our original March TIA, um, the primary <coughs> comment um, that Mr. Mickle had was that we had assumed approximately 45 to 50 percent of the site traffic would enter and exit the site via either Rothney Avenue or Cox Avenue um, versus using Short Street. Mr. Mickle thought that significantly more would use the Short Street connection. And while I stand by my initial estimate, we revised the analysis to have 75% of the traffic entering and exiting via Short Street with the remaining 25% split between Cox Street and Rothney Avenue. Um, and did that uh, cause any change to the uh, levels of service? Nothing significant. No. Okay. Um, We've already covered this. Um, and so Short Street would dump onto Murray Hill, correct? Correct. And then it would be a very close journey to for people who either need to go to US 1 or to 15501. Is that correct? Correct. And did you do any research about the intersection at Murray Hill and um, either 15501 or US 1? No, uh, we discussed both of those with town staff, but the, given the relatively short time frame of the NCDOT improvements at both of those intersections, there was really not any point in studying them or making improvements at those intersections since DOT will be making changes in the very near future. So the fact that on the previous issue, which you also did a TIA on, the fact that you give an F rating to US 15501 at Murray Hill Road, it seems to me to be relevant. Where's the F rating? I'm not, what study are you referring to? Oh, oh the, yeah. the, on, on the previous um, proposal, the previous issue we spoke about. Um, no, the, um, uh -oh. the other development. Morgan and Park, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Morgan Park study. So um, a couple of things about that study. That study did not include the improvements. James, correct me if I'm wrong. We did not include the improvements that are being done by the development on the northeast corner. I believe they are doing a second, right? They're doing a right turn lane. The development at the corner of 15501, Murray Hill, is putting in an additional turn lane. Correct. So that study, that level service F, did not account for that turn lane. So your did, study that you did on another development tonight was not up to date? We were ahead of that development, so we did not include their improvement. We included their traffic, but they had not committed to that improvement yet. So, we so someone who's it. coming off of Murray Hill and turning right on 15501? So, left on 15501. There's not an additional turn lane off at Murray Hill, is there? Yeah. Well, the turn lane will be on Murray Hill, turning on to 15501, going north. All right. Miners. What about if somebody wants to go left? There is a one lane that will be a shared left through lane. Okay. And what would you give a grade to that? What grade would you give to that with the with the current improvements? With the proposed improvements. I would have to look it up, but it improved the it improved the operation of the intersection significantly. Just adding that right turn lane, it brought it from F to at least at level service D. But you do agree that if the majority of the people come out on Murray Hill, they've either got to go to fifteen five hundred one or to US one. Right. And what would you give the um, the intersection at US one and Murray Hill? I do not know. I didn't think that was important. That's like going to be the main means of again is it going to be improving that intersection in the near future so there will be improvements there coming very soon okay i would um i'd like to put the tia from the previous development that is also authored by you into evidence please um, i actually don't think you can do that no it's two different things it's, uh, yeah, it's not a part of this it's proceeding. A, it's a, I mean, he's that that's going to be an intersection that's going to matter. Yeah, I, I, 
Okay. Um, so in going through the uh, TIA and 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 the um, dealings that you've had with Mr. Mickle, town engineer, um, so based on that um, and all of the other information and experience at your disposal, pertinent to the project, do you have an opinion based on a reasonable degree of engineering certainty, traffic engineering certainty, as to whether this site um, with the uh, recommended improvements, and I'm, I'm including uh, reasonable improvements to Short Street that may be agreed and to, Long and Long Street, um, is appropriate for the proposed project based on traffic considerations? Yes, it is. Um, and what, so then is that your expert opinion? Yes, it is. Okay, do you have any reservations about that based on questions from the council or anything else that you know? I do not. Okay. Um, all right, uh, those are all the questions I have for this witness, unless there are others from the council. Anyone have any questions for Travis? Yes. Um, <clears throat> it appears that Short Street to Long Street will be the primary entrance, is that correct? Yes. Will there also be access to the site by way of Cox Street? Yes. Yes. No. The, okay. Can we pull up the site BJ, plan? Can you pull that up? Mm -hmm. No. Cox. That's what he's saying. He assumed he tried to figure it out. Seventy percent. Yes. But yes, there will be connection right here where Richards meets Haley Street. Okay. And so traffic can either go out Rothney to US 1 or Haley down to Cox out to Murray Hill Road. And so we, we did study this intersection to account right. for that traffic and the intersection of Rothney US 1 to account for that traffic coming in out, both of those directions. So, so the same entrance that would have gone into the manufactured home area is still there. Yes. Okay. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Travis? All right. You want to bring up your next? Yes. Our next witness is Kyle Winters. Can you uh, state your uh, name and address for the record? Kyle Winters. I work at Integra Realty Resources, 214 West Tremont Avenue, Suite 200, Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, are you, uh, and you've been qualified as an expert in the field of uh, property valuation. Yes. Um, can you generally describe for the council what tasks you've been uh, asked to complete for the applicant and have completed? We did an impact study to determine whether the proposed project would have a negative impact on adjoining surrounding property values in the neighborhood. Okay. Um, and has your firm, in fact, um, prepared an impact study appraisal for the applicant? Yes. And in that appraisal, did you study the question of whether the, the proposed <coughs> uses here at Long Hill Pines would substantially diminish or impair the property values within the neighborhood? Yes. And what was your role in the preparation of that report for this site? I uh, conducted a site inspection of the property, the neighborhood, and conducted all of the research analysis and conclusions. Okay. Um, and is the report that you prepared for this project dated June 2, 2022? Yes. And as far as you can tell, is this a true and correct copy of the report that I've marked as Exhibit F? Yes. All right, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Exhibit F into the record. Accepted. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is, um, I'll just say there are five copies here of the full thing. Um, to give the council um, the, the uh, you can read the whole thing if you like, but if you uh, want to get to the money page, it's the fourth page in, which has a summary of all the various conclusions. You need to read the whole thing. So if you get yourself familiar with the town of Southern Pines UDO, particularly the section 2.21.7D, that the proposed use not substantially diminish or impair property values within the neighborhood? Yes. And are you familiar with the proposed site plan for Murray Hill Pines? Yes. Um, and have you studied the likely impact of uh, on development of this type with the proposed 149 residential units? Yes. Are you familiar with the neighborhood surrounding uh, Murray Hill uh, Pines project? Yes, I, I drove it. All right. 
Um, and can you describe for the council the three different types of uses that you found in proximity to the Murray Hill Pines project? There's single family residential, there's existing multifamily in the neighborhood, and then uh, retail and office users. Okay, so what you were attempting to determine was whether or not this project would have a, a substantially diminishing impact on any one of those three uses, single family, multifamily, or commercial. Correct. Okay. Can I just add, clarify one thing? Sure. I th did you mean they think the fourth literal piece of paper, which says number two, one. number it's two on ours? Two. Yes, it says page two. Okay. It, two. it took me a little bit to figure out yeah, where it was. Yeah, you said four, and we're like, I'm thinking it's the fourth page, and do oh, what that. you want to. Got okay. to. You know, it's late, so we need to do that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so you were determining, uh, doing a study to determine whether there would be negative impacts on the types of properties that surround this property, single family, multifamily, and uh, commercial. Correct. All right, if, can you go through those three categories for the council real quickly to see what the conclusions of your um, study was? So we basically looked for paired data. I looked for existing apartment communities that were physically adjacent to other residential neighborhoods. And then what I looked for are residential neighborhoods that had recent single family home sales that physically abutted the multifamily community. And then we sort of spread out on an increasing distance away from the apartment community to look for other single family home sales that occurred within those same neighborhoods and then basically paired adjacent to the apartment versus further away from the apartment to determine whether uh, the ones adjacent to the apartment had any impact or difference on the overall price of the home or any uh, significant difference on price per square foot of the home. And so basically I found five different apartment communities between the Southern Pines area and then I went into Fayetteville as well. And um, basically they all indicated that there was no measurable difference in the overall sale price or the price per square foot, whether physically adjacent to an apartment community or further away from it. Okay. And so, um, and that was for the impact that a community like this, which is not an apartment community, but is uh, for build rent. rent. Yeah, right. build to rent. And there was, um, I am, yeah, <laughs> um, and I am familiar also uh, in Charlotte with a new construction for sale townhome project. Uh, Mattamy Homes is building it and Mattamy came in. It's physically adjacent to a under construction build to rent community. And Mattamy, I appraised the property, but Mattamy said that um, it, it, the, the adjacent build to rent community had no bearing or impact on their proposed home pricing within their townhome development. Okay. Um, I do have a question. Uh, when we refer to diminishment of value, we are specifically speaking of basically the resale value of the of properties adjacent. Right. Does, does one property sell for less because it's next to an apartment versus another property? Does it sell for more because it's not next to the apartment? Exactly. Yes. So does it also consider that in some instances an increased value if it's quite significant to the properties that are adjacent, could also possibly so someone, increase taxes. Uh, I, I can answer that one because yes. that's that's really um, a more of a legal question. So, okay. <clears throat> because the um, criteria D, which is the thing that we're looking at um, for the special use permit, only asks the question whether this project will substantially diminish or impair the property values within the neighborhood, the real property values, not whether it could cause an increase in property values and an increase in taxes. That's not a relevant consideration to, to that very specific finding that you have to make. It may, it may well be that it's true, mm -hmm. but, but what you have to examine here is only the question of whether or not the, prop, the nearby property would suffer a diminishment in real property value. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does, it does. And, and I think the deeper question is at some point is going to have to be, which may be a sidebar, the extent to which uh, property values increase could actually contribute to uh, generational wealth being passed down. And measuring that against if I may have to pay extra, you know, 
tax value on something. I, I, th I think that that's another conversation. But but thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I also think that then becomes an impairment. I think I think that generally diminish means what diminish means. But I think that you're making an argument about impairment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is uh, also part of the impairment in the immediate. Correct. But could be a no, benefit. No, could be in impairment the... long term. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, I see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we hear this, right, from time to right. time in various different projects. I mean, we were all here when we heard it on another project. And right. It's just that it's, it's not that it may not be a reality. It's that it's not one of the standards that you're measuring right now. I it understand. Could be in the future, if you... The standard says diminish or impair. So I think it is one. No, I but think... it says diminish or impair the property value within right. the neighborhood. Right. It, the, he's, he's testifying as an expert. Right. The property value... Will... I understand what you're saying. I understand what he's saying, too. Much bigger issue to my right. Um, so you, you addressed the first category of single family, and you were going to go on to um, uh, <clears throat> multifamily. So multifamily <coughs> basically did a, a similar analysis. So uh, oh, Sorry, let me interrupt. The, the reason why we're going through this is that I don't know if you all are aware of this. So Murray Hill Pines has three different kinds of adjoining properties. One is single families. He said that it won't have a negative impact on that. The other is apartments, multifamily. So he's going to analyze that, and then the other is commercial. So just setting the stage there. So uh, apartment communities are typically valued based on their net operating income. So if if uh, rents go down or vacancy goes up, then theoretically the value of the property goes down. And so what I looked for was an existing apartment community in which subsequent to its construction, another apartment community was built effectively adjacent to it or across the street from it, close proximity, to determine whether the rents on the existing community increased, decreased, stayed the same, whether their occupancy rates increased, decreased the same relative to the completion of construction of the adjacent community. So I found three communities uh, between Southern Pines and Fayetteville, which basically had an existing and then a, a new construction one on um, on one of the communities, basically the rents slightly declined, meaning like you know, 1%, the vacancy slightly uh, increased a hair. One of them, basically it stayed flat, and one of them it actually increased during a similar period um, of construction of a new community. So basically, and then the, the one that had a slight decline or stabilized, basically the next year it rebounded and recovered fully to a higher rental rate and occupancy rate relative to prior to construction of that other new community. So basically what that's telling us is there was no measurable impact, adverse impact on rental rates or occupancy rates from construction of a new apartment community adjacent to another one. Okay. Um, and then the third category would be commercial uh, office and retail. So this analysis was really based more on professional experience and discussions with brokers and developers. There's, there's a saying in retail and commercial that retail development follows rooftops. And what that means is the more rooftops that go in, the more consumers you have to shop at the retail center. So basically, an apartment community is going to benefit retail development. And basically, the same thing holds true for office development, where you now have an increased employment pool of potential employees that an employer can select from so it benefits the office users from having access to additional potential employees okay uh, thanks for for going through all that so so with respect to special use permit criteria d that the project not substantially diminish or impair property values within the neighborhood based on your review of this project and the neighborhood um, did you formulate an opinion as to whether Murray Hill Pines project, as described in the site plan, if constructed, would substantially diminish or impair property values within the neighborhood? It will not diminish or impair property values in the neighborhood. Okay. So those are all the questions I have for this witness. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. And now we go. Last witness. Last and, witness. Uh, he's been sworn. I'll have to qualify him, but it's, it'll, it'll happen quickly. Yes. We have a newbie with us, right? <laughs> right. Maybe next time we'll see. Um, could you state your name for the record, please? Uh, Aaron Katz with Kimley Horn, uh, 421 Fayetteville Street, C600, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27601. And what's your job title? Uh, civil engineer. Uh, how long have you been at this job? Seven years. Um, and uh, can you give a brief description of your educational background? Uh, yes, uh, bachelor's degree in civil engineering from University of Michigan. 
and a master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Florida. All right. Can you describe uh, any relevant certificates or licenses that you may hold? Uh, North Carolina professional engineer. Okay. Um, describe in, in general terms for the council the history of your experience on this project. I've performed a site uh, civil feasibility investigation and due diligence. And have you reviewed the water, sewer, and stormwater plans for this project? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to tend to Mr. Aaron Katz is an expert in the field of public engineering. Accepted. Um, have you made yourself familiar with the Southern Pines UDO, particularly the requirements <coughs> of a valid SUP application as set forth in Section 2.21.7A through F? Yes. And with regard to criteria C there in that section, which relates to whether there's adequate public facilities will be provided, um, do you, have you reviewed that? Yes. Do you believe that um, adequate public water will be provided for this project? Yes. Um, and why is that? Uh, public water uh, will be readily available to the site. Uh, existing site contains a uh, water main network today, and there is also an existing water main located in the Long Street right of way adjacent to the site. Okay, and uh, we can just speed through it. Um, do you believe that the adequate stormwater protections uh, will be incorporated into the plan for this project? Uh, yes, a BMP will be constructed in the southwest corner of the site to meet quantity and quality requirements. Runoff from the site will be routed to the BMP to be detained and treated prior to being released downstream. And are you familiar with the um, uh, approach to collection and treatment of the wastewater for this project? Yes. And just describe that to the council if you might. Sure. The approach consists of connecting the project sewer to the Morganton Park South Phase 1 sewer system. The Pine, uh, Morganton Park South uh, sewer system project is located directly north of our Murray Hill uh, Pines project. As part of the development for the Pine Ridge project, a sewer stub and associated easement will be provided, which will allow for future connection of our project sewer uh, into the system at Pine Ridge. Okay. Um, and do you, based on that um, connection, do you have an expert opinion as to whether adequate public facilities will be provided for this project? Yes, I believe this project will provide adequate public facilities in the form of water, sewer, and stormwater. Okay. And then criteria E, which is the last one I'll cover, um, relates to whether the proposed use will be detrimental to the public health, safety, comfort, or general welfare. Do you have an opinion as to whether water, sewer, stormwater provisions for this use will be detrimental to the public health, safety, comfort, and general welfare? To best of my knowledge, the water, sewer, stormwater provisions for this use will not be detrimental to the public health, safety, comfort, and general welfare. So those are all my questions for this witness. Anyone have any questions for? Thank you. Okay, you're good. Um, so I think that's all we have, um, unless you have more questions. I, I will say this. Um, I really have appreciated um, working with your staff, um, as always. And in particular, um, the Short Street thing raised an issue that is not typical. Um, and I am grateful to Mr. Mickle for his willingness on um, rather short notice and in extensive detail to work with our people to come up with a plan for how to deal with that as we move forward. So I just want to express our, our gratitude to the staff for that. Um, the, um, OK, sure, sure. Um, and um, so. I don't, I guess we'll wait and see if there's any other testimony, but um, if there isn't, um, I would say that the record is complete um, on, the, on the six findings that you need to make um, with the type of testimony that you need um, to competent material and substantial evidence to support all five findings. Um, and so I, if that does prove to be the case, I would request that, um, that you uh, approve the project with the conditions um, as stated. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Do you want some clarification, BJ? Chain link fence. <laughs> Amy. Uh, Bob had mentioned a chain link fence as a perimeter fence, and I just wanted to call attention to UDO 4.7D. Just to have it on the record now, this would have come but site plan, but the chain link fence, it, the use of chain link fence is pretty restricted for um, the perimeter of a residential development. It has to be located uh, no closer to the property line than the middle of the setback or buffer. Um, existing vegetation cannot be removed in the setback buffer. Uh, and then the fence cannot be taller than six feet from ground level and has to be non-reflective color such as brown, black, or dark green. So I just wanted to make sure it didn't paint the picture for the applicants who weren't 
somehow always thinking about UDO 4.7D as the forefront of their thinking. I didn't want them to think it was a just your classic shiny metal chain link fence. That's all. What kind of fence is it? What is the existing fence? It's that piece. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's a, it's a chain link. Yeah. It's a chain link fence. And it's, it's, if it's a chain link fence that meets the standard, it's coated in brown, black, whatever, okay. it cannot be used. It can't be continued. Extension of a knock. You can't extend it. You need to do better. Put a brown one. And while he's trying to find that slide, BJ or James, one of the other of you, this is probably a question for you. I'm assuming that when um, a proposal such as this one comes forth, that there's some way that the fire department is consulted. And uh, James, is that a call that you make? Somebody teach me what happens as far as making sure with this, it looks like a rather tight turning community. Uh, who, who determines whether or not there's access for a fire truck? FedEx backs in. Um, yes, we do consult with uh, Ken Skipper, the fire marshal, as part of the TRC process. And one of the things he does review very closely is the ability to get a fire truck into and around a development. And so that's a part of TRC, is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay, and has that been done in this case? Um, he did look at this as part of the pre-app that we went through and we discussed, but there was not a, a detailed um, looking of the various turning radiuses and things like that. Um, that does typically occur at the site plan. So does it help you all for us to make that a condition as far as if we move, if we move forward with this project? necessary the UDO covers it and so does the fire department's own standards and building code um, I, I don't think that would really add anything at this point question uh, along the line of mr. Grieve um, my apologies oh oh no asking what what is the purpose I know we're talking about the chain linked fence what what is the purpose of the fence in the first place well, the neighbors, the, the neighbors, were, the neighbors were oh, okay. concerned about them walking through just the property. Through. Okay. I'll just say that fence that's there in that picture also appears to have barbed wire on the top because it, it has very clearly right there, it has the little stanchions that go up and hold oh. on to. Barb, is the barbed wire gone? Um, I would just say that any like any site development, if you have a non-conforming fence on the subject property, it'd be the same as having other any other non-conforming structure. When you redevelop the site, it would need to be brought into compliance and removed and replaced with something that's compliant. If there's a desire to have a mm -hmm. fence, so that's pretty standard with any site. If you if you tear down a commercial development and redevelop it, so I mean, I, I would just suggest that that the, the the rule would be if they're going to put a new fence in, that they've got to follow the standards and bring the other one up to code and if they're and but they may just do nothing right okay i think we're having some sidebars over here here we go is this a fence discussion it is a fence discussion and the applicant has agreed to bring the fence into compliance okay. the yeah thank you the, the sections that we've demonstrated earlier previously yeah because of the, the root of my question has to do with the relationship of neighborhoods and, I, and I, I'm glad you shared with me, you know, the prevention of people coming through. And if that's a concern of the present neighborhood, that's fine. But sometimes I think we build, uh, maybe in some other instances, and we fence ourselves in that basically says, you stay out. And I was just making sure we weren't kind of going down that road. So thank you so much. Mr. Okay. Murphy, um, but it was a direct request from our neighborhood meeting to extend the fence. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so right down the fence. Okay. Compliant. Another clarification about architecture, and this is one we could probably go on for. We, I just don't want to, but I do think it needs to be on the record. This in so part of the presentation. There were three um, architectural renderings provided. Um, and these are conceptual architectural re renderings, um, I think illustrating 
you know, concept here. Um, if these residential structures are to be built to the North Carolina Residential Code for one and two family dwellings, which they appear to be one and two family dwellings, um, we cannot control the architecture. So there's no guarantee that they will look like this and they will not come back for an architectural review. Um, I feel like that's important to mention. Um, it's state statute. You know, we can't regulate it. Staff, therefore, is not losing any sleep over this one. But I just wanted you to know that when these go up, they may not look like this. And I, I would not, this came up once before where a special use permit showed something. And when we went back to that special use permit, I just did not have enough to hang my hat on in light of that statute to say, yes, because you went through special use permit review, you have to comply with that because that statute is just too black and white clear that you can't. And it's a zoning matter that, that it basically says any regulation relating to building design elements adopted under this chapter, the chapter 160D, may not be applied to any structures subject to regulation under the North Carolina Residential Code for one and two family dwellings. So I think those are illustrative of, what, of their intent, but it would not be indicative of the requirement. So um, I want to point that out. Uh, do you guys have anything to say about that or sure. that one? But your intent is to have the product that we're seeing. Is that correct? Okay. He said yes. <laughs> the hell. <laughs> <laughs> no, BJ, what do they say? <laughs> um, the, the, <laughs> yeah, Doug says it has curb and gutter. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Take the mic away from BJ. All right, sorry. <laughs> the last one I just want to clarify real quickly is, is uh, we, um, we just want some clarification. There was quite a bit of discussion about sidewalks as part of the project. Was there anything stated or clarified about off-premise sidewalks, commitments to off-premise sidewalks, be they on Long Street, Short Street, anything like that? Because that was a topic of discussion, and so I'm curious where you guys are at on that. Yes, we did, and I, I thought during the presentation I mentioned that there will be sidewalks along Long Street and that there would be a connection back to Murray Hill as well on Short Street. Um, I thought I had mentioned that. A sidewalk connection to Murray Hill is what we had yeah. discussed. Any other questions? Yes, I've got a question for James. James, have you been sworn in? Yes, he was a staff swear in. Well, great. So, James, in your um, email to Jennifer dated May 9, 22, you say regarding traffic, the primary entrance to the proposed development will be off of Murray Hill Road at the intersection of Short Street. Short Street currently exists as a local street which is adequate for up to 200 trips per day as defined in UDO Section 4. Point eleven point two, street classification B two. The proposed development will add up to one thousand one hundred seventy two trips per day, UDO section um, four eleven two. Street classification B five defines a road with more than eight hundred trips per day as a collector street. An improved cross section from the development should be extended from the development to the intersection of Murray Hill to mitigate the impacts of the increased traffic. Can you please explain what you think would be the solution to that issue? So that's a um Part of what the, the condition and the manner in which it was written is somewhat open-ended because there are aspects of engineering and design that need to occur to fully define that because it's, as I think Nick alluded to earlier, it's not as simple as just, hey, we're building a new road and we have all of the space available to build it the way we would. Um, a typical commercial collector street or even a residential collector street will typically have a anywhere from a 70 to 100 foot right of way and the existing right of way out there right now is only 50 feet um, and i can say 160d much like with the residential um, architectural limitations also limits the town's ability to require um, an applicant or developer in this case 
to purchase additional right away outside of their property. Um, so we have to kind of take a step back and go, okay, well, we, we can't push the road out wider, but what can we get done to make sure that we're meeting the intent of why we design the roads we do? So that takes into, like you've asked, you know, how do you address the storm water? And there's multiple ways to do that. How do you ensure that the road's gonna last and hold up to that amount of traffic? Um, and because that road exists, it's not as simple as just saying, hey, you have to build this road. It's, okay, well, what does that road exist right now? What is the, the substructure under the asphalt look like? What is the thickness of the existing asphalt? And those are things we just don't know right now. Um, so those are what we're trying to agree amongst myself and the, the developers team is that, yeah, we need to look at those things and we need to come up with something, but to define what that is right now, I don't know that we can. Okay. Second question, your, um, your number two is a pedestrian connection to the existing sidewalks on Murray Hill Road should be considered. Correct, and that was what BJ was just clarifying. Correct. And they just stated they are building that. They are doing that. Okay, number three. So we want to make that a condition if we were to approve this project. Okay, and then, and that's pedestrian connection to existing sidewalk on Murray Hill. And then number three, you say, and, and this may be addressed by the easement that they seem to have obtained, analysis of the increased sewer for this development exceeds, exceeds the available capacity of the existing downstream sewer. It is staff's understanding that the applicant has coordinated with the adjacent commercial development to redirect a sewer toward their site. If this cannot be negotiated, the applicant should be responsible for the upgrades to the existing downstream sewer system to accommodate the additional flow. So if I use your language as a condition, as a contingency for approval, are we covered as far as the town not having a horrible disaster, infrastructure, mess, literally. Yes, and that was the intent of it, putting that language in there. It basically says if, if for whatever reason this agreement with the adjacent developer doesn't go through and you still want to build the project, you have to address the downstream capacity issue. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Motion to close. I move to close the public hearing. Second. Pleasure, the council. Wait, did you see if there was anybody wanting to speak? It's quasi-judicial. Well, they can well, still speak to it. Speak. Is there anyone out there with I've looked around expert? I didn't want to this issue. With expert testimony. Yeah, I didn't. It doesn't, it, it can be, it, it, right. A person can speak to facts. They cannot offer opinions unless they're expert. Right. No one else got sworn in. Mason, Arthur? You can, you can clarify all day long that if a person who's not an expert is speaking, they have to be speaking facts, not opinions. You were not sworn in, were you, Mr. Mason? Do you have some? Okay, so you will raise your right hand. State your name. Do you solemnly swear the evidence you shall give the board and this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Born and raised here. Okay, state your name and address. Arthur Mason, 795 West New Hampshire Avenue. Okay, born and raised here. I understood the study that they said they performed concerning the traffic. <laughs> Now, we have people up on Cox Street, that whole neighborhood back there. They have to come down there, and they have to go south just to go north. This is a very, very serious problem for those folks. And when this other, when this other traffic come in, it's going to be more of a serious problem. This is what I really want you to take on the consideration. It is, it's gonna be terrible. It's terrible right now. I just, this is the point I wanted to make. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Mason. So, Mr. Mason, you're talking about the fact that Murray Hill basically creates a road. I mean, you have to go around your elbow to get right. to your you thumb. Got, you got to come out and you got to get on number one. You right. got to, or either 15501 and go south just to get back on number one and go north. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. And it's been a problem for a while. Continues to be right. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, now, motion to close. Great. If there are no more, I'll move to close the public hearing. Sir. Pleasure of the council. Aye. 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 Okay, good luck, Bill. No, um, we um, need to talk about the approval or denial of the special use permit application. And there's several ways to do this. Adopt attachment A, and, and, and we've got a lot of um, layers of this one, so. Is there any additional like, discussions before we move to that? I don't have any. I don't have any. I think we've right. discussed a lot. I think based on what BJ said at the beginning of the hearing, if people are interested in approving this project, it makes sense to make it, sorry to put this right back on you, BJ, but it makes sense to make the timeline creation uh, um, a partnership between the planning department and, 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 this, and a, an approval be contingent upon a timeline having been agreed to between the planning department and the developer. But that may just create the whole problem in a bigger way for you. And, and I don't know how to fix that because you have an expertise that we don't have. So if I were to sit here and try to create a timeline, that would really not serve you very well either. Very much appreciate your understanding. And, and your, I hear you, know, you but, um, but I don't know how to fix it. Yeah, the condition we have is, is, is pretty darn good in terms of the desired outcome. The desired outcome is to think about these, be required to think about these things and have a phasing plan prior to approval of site plan. So I now am able to say to worst case scenario, which it happens from time to time, um, say they're just like, no, we're not going to work on this phasing plan. It's blah, blah, blah. I'm like, look, I'm not signing this until we have a phasing plan that addresses the following four things. That's enough of a hook for me to be able to, and, and so, yeah, that, that works. So if, if there was an approval and if it were conditional upon, or contingent upon your stipulations um, as far as a phasing plan goes, that would sort of kind of solve the problem for you? Yes, um, the, the, the condition, the language I threw up there on the screen, right. um, gets at that and covers a handful of other bases that we've talked about, such as sewer and whatnot. It gives us right. the ability to say that stuff out because sewer and water, et cetera, are part of that. Right. What has to be done before. Well, and I think James's email of May has some pretty important language in it and uh, May 9th and, um, and addresses the traffic issue. And I, I realize he's not an expert, but I think Mr. Mason hits the nail on the head about a very real traffic issue. That is a much bigger picture that, is landlocking some folks, particularly people in West Southern Pines. Um, so that was a rabbit hole I just went down, but we need to, we need to address it at some point um, and soon. But it, to me, I think um, if I were into a phase plan, I would totally mess it up. But I think the important things are the water, the sewer, the storm runoff, the, the short street, long street, um, road integrity. I mean, James spoke to road integrity, um, which is huge, and the pedestrian connection to the um, to the existing sidewalk at Murray Hill, which you've indicated is is acceptable, and then also the um, the fence. If that's that, you have a willingness. And I understand your point, too, that it may be a neighborhood that says, oh, well, this is kind of nice, and let's not have a fence. But you are willing, if it, if it arises as a need to have a fence there, if that's what it takes to create a solid neighborhood. So that's what I see. And I'm sure, again, BJ, circling back to my main point, that you see a bunch of things that I don't see. Um, yeah, in fact, just as your point, 
you're you're seeing a bunch of stuff here that you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is a whole lot that needs right. to be dealt no, with. It's, and, it's, and what I what I want you to know is every Tuesday morning at Technical Review Committee meeting, we're looking at site plans that are this thick. Right. We have sheets for all these different subjects. Right. And we have a team of experts that work for the town that are looking at their particular sheet. Um, and we do this all the time. And I think that, believe it or not, is is where a lot of your thoughts right now about, oh my goodness, stormwater, sewer, water, roads, right. we got to make sure right. all this is done. We are making sure it's done. Those are all technical specs. And the state of North Carolina authorizes that technical review committee as an administrative decision-making body because those specs are very quantifiable. You know, you either are five or you're six, that type of thing. But do you agree with me that it, for us to try to orchestrate or design a phase plan would be a bit of a nightmare? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Like it, <clears throat> it's going to come down to details that James and I were spitballing for a good 30 to 45 minutes, just the concept of like why this phasing plan is a good idea for both parties, really. Okay, just so the rules are clear. So, okay. All right. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I do. Prompts, no, I, you know, like, hey, I now have at least a hook that says we need to talk this out. And if for some reason the applicant won't participate or refuses, I've got a hook to say, no, it's it's this has to be done prior to site plan. So, Bill is going to do an amazing we'll give it a go here. Includes. I will move. I will move to adopt attachment A of the staff report as our findings of fact regarding proposed special use permit SU0322. Do we do we need to add? That's Are we gonna do I was, well, was going to oh, add that, that in the uh, approval. In the approval. The conditions will be in the section. Finding effects with the okay. sixth thing. Yeah. Huh? Just a second. Oh, God, that you said give me a second. I thought, for what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, pleasure the council. Aye. 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 Seconded. Taylor did. Okay. Taylor did. Thank you. Okay. Aye. Looking for, okay, we already added. Okay, sorry. So. <laughs> so, All right. Now we need a motion to approve SU 0322 with the can. following conditions. And did you get the, that vote? Yes, she did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Aye. All eyes. Aye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all, all right. eyed. Aye. Fine. <laughs> all right. So then I will. And here we go. I move to approve. Just to avoid yeah. confusion. I'm sorry. In your staff report, you'll notice there's some conditions that were drafted ahead of time. They're they're on page. 14 of 60, 13 and 14 of 66. Now, my proposal with these three, plus the fencing and the sidewalk connections to Murray Hill that you guys have come up with, are to replace those because those are outdated because the applicants submitted some, we had some additional conversation prior to the meeting, so. Okay. And I may uh, duplicate here, but we're, we'll see. Okay. I, I move to approve special use permit SU03-22 with the following additional conditions. That's a, Phasing plan will be worked out between the town and the um, proponent at TRC or other appropriate venues that will address when building permits shall be allowed, which will include improvements to roads and sewer. Said sewer will either have provided a agreement with the local other development or have satisfied downstream capacity issues. We'll also deal with when COs will be signed, and that'll deal with trees, lights, asphalt lifts, and related topics. It we'll also deal with the schedule for amenities, such as the clubhouse and other things on the project, and also address short street improvements as to when and as and how much and what that will comply. And Long Street. Yes, and Long Street as well. That also incorporate BJ's three components that were in his. Recommended conditions as part of Exhibit B on his report, including second level that incorporate by reference all of the proponents' agreements to this that were found in their Exhibit D and or uh, verbal um, comments at the, at the hearing today. That also will include um, appropriate runoff control, full sidewalk to Murray Hill Road, um, compliant fencing on any perimeter fencing, And the establishment of road integrity. Yeah, he said that. Fine. Yeah. I think that's it. Did we miss anything? Because it's a whole lot. Yeah, I thank goodness for YouTube videos, because I will go back and review it multiple times tomorrow. So thank you. Um, and I will craft up the findings. Of fact, have been adopted. I will craft motions that. I will, excuse me. I will craft conditions, and this will come, have to come back to you at the work session for approval. It'll mm -hmm. be the. Um, decision of the board. That'll we have all the language in there. No, 
the conditions, I'll sort it out into each topic, and then you guys will see it, and you'll have to take action on it at that work session. And I'll probably give a draft copy to the applicant's attorney because he'll have uh, he'll be hip to what the intent of the conditions were. And I think we're, we're probably going to be pretty close. Do you agree, Nick? I do. May I address the board? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, yeah, I, I was looking through the attachment A, and I'm a little concerned about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just looking at finding a fact number one. It says the town council finds that the application is complete and that the facts submitted are relevant to the case because the request for special use permit approval has not fully met specified submittal requirements oh. as the, as required in the town of Southern Pines UDO appendices or provided through substantiated documentation. Um, so we might have to readopt attachment A with that change. Correction. And then the, uh, as you read through finding of fact number two, um, th these, these findings of fact, um, A, B, C, D, and E, uh, for each of the required fi um, findings were written before they knew whether we would get everything worked out. And I'm, I'm OK with that, with, with them saying, well, these basically say, if they work out the roadway, then they meet. Then they meet this particular finding. Um, I'm fine with those saying this, but I was wondering if the board would consider adopting a third finding of fact that reads as follows, and it's basic, and it just says, "The town council finds that with the conditions applied to the project and all of applicants' evidence in the record, the application meets criteria A through F as set out in 2.21.7 of the UDO." So just to. to try to cover <laughs> cover the waterfront that with, would be with helpful that for us not being eliminated yeah that that okay with you <laughs> or, or can, are we we're already kind of approving but wait to see the yeah. uh, the the actual approval can we do the same thing for attachment a or no problem with the intent whatsoever the intent of the findings of fact being worded the way they are is they are intending to find facts to tee up the legitimacy of imposing a condition you see what I'm saying? You're, yes. you're trying to create right. a rational nexus back to the criteria and make sure that the condition is roughly proportional to the impact. So a lot of that language is specific to that intent. Um, so therefore, the intent of what you're saying, which is to conclude by saying, with the conditions, yes, with the uh, conditions. That, to, to mitigate, yeah. that we're, we're good with it. I, that, that, I don't have a problem with that. Are we good with that? Then I'm, then I'm OK with that. So take out the not. <laughs> take out the not in the yeah. first paragraph, and, and then uh, we'll add the third finding. And I and I would be more than happy then to just go back and forth with BJ, and make sure that is done in accordance with what we've said tonight. Are you good with that? Since I you're am. in the middle of a motion. Yeah, I guess. Uh, do I back up and I move to readopt attachment A to the staff report with the updates previously mentioned in the last two minutes? Second. Pleasure of the council. Aye. 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 Okay, now. Looking for a motion. For the for the approval issue. Yes, yeah, now we'll vote on the I think I made the motion. Now we just need a, a second and an approval. Okay. So with all the stuff we we're good to approve Who's SU O three twenty two. Second. Okay. Pleasure council. Aye. 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 And I think now before we get to the next quasi, we're gonna take a break. Give us like ten minutes.
While it's still, is this Tuesday? Well, we need to keep going. Sorry about this. Uh, my, my car is blocked in by a, a gray Honda Accord and maybe a gray or black Toyota Camry. Is anybody driving one of those? Right back here. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I'm totally. I tried. I tried to maneuver. I can't get out. <laughs> Sorry about that. The night is young. Let's keep moving. We're going to jump out of order um, simply because so um, we are looking at considering WP0122. Hang on. Hang on. Right. Man. Um, it's um, WP0122 76 North Ridge because you have waited a considerable amount of time to this, so please join us, and if you'll state your name and address, please. Yes, hi, my name is Lindsay Baker, and I'm very lucky to live at 760 North Ridge <laughs> Street in Southern Pines with my husband, John. Wonderful, and we had, whoops, we had talked about this um, at the last meeting, so um, 
she is requesting um, the point twenty nine acres of a five seventy exemption allocation to install a concrete patio and swimming pool. Um, Okay. Okay. So she's looking for us to say, build it. Last week we were asked specifically for um, really two things. One, greater specificity around the drainage um, for for the pool. So had provided from um, the designer the overflow piping um, that leads to two River Rock splash pads that are two to two to three feet to help support that that drainage um, in the back. Um, and as well, because of the, the the slight gradation in the sloping, we had some conversation about our, our backup neighbor, which is if there was a massive overflow where the water would go. So we had a conversation with them and I've also provided a letter um, from Rick and Faith Lozano um, that illustrates that they are aware of, of the issue. They've, they've been provided with the designs um, and they are supportive of the project. Okay. So you're looking for us to say yes, are you not? Oh, please. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> what is the pleasure of the council? Do we need, do you want a motion? Sure. I need a motion. Make a motion that we approve the application in WP 0122, the home of seven, at the house at 760 North Ridge Street, for the improvements that they, um, the bakers are asking to make. Second. Pleasure, the council. Hi. Aye. 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 Good night. Thank you. <laughs> you want, do you want your documents back? You want your documents back? Do they need to be in the record? I've already passed them to them. Fantastic, thank you. Babies. Yeah, I figured we, okay, thank you and appreciate your patience. All right. And our last quasi judicial PD 02 22, it's the Ace Hardware. You know the drill. <laughs> Anyone? Involved parties with this, will you please stand, including staff? Did he get his car moved out? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, raise your right hand, and y'all are already doing that. <laughs> please state your name. Do you solemnly swear the evidence you shall give to the board in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you very much. Council members, please discuss the following. <clears throat> Any site visits? No. Ex parte communications? No. Specialized knowledge you have of this case? No. And we have a fixed opinion that is not susceptible to change based on what they learn at this hearing? No. Where they have a close family, business, or other relationship with the applicant or other affected persons? No. Is there an attorney representing the petitioner? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Okay, very good. And is there an opposition person? All right, so I'm assuming because BJ is standing here. And Jennifer is not, that he will give the staff report. This is correct. Well, <laughs> hello there. BJ Grieve, Town of Southern Pines Planning Department. Um, I'm here to present application PD 02-22, Ace Hardware, Phase 1. This is a PDP. You guys are very familiar with the plan development process, three-step process. Starts with CDP. You already saw a CDP for this three-phase uh, development. This is the subject property. Uh, this is the, the, um, the CDP plan on the right. Uh, on the left, you'll see the three phases of development. Uh, what you're seeing is what is outlined in yellow right here. Uh, to get you oriented with the subject property, just in case you are not already, this is the current ACE hardware right here. This is the multi-unit uh, commercial building right here, and here is the traffic circle. Uh, you come down here, there used to be, Don Fry used to, used to have a house on the subject property that has been torn down. Um, the subject property, uh, the entire CDP that was approved, again, was in three phases. Uh, you guys will remember that. Um, phase one is a 64,825 square foot new ACE hardware on 9.11 acres. There are a variety of design considerations. This, you'll see everything is oriented the same way with north being the top of the screen, south being the bottom of the screen. 
We are now, in order to fit it on a landscape orientation, we're going to rotate that so that north is now the left of the screen. Um, so Airport Road is off to the left. Um, now the characteristics of this property are, uh, as far as access, the development does come off of Airport Road. They are going to have to work with NCDOT to make sure that this uh, arrangement is done safely. They have prepared a TIA. The TIA uh, regarding the, the access, the ingress, the egress, the traffic impacts. The TIA was submitted. It contained a list of improvements, but it did not contain a uh, schedule for, those, for the timing of those improvements. Uh, our town engineer got back with them and said, hey, we need a little bit more information on that because it was, there was some discrepancy over whether or not it was good. They were going to try to match up their improvements that were required with other development in the area that also had to do improvements. Turns out that other development is on pause for right now, so they went and they came up with their own schedule of improvements, and the applicant should and will speak to that um, about that TIA. But the gist is you're going to come in here off of Airport Road. You will come in and the internal subdivision road will connect through to Capitol Drive. And then, uh, well, excuse me, I said internal subdivision road. Um, internal road of the development. Again, if you rotate this over, You'll come in here, and this road over here will go to where Roast is. That, that, that's that building right here. And then we'll continue on, as it does now, over to, um, this is Capitol Drive. It would continue over to Olive Seed. Yeah, yeah, OK. Olive Tree, thank you, Olive Tree. <laughs> that was really close, though. Olive Seed, Olive Tree, Olive Leaf, Olive Branch. Um, all right. So. We'll go over here. Now, you'll come into the subject property, and some interesting elements of this is that the applicants have committed to tying the existing sidewalks, which you actually can connect all the way through the Tyler's Ridge multifamily back to the Greenway Trail that will get you into Reservoir Park. Um, that you'll actually be able to walk all the way over here, connect in through here. Originally, the design was going to connect into the Sandhills Horticultural Garden, but it came up at Planning Board that that is no longer the case. So unfortunately, it is not going to connect to that network. I would ask the applicants to speak to that and you guys to ask them about that and the reason for that. Instead, they said they would bring it up here. Unfortunately, it doesn't serve a lot of function to bring it up here and drop you at Airport Road. Um, future connections are always just that, future connections. But um, it's not quite the, the same as before, but I would ask them to speak to that. Um, the overall development, again, there, there are uh, other phases to be developed right here. The CDP, you'll remember, requires that buildings and parking lot be oriented internally rather than externally. What we, wanted, what we did avoid with the CDP was a design where you're driving down Airport Road and you see a bunch of parking lots with a bunch of big stores behind it. So uh, you'll see on this parcel when it's developed at some point in the future that the parking will be oriented towards capital. This will, it is my understanding now that this may not be developed because this may actually wind up being, um, uh, in the arrangement they have with the airport, this may wind up not being developed. But again, I would ask that detail to be um, spoken to by the applicant as well. Um, other than that, with regard to neighboring land uses, we did get comments from the uh, Sandhills, um, Sandhills Community College. A copy of that comment is in your packet. Um, stormwater, as you can see back here, and we do have quite a bit of buffering. Sewer and water is adequate to serve the property. The zoning, as I said, is PDP. The parking is, will be adequate to serve the store. And staff does not have a lot of concerns. This did go to the planning board for a preliminary forum, uh, which I will repeat because it is important to note that that preliminary forum uh, is allowed to occur, but none of the issues raised um, Please do not rely upon them as a basis for a decision. The two issues the planning board wanted to forward to you um, were that the town engineer had briefed the planning board about his concerns related to the immediate improvements in the vicinity of the traffic circle, and the planning board shares his concerns and recommends town council consider the overall impacts of traffic. Since that concern came out, there has been some additional detail worked out with regard to the TIA, which I will let, again, I will let the applicant speak to. And then, in addition, the following issue was is raised during the forum, but does not seem to apply in determining whether the PDP, is, uh, PDP criteria are satisfied. Planning Board recommends the Town Council condition the installation of wayfinding signage along the Greenway Trail connecting ACE hardware that would allow additional connectivity with both the horticultural gardens and the town's Greenway system. This discussion came up because we really, actually, this really extends a Greenway system, but it extends it using 
sidewalks that don't appear obvious to a person using that system of where those sidewalks may go. Simple wayfinding signage could actually be a benefit both to the users, the town, as well as the um, developer of the subject property. Because if people know they can get use a trail to get to the ACE hardware, people at Reservoir Park may in fact do that. There's really not a lot of reason not to come over here. There's places to eat, there's places to shop, and that's why you create those connections is because people can recreate on them, but they can also spend money along them, and that usually is a good symbiotic relationship. So, any other questions for staff? No. Anybody? Until it's late, because first of all, I said any other questions. You never asked me a question. That was the <laughs> end. That was actually the end of my presentation. So I should have said, "I'm done." Do you have any questions for staff? <laughs> Once again, Jennifer, you did a great job. Thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate it. Anybody have any questions for BJ? And now the applicant. Okay, we need to open, sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, we can enter the staff report as Exhibit A. Thank you very much, Beth. Okay, I need a um, motion to open. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Hi. 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 Yeah, we can enter the staff report into the record as Exhibit A and staff's PowerPoint presentation as Exhibit B, please. Accepted. Thank you. A new face. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> feel a little dangerous. Um, thank you. My name is Rihanna Smith. I am with the law firm of Smith Powers. My address is 127 West Target Street, Suite 504, Raleigh 27601. Um, we're going to open this up. We're here, obviously, for the um, applicant. We've applied for the PDP. Can you get the microphone? For you. Thank you. Really close. Okay. Yeah. Um, we are here today for uh, the applicant's uh, approval for their PDP. Um, the prior step was the CDP, which um, in our position today is that it has, we meet all four criteria and we're not asking uh, for any changes to the CD, CDP or any. Um, I'm sorry, I've just lost my word for being this late. We so understand. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Deviations. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so what I'd like to do now, uh, if there's no objection, is to tender uh, Bob Coons as our expert for land planning and site design, um, since he's already been tendered twice. Um, if no objection. Objections. Come on up, Bob. <laughs> Thank you, Rihanna. Yep. Uh, I'll just, Bob Kuntz, 150 South Page Street, Southern Pines. Um, yeah, I, we've, we've talked about, we've been here for the CDP, uh, and this plan really follows uh, basically exactly what was proposed in the CDP. There are a couple items that I will note. Um, BJ mentioned the trail um, and and a couple of other items. Um, but in, in general, this is the project site. Uh, I'm not going to rehash that. BJ really uh, went through this pretty well. You do see the red area. That is the area that we're discussing this evening is phase one of the development. It was proposed as phase one in the original CDP application as well. Um, you can see the trail on the CDP and the location of the stormwater. Um, existing conditions, uh, we've talked about in the past with the connection uh, of Capital uh, Drive, which extends. Um, yeah, microphone. Uh, Capital Drive, if, if you've been at the site before and gone to Roast or gone to Ace Hardware, Capital Drive currently dead ends uh, at the property boundary. And then that road will be extended through and connect. Uh, and that does connect to Olive Tree. Um, this is the um, site plan overall. This also shows the water and sewer lines. So the, the small blue line that you see here will be a, a water line that will connect and loop through the property. Um, and then the, the green is sewer uh, and it will be served from the olive tree uh, and connect back to the proposed ACE hardware. Um, we did have a modification to the Greenway Trail. Originally that trail was uh, sent and, and would connect uh, to the 
Sand Hills Community Garden or the, the Sand Hills Community College uh, Horticultural Garden. Uh, after we, we met with them on, on several occasions to discuss the location and where they would like to see it, um, they did come back and we had a location picked out. Um, they did come back and said for right now they would prefer not to have that connection. So that was with Alan? <laughs> with, uh, I'm sorry too. I just, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I can't remember exactly who it came from, but yeah, it was. Well, with, Alan's in charge of the horticulture. It was Al Alan, yeah, the horticultural garden. Jim Westman. Okay. Jim Westman, that, that's right. So for the temporarily, and so instead of doing that, uh, we decided to go ahead and make that connection out to Airport Road. That would allow people to come back around uh, and come back in eventually, or long term, if uh, the, the the gardens do decide that they would like to have that connection. The trail will be here and they can connect to it relatively easily. Okay. Um, but they did request that that not occur now. So, okay. uh, but um, just control of, of the space, et cetera. So, um, oh, can you go back to that screen? Because you talked about that the airport doesn't want that anything to do with that property on the far left. Uh, on this piece? Yeah. Um, actually, I'll, I'll let Randy address that. Um, I would prefer to have Randy address the agreement between the, the um, airport. The agreement that we have with the airport at the CDP uh -huh. um, is still fine. Okay. Um, and we're just progressing along at this point. That was a terms agreement. Now we're actually making those terms into a codified document. Um, we've been in discussion with Misty Leland. Um, our attorney has, the airport's attorney has, of course, Misty's Moore County's attorney. Um, and she's very familiar with land swaps. Their county's done it numerous times. They have no concern. So for now, you know, this, we don't see where this area right here will ever be developed. This will actually become um, uh, airport and county property at some point in time. But because of the property we're talking about swapping, um, <coughs> had some FAA money involved in that. It's just a little bit of a slower process. Okay. So um, you probably won't see anything happen on that officially for, it could be up to 12 months. They asked for 12 months, we gave them 16 um, to be able to make that work. And if for some reason it doesn't, then the agreement actually states that they'll buy the property from us at improved appraised value. So okay. we have a great relationship, no issues, no concerns. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Randy Saunders, 26 Goldenrod Drive, Whispering Pines, North Carolina. I'm sorry. I thought everybody knew Randy. No. <laughs> so, um, going to the next slide. Site acreage is 9.11 acres, a 55, 000, little over 55,000 square foot building is proposed uh, with a 9,500 square foot greenhouse, which essentially doubles the size of the existing greenhouse at the Ace Hardware and doubles the size of the store as well. Um, this would a, a total somewhere around 65,000 square feet of, uh, for the Ace. Uh, parking requires 162 parking spaces at one space per 400 square feet. We're providing 176. Uh, utilities are available, lighting, signage, uh, and to BJ's point, uh, yes, uh, wayfinding signage is perfectly acceptable along the Greenway Trail. Thank you. Uh, and to connect. Um, looking at open space, um, as we, we continue to, to track as we develop phases of the uh, CDP areas, uh, the site is uh, 12 point, the overall site is 12.62 acres. Overall open space required is 2.52, uh, provided in this track is 2.97 acres, of which 2.04 are uh, acres are um, are required for usable open space. I'm sorry, which are provided. 2.04 are provided. It's late, um, but the total remaining to provide this this development actually takes care of all the open space that's required, um, and that is largely due to. Uh, the greenway trails and the large buffers that we've pr provided along the property boundary with the community college. Um, impervious surface, uh, this project was granted a, a watershed protection uh, uh, agreement and um, the impervious surface is, is under, uh, will be well under that 70% that's permitted on the overall site. 
And if the front parcel never develops, it will be way under <laughs> that um, uh, piece. Happy to answer any questions you have uh, regarding the plan, um, but we're basically following the CDP. Any questions for Bob? Landscaping in the, the small areas in the parking lot. Oh, yes. Okay. That's for sure. All right. Yes. It's just not, this is not the only green. Okay. Right. Yeah. I those islands will be planted per the town of Southern Pines landscape standards. Okay. I need to. Yes. 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 Actually, I became a traffic engineer. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'll, I'll let Ryan will do that. Yes. yes. That would be Exhibit C, correct? Yes. Approved for that one. And uh, Ryan Stevenson is here this evening uh, with uh, Ramey Kemp, who did the traffic impact analysis. And I think Rihanna will. <laughs> so you're supposed to be an expert, so you're going to do the usual gravity, yeah, the stuff, you know, you know the drill. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and if he'll state his name and address and then we can move on. Okay. Um, good evening. Ronald Stevenson with Ramey Kemp Associates, 5808 Farringdon Place, Raleigh, North Carolina. Can you state your job title? Uh, my job title with the company is Director of North Carolina. Uh, I have a uh, professional engineering license in the state of North Carolina. Uh, I've been practicing uh, traffic engineering for over 20 years. Uh, I've prepared uh, hundreds of uh, TIAs and traffic studies for various developments um, all over really the, the East Coast. College. Uh, I have a, um, a bachelor's degree from uh, NC State University in civil engineering and a master's of, uh, in, uh, civil engineering degree from NC State University also. Accepted. Um, sure. So um, kind of walk you through a little bit of history on this. Um, we prepared a TIA report for the development in uh, February of this year. Uh, that traffic study, the TIA was reviewed. There were some comments uh, related to the operations of the, particularly the um, roundabout, as well as the driveway connection uh, onto 22. Um, to address uh, those comments and questions, we went back and prepared a uh, addendum to the traffic study that was is dated June um, uh, th this month. Um, and in that in that addendum to the traffic study, we um, looked at a couple of different things. But but one was a scenario with and without the Carapines development, so we would know how the particularly the roundabout, which was the, at the main source of the, the comments or concerns, uh, how that roundabout would operate uh, if Carapines does not build and does not build improvements. Uh, there are improvements that were required there. Um, we also looked at a scaled back uh, intensity or density of the development. Uh, as you heard some about the front parcel, you know, what happens here uh, with a more realistic look at the development that would occur there. So with those, those things, um, the results of the addendum that we did to the traffic study, uh, I'm just going to show you here. I think a picture is probably easier to, to see than, than listen to me talk and trying to, trying to understand. So what's on the screen here is a summary of the, really the two key comparisons, um, assuming Carapines does develop and does build, build improvements. So the top row, the red circle, is the afternoon rush hour. This is the scenario without our development, without anything being built on our, on our subject development. Carapines does build out. Even if they build their improvements, that roundabout would work at a level service F. It's not a horrible F, but it's level service F. So the, the last, <laughs> believe it or not, there are different, there, there, there are different levels of, of how bad that can be. But uh, the, the second row, the bottom row, what I want to compare to here is uh, this is um, with our development completely built out and with the improvements that we would make 
to the roundabout, it goes to a level service D, and you can see that delay goes from 65 to 29, so it drops in more than half. So kind of the, the summary there is the improvements that we're making, even though we build our development out, we are the improvements we're making is having a big impact on the uh, intersection, on the roundabout. Second, this looks very similar, but this is without the Carapines development, assuming they do not move forward and they do not build their improvements. Again, I'll draw your attention to the first row in that table, the red circle. Um, there is, again, the same scenario where nothing of our site builds out. We, we have no traffic there. That's with all the future growth, other developments, other than Carapines. The roundabout works at level service E with 46 seconds of delay. If we move forward and build our development and with our improvement, um, we reduce the delay there by nine seconds. And that's without the other improvements of Carapine. So again, the moral of the story there is um, the improvements that we're making you know, more than mitigate our traffic impacts. So that, that just wanted to point that out to you there. In the morning, there's no, no real issues there. So just I was focused on the afternoon uh, since that was the technically the worst period. Um, so again, a summary here of what we did with this traffic study addendum was uh, the site intensity was reduced. That helped greatly. The traffic went down pretty significantly. That would come from the development. That helps, uh, uh, helps significantly to mitigate some of those concerns uh, with the roundabout and with the intersections. Um, the roundabout, again, with, with our development and the improvements we would make, the roundabout operates at an improved level of service. So we add our traffic, but we make an improvement there. The net result is better there. Um, again, the development itself, as I mentioned, we're less than 4% of the traffic at that roundabout. So we really, again, that's why you see the improvement we made there, why it had such a big impact there. Our traffic's pretty low there, especially when we redid it with a more realistic use. And the delay, again, the delay uh, at the roundabout is pretty minor, three to five seconds, um, you know, with our development built out, so, and without any improvements. So that's that, the, uh, quickly summarize the other intersections. Again, you can um, see the roundabout kind of in the, towards the upper right in red there, there's a slip lane very similar to the one that's out there today, a slip right turn lane around the roundabout that we would build. And again, uh, the way it is currently right now, we would build that with our first phase of the project. So that, that slip lane we would build is also required of DOT. Uh, you can see also in this picture, <coughs> the, um, you, the, there are turn lanes that are on Airport Road you got it, Bob? Okay, walk over. Okay. Uh, left, left turn lane on Airport Road and right turn lane on Airport Road. Again, uh, two lanes coming out of our access point. Again, that all this is meant to um, reduce any impacts on traffic along Airport Road to keep keep that traffic moving. So that's what those turn lanes were there for. Uh, DOT also wants to look at the driveway on 22 where uh, Olive Tree uh, comes out. Um, and they are saying they just want to monitor that as we move along with the development. If there are congestion problems there, they have uh, declared that it will be restricted uh, to a right-in, right-out intersection. But that's, again, that's something they're going to monitor as the development moves forward. So all the, again, those are improvements uh, that are required by DOT. They have issued a letter with these improvements, so uh, we feel like uh, we're, we're in good compliance there, particularly with the new information that we've, we've prepared. Can I just ask you, just for generally, that, so the light, they're going to monitor it. Like, how long does that go for? Like, within five years, if it's necessary, you'll do it? I mean, it's not perpetuity, is it? Well, what, the, what, uh, what they're going to do, they're basically saying we're not going to give you a light there. Right now. What they're saying is we're going to continue looking at it as development builds out, we're going to look at it because every time we come in with a development or a new new uh, site plan, they want to take a look at it. You know, typically through the TRC process, they'll, they'll have an avenue to look at it, and then they're going to say, "Look, if it if if we go out there and find that it's a problem, we're going to restrict it, make you restrict it to right and right out." 
So that's what they're that's what they're saying. Okay. And it's on the record. You know, they provided a letter, you know, stating that. So it's not going to be a surprise if and when they say do it now. So. Thank you. Yes, sir. I just want to clarify your traffic analysis. Does it assume that the current Ace Hardware location is replaced by another retail store, or is the traffic offsetting what you have? Uh, get... Great, great question. And so the way we really accommodate that is when we went out to do traffic counts. You know, there's traffic already being generated by that store, so we didn't take that out. We left all this that traffic there, assuming it you know it could get filled. Good. So yes, yeah, absolutely. Great, great question. Thank you. Questions? The cut through road, the cut through the hypotenuse that you're sort of creating is um, that is a public road, is that correct? Or is that what is what happens with that, Randy? Is that is that a is it private road and can can anyone use it or if kids cut through that way, do they end up getting trespassing tickets? What happens? <laughs> Just to be clear. Obviously, we're in the business of not being developers, but having people come to our businesses and shop. Okay. And, you know, there's, there's an unusual, you know, one of the things that is unusual here is as you come in, and this was developed on purpose to not let this become a, a drag strip. Right. But, you know, you've got to have a little meandering way through to help control traffic. But if somebody wants to cut through because there's a traffic accident at the circle, then they certainly can. We're not going to stop them. We're not going to have a police officer or off-duty police officer going, you're not going to one of these stores, you can't drive through this road. Right. So, no, it's, okay. it's so, for public uh, use. And the, the distance from where it's going to start on um, airport mm -hmm. to the traffic circle, how, what's the distance? I know you moved that. You moved that driveway. Drove, this is where DOT said, DOT said to put it, but I know that the stack lane is 200 feet to turn left in. It was not yeah, without without measuring exactly, we think it's around 900 feet. Okay. Yeah, so it's a it's a good distance. Okay, good. Thanks. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant or for the traffic analysis? Sure. It's our, it was our understanding that this qualified as heavy goods, and which is a one to 400 uh, ratio in parking. Because it's an Ace Hardware store, because of the type of store that it is, it would qualify as a one per 400. Just to be clear, I'm totally fine with parking. I've shown you it's, it's less than a sea of parking, which yeah. is a good thing. I actually was just kind of wanting to visualize this parking expanding as you got closer to site line and said, oh man, we need more parking. So I'm, I'd be, if this is what you want, I'd be comfortable capping it at this and saying, yeah, this is what we're at. Yeah, our, our was based on the UDO as a heavy goods, for heavy goods, for heavy goods at one to 400 square feet. Goods. Based on the definition, that was our, our, our interpretation. Yeah, we were trying to, <laughs> heavy goods, okay. All right, any other questions? All right, I need a motion to close. Oh, wait. Yeah, it's a D.
anyone out there who wants to speak on this? You have a question, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to say anything about this one? Okay. Right. We're gonna. You, you sound excited about it. I will uh, move to close public hearing. Aye. 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 Looking for a motion to adopt attachment A, finding effect. So moved. Second. Paul, you got it. We're getting, Aye. We're getting really. <laughs> all right. Aye. Aye. Yeah, I think we've all lied. Aye. Um, mm -hmm. Looking for a motion to approve the preliminary development plan for PD02-22. Pleasure of the council. We're looking oh, to... I can't find it anymore. Oh, um, I approve the preliminary right development here. plan PD-02-22. Second. Pleasure of the council. Aye. 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 Thank you very much. And you all get to go home. Isn't that nice? Unless we've, someone's blocked you in. Thank you. You too. Have a good morning. <laughs> You'll have a good morning. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> good morning. All right. <laughs> Whew. All righty. I believe we are now at the second public hearing of the uh, annual budget. Mr. Parsons. Oh, there you are. I was looking for it. I thought, I thought maybe you left. <laughs> I thought, oh, he left. He left his glasses. <laughs> oh, I can. Uh, um. All right. You're up. Oh, good morning. I don't think I can get this in before the end of the day now, but uh, <laughs> uh, Madam really, really Mayor, nice. members of council, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Second public hearing of the fiscal year 22-23 budget. Uh, I'll begin by thanking uh, a number of the people at the table behind me here, beginning, uh, beginning with Tess and James and Jessica, BJ, all of them certainly had input yes. uh, on the document. I, I am going to make this much shorter than it was last month, um, in <laughs> large part not only because it's late, but because there really aren't any changes. Um, again, we we do this kind of 365 days a year, but the the formal beginning is uh, around Christmas time when forms go out to the directors, uh, and those have to do with capital projects. And then we work our way through a number of meetings at the staff level. And then, of course, the April retreat with the council, where we spent uh, some quality time together and uh, ultimately get to a couple of work sessions, the first hearing last month and then this evening with a request for adoption following this. The economic realities we're facing, no surprises to anyone. Uh, rising expenses, I uh, just uh, was, was reading something today, of uh, a big debate about whether we're in a period of stagflation um, and what that might mean coming down the road. Labor market uh, is the most challenging I've seen in 28 years of doing this. Um, it's, it's tough, there aren't many people out there looking and there's a lot of jobs available. Capital projects are getting expensive and the supply chain continues to be a challenge. However, the Southern Pines tax base does remain strong. Um, I know we had some commentary earlier in the meeting talking about growth. Uh, as if you've read the opening um, statement relative to the budget, we did see a tax base growth of a little over 5%. And had we not had that, the budget before you would require about a 2.25% or it would require a two and a quarter penny increase in the tax rate in order to be able to do this budget. So. Um, Again, a little bit of growth is, is a very important thing. A lot of commentary about the Mes American Rescue Plan Act earlier. Um, let me just clear the air and say I know there's a lot of misinformation, also misunderstanding relative to the act and what is or isn't occurring with it. Uh, to be clear, Southern Pines has not spent the first nickel of ARPA funds yet, um, and Council's all very much aware of this. We talked about this at length during the retreat. Uh, we will be back in front of you potentially as early as July, maybe August, with some uh, documentation and, and policies that we will need to, to, be, to pass to stay in line with all the federal requirements. Um, and then in August or September, start talking about maybe a few projects uh, that we'll be able to, well, not the projects, but the actual expenditure of the funds for purposes of federal reporting, 
and we'll also be talking about projects along the way. Um, but again, a lot of a lot of things flying around out there about this. Um, this is money that was given to every municipality and, and government entity around the country. Uh, there were some very, there were some quotes earlier from Mr. Vest. I know very much what those were very specific to during the interim rules. Of course, um, there were very limited areas within which this money could be spent. And then within qualified census tracts, that very limited track kind of opened up a little bit. Um, now with the final rules and the revenue replacement, um, you'll note the, the term here, I think the standard allowance, and we talked about that quite a bit at retreat. Um, it's just a, it's a little bit different world and, and there's a lot of potential projects and a lot of potential be good to be done with this. I know one, uh, one young lady earlier talked about infrastructure and investment and as council's aware, everything we've talked about to date has been about those types of items and, and in particular, uh, one-time costs, not programs that have ongoing expenses related to them because this is one-time money. So uh, very simple uh, slide about the fund balance, et cetera. Bottom line here is that we'll be able to do that 25% um, fund balance set aside that, that we've done for so very long and has our bond rating where it's at. And that leaves council with an available fund balance as we sit here this evening of 266,025 heading into the fiscal year. Again, our revenue sources, uh, ad valorem taxes, which is essentially the property taxes on your house, land, and vehicles, uh, represents about 55% of our revenue stream. Another quarter of it coming from unrestricted intergovernmental revenues, better known as sales taxes for the most part. Um, and then we've got some smaller things there to include sales and services, permits and fees, um, and then investment earnings, as you can see, well under 1% of our actual revenue stream. So for the average property owner, what does this mean? The average property in Southern Pines, according to Moore County Tax Offices, is valued at $324,146. That is land and structure, and that is just a $3,000 increase, well, $3,300 increase over uh, when I was standing here at this time last year. Our tax rate under this budget remains the same at 40 cents. That's the same uh, tax rate that I believe we had in place 18 years ago, uh, again, when I stood here. And uh, all those assessments are done by Moore County. Also relative to this budget, there are increases in the solid waste fees to $16.75 a month. That actually only covers 40% of that fee. So $11.25 um, of what it's costing to service a home on a monthly basis is being covered at this time by the property tax. Um, I'm sorry, the 1675, I think I said 40%, that's 60%. The other 1125 is, um, is covered by the property tax. Um, we've had a lot of conversation around that. And then water and sewer fees uh, will increase a total of $3.49 a month for the average consumer. That's based on 5,000 gallons a month. Uh, the availability base fee for water and sewer will be 2075. How are property taxes used? Fire and police uh, represent the largest part of that. General government following that. General government covers a whole lot of stuff, including the stuff that supports fire and police. It also includes that 1125 I just talked about on the, uh, on the sanitation side. So um, cultural and recreation would be the next area, streets, and then your planning and inspections department. So the average tax bill for that average priced home, I shouldn't say priced, average valued home and land that I had on the last slide, uh, that'll run you just under $1,300 a year uh, in Southern Pines taxes. That is not inclusive of, of Moore County. That's a Southern Pines, Southern Pines tax number. General fund operations, we continue to maintain all existing services. We are doing a market adjustment across the board of 5%. There are some other targeted adjustments in those areas where we are having difficulty maintaining and or recruiting employees. We uh, do plan to add two police officers. That of course assumes the ability to recruit and find two people willing to do police work. Um, another planning position in January and an IT position in January also. 
And then we have six firefighters that we've had partial grant, well, we've had grant money to partially pay their salary and benefits over the past three years. That has now expired, so all six of those firefighters are completely funded through the budget. Capital funds, capital projects, uh, street resurfacing, quite a bit more this year than you've seen in past years will be planned uh, at $900,000. We got six police vehicles scheduled for replacement, another $200,000 sidewalk transfer, uh, a transfer to help toward the paving of the parking lot for the building that we're in this evening. We've got a project out at Reservoir Park Dam uh, as part of the long-term necessary projects out there to stay in compliance with the state of North Carolina. Uh, two uh, command level fire vehicles, so those are SUVs, not big fire trucks and then uh, the self-propelled lift that was actually in this current fiscal year budget but um, could not be delivered on time, so it had to roll over into the post-July 1 budget. Water and sewer operations, I already talked about the 5% across the board. Uh, that will increase revenues. We do have increasing expenditures, but the big part of the reason for those increases is our long-term uh, rate study and plans toward the improvements necessary in water and sewer. Um, and here you see some of those capital appropriations, $874,000 into sewer modernization, another 665 dollars into the water treatment plant, $130,000 uh, toward water repair and rehab, and seventy-five dollars toward sewer repair and rehab. Um, so again, well over a million dollars in capital represented there on that, uh, on that slide. So the bottom line again, service levels uh, will be maintained, property tax rate held. Uh, we continue to put money toward our capital assets and facilities. We continue to maintain the 25% operating expenses uh, as a set aside in the fund balance. 266 available heading into the year. ARPA funds will be dealt with as we move throughout the year and for the next couple of years. I don't think it's anybody's intent to try and spend $4.67 million um, over the next 12 months uh, because any number of projects will require, for instance, some engineering, some bidding, some things of that nature. Uh, CLRP will be updated. Uh, I think the, that came up a little bit earlier and the mayor mentioned it. And There's actually a big group of us that have um, an interview beginning at 8.30 tomorrow morning, so um, it's going to be a long day tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but that, uh, that is moving along quite well. We are down to looking at three different firms, and, and uh, they all seem quite well qualified, and it's just going to be a, a matter of selection and, and um, negotiation of contract at this point. So um, staff added in police planning and IT, as mentioned, and then all of our debt service obligations continue to be fulfilled. So again... Um, I know I've, I've sped through it, but thank you all for the time you've put into this. I know we spent a lot of time talking about it. Uh, there will be a lot more to talk about as, as the year uh, progresses, both relative to ARPA and then also next year's budget. Um, but a, a big thank you to Jessica for helping out with all the slides and the picks, and certainly to Tess for keeping all of the, uh, the numbers in order. The one thing, I, I said there were no changes there is one small change in what was being discussed, and, and of course we made that last week at the agenda meeting, and that's that the recreation fees that you will approve, um, hopefully later this evening after you've approved the budget, were adjusted uh, at the pool, as we talked about last week, bringing it back down to the dollar and punch cards and all of that. Uh, but, but everything else remains as it was at this time last month, and. Um, Quite honestly, it may be very, very similar, if not to what came out of our retreat discussion back in April. So with that, uh, again, thank you all. Thank you to staff. Uh, they've been fantastic to work with. We've got a lot, of, a lot of people relatively new to our process, relatively new to the town. And I say relatively as in within a year or two that uh, have really brought a lot of great ideas, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of additional value added to this process. And uh, I'd certainly, certainly appreciate that. I want to thank you because I know you've done a lot of work on this. You've, like, it's, it's an ongoing thing. It's all the time. But I do want to thank all the directors and Tess and Jessica. For, Jess, you can tell Jessica's little magic touch here with all the <laughs> graphics. Um, and, and thank you for the clarification on the RPAC fees. RPAC. No, that's not how you say it. Funds. ARPA funds. <laughs> yeah. That's a different whole, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Um, because I, I, there's some misunderstanding as 
as to how we can do that. It's not like we just can start spending. So thank you for that. Um, but I do want to thank the staff. Y'all have done a great job, and you make it easy for us to understand. So, and it is now tomorrow. So thank you very much. Any questions of me? Otherwise, I'll sit down and we can. Anybody have any questions? We've seen this several times. I guess this is a public hearing, so. If yeah. Um, anybody? Yeah. Anybody else have anything to say out there? All right. That's the, the proposed we will approve later on. So the action items, we've I've closed the hearing. Sorry. So moved. Second. Aye. 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 Thank you. The action items, we've done A and we've done B. <laughs> so we have C, D, and E. Um, uh, did you actually take, I don't know that we voted on that. Well, actually, it's not a hearing. You don't need to continue A. We just know to bring it back, and yeah, right. Good. We, we, okay. Yeah, we've already t discussed that, and we've already done B. So this is an ordinance, nineteen ninety three. So very quickly, this is the same municipal service district we've been talking about for a few months now. This simply approves the municipal service district and those boundaries that are represented by any number of slides you looked at earlier this evening relative to the, uh, the first multifamily development. But this is all of the land between 15501 and Morganton Road along the uh, parkway to be developed, uh, owned by uh, the Van Camps and or um, Conti slash Midland Atlantic. Okay, because we voted once, but we need a second vote, so. Correct. Um, pleasure of the council on Ordinance 1993. Yes, no. I move, do we move to approve again? Yes. Yeah, this is an oddity in <laughs> general statute vote. that you actually have to approve it twice. I move to approve again ordinance 1993 regarding the uh, creation of the municipal service district. That's second. Second. Council. Aye. Aye. Now this is the adoption of what was just presented, setting the tax rate at 40 cents. As you said, it's been like this for a very long time. <laughs> no. Th thank goodness that we can still say that. I'll move to... Adopt the fiscal year 22-23 budget, setting a tax rate of 40 cents per 100, an additional 40 cents per 100 valuation in municipal service district number one. Second. Pleasure of the council. Aye. 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 And last but not least, the reimbursement agreement between Midland Atlantic LLC for the infrastructure and expenses related to the initial oversizing of the parkway between West Morganton Road and 15501. Um, again, this is the reimbursement agreement we discussed um, a couple of times now over the last few months. Um, I know Ms. Clement had uh, some questions around that. I believe she got those answered, but I'll... I spoke with um, John Silverman, John Silverman <laughs> and, um, and my, my concerns and questions were, were answered and addressed. Thanks for reaching out and doing that, too, because I know that was a concern of yours. Thank you. And again, this I know there's questions around this from time to time. The, the way this is crafted is we're only, we're only, it has to be built before we're on the hook for anything, so. All right. I'm looking for a motion. I'll move to approve the reimbursement agreement with Middle Atlantic LLC for infrastructure and expenses related to the initial Oversizing of a parkway between West Morganton Road and 15501. Second. Pleasure of the council. Aye. 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 Now with the consent agenda, I do want to thank Vincent and Claudia for wanting to um, to serve on the commission. I came coming from a commission myself years ago. It's it's a great way to give back to the community and also to learn about the community. So we have. Let's see. We're going to read this all. Or are you just going to? We've gone over this, but we've got uh, the consent agenda to start the a, meeting. So yeah, if there aren't a, any questions, this a is a through, single yeah, motion. And they're 14. <laughs> they're actually 14. So looking, unless there's a change or a question, looking for uh, a motion to appro approve the consent agenda as written. So move. I need a second. Aye. 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 With that being said, Good morning. Thank you all. And good night. <laughs> and we can adjourn. Thank you all.
And thank you, staff, for hanging in there, because I know some of you have to give a meeting early in the morning, and I thank you all for your service, because you, you, you make us proud. Thank you very much. I've been a I I'm not going to be there till I don't know when, so.